The story begins with the protagonist Jibong Kim who is working at his part-time job at the Gu convenience store, as he was in the store on duty and there he was scanning the items with the barcode scanner. He scanned the item and gave it to the buyer telling him the price of that item. Kim asked 401 for that item and the buyer clanked the coins before him on the counter. The buyer takes his stuff from there and turns to leave while Kim stands there on the counter greets him and asks him to come again to the store. However, Kim is a 20-year-old college student and a part-time worker who's happily enjoying an ordinary life. Kim thinking about his life's current situation makes a bored face telling himself that he is not happy with his life. Then he sits down on the ground to collect the coins. While collecting the coins he asks himself how could anyone enjoy a life like this. After some time he stands inside the store looking out of the glass window thinking it's always the same old routine and the same old views. Then he sighed thinking it was boring. Standing there in the store he made a bored face because he was tired of his daily routine. As he stood near the window his phone rang and it was a message notification he picked up his phone from the counter to check and there was a message from his mother. His mother asked him what is he doing he opened the message thinking mother's message he replied that he was on his shift at the store. Then he asked his mother did she wanted to tell him something his mother replied she just noticed that it was his payday today and then she asked him to bring some fried chicken in return. Kim stood there reading the message and smiled thinking he guessed today was his payday and his mother was more aware of it than he was. Kim replies all right he got it furthermore, he says he will buy one marinated and one regular fried on his way back. As he sends this message his mother replies make it the soy sauce one over the regular fried one for her son, and in reply, Kim sends his mother the hot mouth emoji. As he was chatting with his mother suddenly he heard a loud noise outside hearing this noise he got scared and his phone slipped from his hand. After this he holding his phone looks outside asking himself what is why suddenly this noise occurred. He ran toward the door to check what was happening outside he opened the store door to check thinking that sounded like some kind of explosion. As he stood there at the door he was shocked to see the huge monster destroying the city. Sees that destruction everywhere he runs toward the road and he gets scared to see that the monster has destroyed almost the whole city with fire. Kim stands there looks up toward the monsters and the destroyed buildings and asks himself what is going on. Then he surprisingly asks himself if is he dreaming looking all around he says no this is definitely all real. However, Kim nervously stands there on the road, he feels some noise behind him he turns to look and is shocked to see the huge monsters coming toward him. He gets scared and thinks the first thing that comes to his mind is to run away from this place. Therefore, Kim screeches his shoes on the road and runs away from there while thinking his mind is all muddled up and what is going on where the monsters come from. While running away Kim falters and thud on the road, and he gets injured. Lying there injured on the road he heads up to look, and then he looks behind him thinking he tripped over something that was not a very good time to do. Lying there on the road as soon as he looked back, he was shocked to see his legs were no longer attached to his body. Sees this he gets scared and asks himself why are his legs over there, then he coughs and the blood spurts out of his mouth and he plops on the road. Lying there injured on the road he turns his head to look as the huge monster stands behind him shaking its tentacles and the bright purple aura was emerging from its tentacles. Kim looks toward the tentacle with his blood on it and asks himself did it got him with those tentacles. As the blood was flowing from Kim's mouth and his body was sliced seeing this, he abused then thudded on the road. After some time, the sound of a ring occurred and he got the notification window that the system's new announcement activating humanity's awakening program. Then another window occurs on which it was written they are initiating the awakening trial. Hearing that robotic voice he heads up asking himself what then his head thuds on the road again and lying there he thinks an awakening trial. Suddenly his sliced body started clanging and the bright light started emerging as he lay there unconscious on the road and the place where his body lay started turning into the holographic room. After some time he thuds into the holographic room, then he presses his head and back which thud on the ground. He heads up asking himself where he is but as soon as his eyes fall on the legs that are now attached to his body, he starts shuddering asking himself if his legs are reattached to his body and his injuries are gone. Kim sat there in the holographic room thinking the series of incomprehensible events completely blocked his mind. After this, he gets up and gets the notification window that greets players welcome to the awakening zone. Standing there he turned his head and surprisingly looked up asking what was that voice right now. 
Furthermore, he asked himself what it said in the awakening zone, then he looked around and asked what this holographic room was. He was completely blanked and scared because he didn't know where he was right now what was happening to him and what had happened to his body. However, Kim gets the notification window that initiates the awakening trial generating a monster opponent. As he stood there suddenly a huge monster appeared at his back, the monster created a loud noise Kim turned his head to look. As soon as he looks back he gets another notification window that Quest successfully strikes an attack on the test monster. And if he upon a successful strike the monster will perish regardless of the amount of damage inflicted. Hearing this notification Kim, while looking up at the monster coming toward him fearfully asks, what is he saying he wants him to land an attack on this monster? The monster angrily looks toward Kim and then extends its claw toward him to attack, sees the monster's claw coming toward him he gets scared. As he was about to fall backward because the monster's claw was huge, and when the monster swung its claw, the strong gust of wind blew. And Kim puts his hands in front of his face fearfully thinking he is going to die. However, the monster put its claw on Kim and crashed him so hard on the ground that the dust smoke spread there. Therefore, the notification window appears that he has failed the awakening trail, and then another notification window appears that they are regenerating the player's body. However, Kim's body regenerated, and he stood there looking at his hands and body in amazement. Suddenly his eyes fall on the nearby blood and crushed body parts that are his own Kim gets scared and starts shuddering then asks himself what is he. Then he fearfully looked toward the cut hand lying on the ground which was wholly covered with blood. Sees the hand he fearfully thought that it was his hand. Seeing the blood and mutilated body parts there, he feels nauseous and stands there he starts vomiting. While vomiting he sat there thinking about regenerating, but it couldn't be meanwhile the monster moved toward him to attack. Sees the huge monster coming toward him Kim with teary eyes looks up toward the monster and starts shuddering. However, Kim starts trembling while saliva starts coming out of his mouth the monster roars and he quickly gets up and starts running away. But this time the monster slashes its tentacles and cuts off Kim's head and separates it from his body. Kim's head and body thud on the floor, while lying there he sobs and the tears flow from his eyes, and he coughs with his sliced head. However, the notification window appears that he has failed the awakening trial, and they would regenerate the player's body. After this, Kim's body regenerates, and he stands there surprisingly looking toward himself as he stands there, the quest window appears. That quest window was about successfully striking an attack on the test monster, and upon a successful strike the monster will perish regardless of the amount of damage inflicted. However, he gets scared to see the monster appear there and move toward him to attack. Seeing the monster coming toward him, he shouts asking himself, what is this what is he supposed to do and how can he ever kill a monster like that? As the monster steps toward him, Kim fearfully steps backward suddenly the notification window appears that he can't kill the monster. Then another notification window appears that the test monster is programmed to be a transcendent tier creature his chances of killing them are zero. Kim stands there surprisingly looking up toward the notification window and then looking toward the monster he fearfully clenches his teeth asking himself if they reply to what he is saying. Then he raises his voice and clenches his fists asking who is he and where has he taken him. Then he angrily asks why did he bring him there. In response, a notification window appears that this is the testing area for a player's awakening trail, the location was designed to assure the fairness of the trial. Kim surprisingly looked up toward the notification window asking the player, awakening fairness because he didn't understand what was happening there. Where in the room he stands his corpses scattered all over because he killed and regenerated so many times. As he stands there blankly because he is unable to understand the situation happening to him, the notification window appears before him that humanity is a species capable of awakening its full potential. Then another notification window appears that the awakening trial will end once he has awakened his abilities and successfully attacked the monster. When this is finished he will be returned to the real world. Also, do not be concerned about dying in the middle of the test his body will be regenerated no matter how many times he dies in this area. Hearing that notification Kim clenches his teeth asking regenerated do they think of his life as a video game and smoothing. Then stands there with a sad face he thinks the whole thing sounded like a pretext for a fantasy novel but he still had to believe what they said because the pieces of his corpse were scattered right next to him. Then he clenches his teeth thinking he is supposed to be a player and he is never even given a choice while the monster roars and moves toward him. 
As the monster moved toward him he fearfully stepped backward the monster roared and created a magic ball with his voice and threw that huge magic ball toward Kim. That huge magic ball crashed Kim on the ground of that holographic room, but he with all his might skid and came out of that explosion, thinking he was forced to either repeat a painful death or accept the whole situation. However, Kim came out of that exploded magic ball and stood in the smoke, a bright wavy light started emerging from his body, and he got the notification that awakening success. His stats and abilities will now be generated, and then his stats window appear before him on which his HP, strength, agility, and mana are mentioned. Also, his level was increased from 0 to 1 his strength was increased to 25. His agility was increased to 11 and his mana was 22 also he got unique traits. Kim, after reading his stat window, clenched his fist, screech his foot, and run toward the monster to attack him. As soon as he ran toward the monster he got the notification window that awakened his ability and his physical enhancement. Kim with all his might made a fist and jumped toward the monster to punch him thinking there was only one option for him he had to accept everything they threw at him and finish this miserable trial. However, Kim punches the monster with all his might and crashes it the smoke emerges from its body and the monster gets cracked. Kim punched the monster threw away parts of its broken body and stood there he got the notification window that the damage successfully inflicted awakening trial was complete. Then another notification window appears and they congratulate him on his awakening. Hearing that voice Kim smiled and then he excitedly cheered up and then another quest window appeared before him that he had completed the quest successfully. Also, he has obtained the physical enhancement ability. A wavy light came out of Kim's body, and he stood there thinking that he would return to the world. As the wavy light was still coming out of his body, he stood there silently thinking, and then he looked all around the holographic room. Then he looked up and raised his voice asking what was going on, he said the trial was complete stop messing around and let him out of there. However, many notification windows appear before him that the errors have occurred, and he is unable to leave the testing area due to unknown error. Kim stands there sweating and panicking and asks what then another notification window appears before him and they inform him that they are initiating the awakening trial. Therefore, the huge monster appears before him and he silently looks toward the monster asking what is he talking about, he can't leave the testing area. As Kim stood there was blank and didn't understand what was happening around him meanwhile, the monster attacked Kim with its claw and splurred him. They regenerated Kim's body while his previous corpse was lying near him on the floor, as his body was regenerating he slightly smiled saying give him a break. Then he raised his voice asking what is this meanwhile, the monster attacked him with its claw and splashed him again. Kim's body parts splash on the floor and they start regenerating his body again. After his body regenerated he sat there on the floor thinking of an unknown error, it was like a bug in a video game, and he was stuck in this dimension for an eternity. Like a bugged out video game character, he went through the endless cycle of death and regeneration for a week, a month, a year. He sits there blankly thinking his mind slowly wasted away while his corpses are lying there on the ground all around him. Furthermore, with the hopeless face, he thinks he was constantly regenerated physically but not mentally but then. A window notification appears before him that his vitality has increased and they are modifying backup data. Kim surprisingly looks toward his status window and jumps asking Vitality to increase modifying backup data. In response, the notification window appears that he has increased his vitality by repeatedly taking hits from his opponent. He stood there before his notification window status, thinking he didn't care about how it happened. Then he asked himself did it just said that the backup data was being modified. Then he looked up excitedly asked then did the unknown error had been fixed as well and in response, the window appeared that the error had not been changed and he was unable to leave this area for eternity. Kim hears that voice hopelessly smile and then the monster appears there and moves toward him to attack. However, Kim while running away thought some time went by again two years, three years, four years, he tried everything he could do to run away. He even tried to resist being killed by the monster. Therefore, his status window appeared before him, and this time his HP was above 1000, his MP was above 500, and his strength was above 80. Furthermore, his agility was above 40 and his mana was above 50. He read that status window thinking these efforts increased his stats immensely, but they were all meaningless. In those years the monster killed him thousands of times and every time the monster killed him they regenerated his body. 
Kim stands there injured thinking he remembers what had happened on the first day, and he decides to stop resisting. However, when he came to that holographic room, the first day the window appeared before him that the test monsters were programmed to be transcendent tier creatures. His chances of killing them were zero. Moreover, ten years after his confinement he says the system that he wants to ask a question. Kim hopelessly asks the system what's happening outside on Earth right now the system replies nothing much has changed on Earth times move 300 times faster in this dimension than it does on Earth. Furthermore, for 10 years there are about 12 days in his world, hearing this Kim stands there and says 12 days, then he clenches his teeth, remembering the message from his mother when she asks him to bring fried chicken for her. Then Kim with a sad face looking toward his hand says he promised to buy some fried chicken for his mother. Meanwhile, the monster attacks him and crashes him after this, they regenerate his body again, and he sits there in the holographic room thinking 500 years after his confinement. Everything becomes blurry to him, his family, his friends, he had even begun to forget who he was. Only one question lingered in his mind, why did this thing happen to him? However, Kim sat there on the floor folding his arm meanwhile the monster moved toward him from a side to crush him. As the monster from upside down extended its claw toward Kim, while he sat there was asked why, and he repeatedly asked his question. As the monster's claw came near him, he sat there looking down punched the monster with his hand and crashed its claw the monster roared. Kim sat there clenched his teeth and angrily asked why then he shouted and raised his voice asking why as he was still shouting. Moreover, he raised his voice asking humanity to awaken the trial's fairness and the player's abilities all of those didn't matter to him anymore. He only wanted to know one thing then he asked them why this error happened to him. Then with a hopeless voice, he says he only wanted to live a happy life, and then remembers the time he part-time work in the store and clenched his teeth. He was furiously thinking about this all meanwhile, the monster moved toward him from behind his back to attack him. He stands there furiously thinking, there is only one target for his suppressed anger to turn to thinking this, he jumps toward the monster and punches him with all his might. However, ten years after humanity's awakening day on Earth, a crack appeared in the sky, an error message stating that an immeasurable burst of energy had erupted within the server. The system's firewall has been destroyed. After breaking through the crack with his fist Kim came out of that holographic room while the trial monster inside had already perished. Kim stood up there in the sky while the wavy bright light was coming out of his body. However, the total period of his awakening trial was 3,000 years during which he was able to reach the maximum level for all of his stats. Kim HP, MP, Strength Agility, and Mana were reached to maximum level. However, the system counter is unable to connect to the main system due to a system error, also they are initiating offline self-synchronization. Kim stands there in the sky slightly opening his eyes thinking every day for the past 3000 years he has thought about the very first thing he wants to do once he returns to Earth. And he remembered the message from his mother when she asked him to bring some fried chicken for her. As he stands there the notification window appears before him that system synchronization is complete 10 years have passed on Earth since his departure. Kim stands there up in the sky and looks down toward the city asking the system to find his mother's location right now. The system replies unable to run the search engine, this feature is unavailable in offline mode. Hearing this, Kim sighed saying to the system, it was as useless as ever then he descended to earth to find his home. Kim arrived in the city where he lived and stood outside the building where he lived with his family. Seeing the situation of the city he worriedly asked what happened to their house because the whole city was destroyed and barren. Meanwhile, two military soldiers pass by him holding their guns and looking toward him they stop there. One of them calls out to Kim and asks him to listen to him. Kim stands there and turns his head to listen to him, and the soldier steps toward him holding his gun informing him this place is a restricted area for civilians. Then he requested that move back to the safety zone immediately Kim looked toward the soldier surprisingly thinking the military soldier had just called their neighborhood a restricted area. Kim stands there asking the soldier what exactly happened there. Hearing this soldier surprisingly asks Kim what he means, and Kim stands there before them asks them how this area became so demolished hearing this one of the soldiers starts dizzying. While the other one his companion stands beside him turns his head and looks toward him. Then he sighs and with closed eyes and a sad face, he asks Kim if Sir has been living under a rock. Then he tells Kim this entire region was destroyed during the dungeon break ten years ago. 
Hearing this, Kim gets shocked and clenches his teeth thinking dungeon break, then asks himself if is he talking about the disaster back then. Then pointed toward the building where he used to live with his family, he asked the soldier what happened to the people living there. The soldier sighed and squeezed his eyes answering. They were all killed hearing this Kim was shocked and started trembling became speechless and asked himself if all killed his mother. As he was thinking the soldier stood before him and told him to wait then he thoughtfully told some people who survived because they were outside. Furthermore, he heard the government evacuate them to a safety zone and looking toward Kim he said he should head over there if he wanted to find them. Hearing this Kim angrily looks toward the soldier and grabs his collar asking where is this place. The soldier gets scared and starts shuddering. Then the soldier starts sweating and holding Kim's hand pointing ahead replies it was the shanty town in the B neighborhood. The other soldier holding the gun with one hand put his other hand on his companion's shoulder. Hearing this, Kim released the soldier's collar while both soldiers were scared. After this, Kim turned and ran away from there and the soldiers standing behind were scared, then the soldier whose collar Kim grabbed put his hands on his heart and sighed. Later both the soldiers stand there and hear through the radio that was attached to one of them shoulder with the belt. They alert the soldiers informing them they have a situation on their hands, a dungeon break is imminent in a nearby area. Also, the estimated location is the shantytown's emergency sector in the B neighborhood. Hearing this news both Solider fearfully look toward each other. However, in the B neighborhood emergency sector, a bright wavy light emerges in the sky while the military jeep screeches in that area. And from one of the jeeps, Hyongjun O Lieutenant Colonel of the Capital Defense Force comes out holding the cigarette in his mouth with his hand. However, the military jeeps gather in that area, and the military soldier stands around Lieutenant Colonel. He stands there holding that cigarette in his mouth raises his voice saying secure the perimeter and calls for reinforcement. Then looking toward the sky where the bright light circle was emerging, he shouted the dungeon breaks about to unleash. There is no way they can stop this on their own, then he angrily looks behind the soldier and shouts at him asking what happened to the guild support is still not there. The soldier salutes him answering no sir, they have just been dispatched, hearing the colonel angrily hit his fist on the jeep, and then he abuses the guild support shouting they must be taking it slow because this is a shanty town and they are trying to take more of their funding. After this, Jai Yun Lee first lieutenant of the capital defense force came to lieutenant colonel with a sad face asking what should they do now sir. Lieutenant colonel stands beside the jeep and turns his head angrily asking what she thinks they should do. Then he shouts from a line of defense and deals with the small monsters for now, and they will shoot the bigger ones down once they get some backup. Hearing this, Yun Li gets speechless, and then points ahead she asks if is he serious sir, then she raises his voice saying all of the civilians will be killed if they do that. However, Lieutenant Colonel shouts at her asking if would she rather have all of them killed by the monsters instead. Then Lieutenant Colonel abuse her saying just go and form a proper line, they will all be screwed if they let a monster escape from there. Hearing this Lieutenant Yun Li gets scared and speechless. As the military soldiers holding their weapons gather in Area B meanwhile Kim steps there, stands behind the soldier jeep looks toward that area and asks himself what is going on and why are there so many soldiers there as well. Then stands there, he asks the system what's going on around there, the system responds a dungeon break is imminent in B's neighborhood. Furthermore, the dungeon will spawn in approximately three minutes, and hear the voice of that window. Kim stands there think a dungeon break, then he asks himself if a disaster is going to happen in this neighborhood, and then he clenches teeth thinking his mother is in danger. However, Kim steps ahead to enter that area while the military soldiers stand there holding their weapons. They surprisingly turn their head and look toward him while he keeps stepping toward that area. Then one of the soldiers stops him there by putting a hand on his shoulder and requesting him to move back because the dungeon break is imminent in this area. Then says he has to evacuate this area hearing this Kim stands there and doesn't stop and angrily looks toward the soldier. However, looking toward him the two soldiers falter and thud backward on the road and Kim stands in between the soldiers and angrily looks toward them. While the soldiers gather around him get scared on the other side Lieutenant Colonel and Yun Li stand far from the soldiers discussing the important matter. Lieutenant Colonel looks toward the soldier and Kim angrily shouts asking who let a civilian in there. Then he raises his voice and gets him out of there immediately while Yun Li stands beside Lieutenant Colonel surprisingly looking toward Kim. 
After this, on Lieutenant Colonel's order, all the soldiers clunk their guns toward Kim and gather all around him. Kim silently stands in between the group of soldiers. Then he clenches his teeth and angrily looks toward the soldier and says scram, while the soldier stands there starts shuddering, and they all retreat, and he passes between them. Sees this, Yun Li scolds the soldiers asking what are they doing they can't let a civilian enter the danger zone. While the two soldiers sit there on the road one of them recognizes Kim and fearfully replies Yun Li player that man is a player madam. Hearing this, Yun Li was surprised when the wavy purple light emerged from the sky Kim kept stepping ahead toward that area and the soldiers silently stood behind his back holding their guns. As the bright light keeps cracking in the sky, it singles the beginning of the dungeon break. The sky clangs from that side where the bright light is emerging see this, the soldiers start shuddering one of them fearfully asks the sky just shattered. However, the monster starts pouring out of the sky, and it causes the soldier to lose hope sees this, the soldier gets scared and starts trembling. A lot of monsters pour out of the sky, and they spread in the area roaring, while the soldiers stand there and shout that's the dungeon break. The soldier stands there fearfully looking up toward the monster spread in the area B. One of them fearfully looking up asks, This is ridiculous how are they supposed to defeat those things with guns? The other one stands beside him and says they would just be committing suicide by going in there. Then he fearfully asks Yun Li if the guild support is not there yet and she has no answer and stands there she grits and runs away from there. Sees her running away the soldiers stand there fearfully stopping her to extend their hands and calling out her name. She keeps running toward area B where the monster spreads to attack with the fire. On the other side, Kim reached the area B neighborhood as he was climbing the stairs a notification window appeared before him that the dungeon had been opened guaranteeing a dungeon rank of 5 stars, and he while climbing the stairs clenches his teeth thinking he is sick and tired of these dungeons and monsters. As he was climbing the stairs two monsters from the roof of the houses next to the stairs move toward him. One of the monsters roars and quickly moves toward him to kill him while Kim silently keeps ascending the stairs. As the monster gets near him from his backside he punches the monster and splits it. Sees this the other monster moves toward him quickly while he stands there on the stairs his back to them. The monster with several heads moves toward him to attack and Kim stands there turns and clenches the monster saying get out of his way, then he crashes the monster and falls him away. As Kim throws the monster away on the ground, the place where the monster falls the ground breaks apart. However, the monster gets severely injured and tremble lying there on the cracked ground. Kim jumps on the monster's head and splits it to see this, the other monster his companion gets furious and starts roaring. After this, a lot of monsters angrily move toward Kim to kill him while he angrily attacks them and crashes many of them. Kim starts killing them one by one he kills many of them but many more appear there. He jumps up to attack the monster hits them with his leg and falls them away. Kim attacks four to five monsters in a single blow and crashes them all together. As he was killing them, meanwhile the dragon monster appeared there and he jumped up and crashed the dragon monster with one hit and throws the dragon corpse toward its other companions sees this the other dragon monsters move toward him to attack him. However, Kim attacks them and splurts the dragon monster into pieces. Kim stood there in the air after killing them while the dragon monster's body pieces were falling. Kim jumps in the air and makes his fist hit the remaining dragon monster and crashes them. On the other side, Yun Li was running to find Kim and finally, she arrived in Area B. She looked all around there thinking about where he was going she saw him go this way. She climbs the stairs and stands upstairs she is surprised to see Kim crashing, splurting and cracking the monster in the air. However, looking up she surprisingly says, this is impossible even the military war machines are unable to stop a 5 star dungeon. Then looking toward Kim standing there between the dead monster's corpse she asks herself how could a single person achieve this. After killing all the monsters Kim stands there meanwhile a huge explosion occurs far from him, Yun Li stands behind Kim and sees this explosion and gets scared. While Kim doesn't notice that explosion and he silently stands there between the monsters corpses. However from that explosion the boss monster appears and starts roaring and when the boss monster sees his companion's corpse lying on the ground. He gets furious and his eyes turn red due to anger then he roars and extends his hands to attack Kim. Stands there Kim gets the notification from the system that the boss monster has appeared. Also, another window appears before Kim that killing the boss monster will terminate the dungeon break. 
Hearing that notification voice Kim clenched his fist and angrily looked up at the boss monster and then he stepped toward the monster to kill him. Seeing Kim stepping toward him the boss monster gets surprised and then he angrily roars while Kim stands there angrily looks up toward the boss monster and clenches his fist. Sees the boss monster Yoon Lee plops on the ground and starts trembling asking herself that's what a 5 star boss is. While the monster was roaring there meanwhile some citizens heard that noise got there and stood beside the wall. Yoon Lee stands there turns her head and looks toward the citizens standing beside the wall thinking they are the survivors of the neighborhood. While the citizens were sacredly looking up toward the boss monster Yoon Lee stood there clenched her teeth thinking this was their chance they needed to evacuate them. Then she turned her head and looked toward the citizens raising her voice, they must get out of there immediately. Hearing her words, the citizens look toward each other meanwhile the monster roars, and they all get scared to hear that boss monster's voice. Hearing the boss monster's voice they all start sobbing meanwhile, the boss monster runs toward the citizens to kill them. However, they cry and start running to save their lives, they all run away while Kim stands silently there on the road and doesn't move. While the monster was quickly moving toward them as the citizens were running to save their lives, among them a lady holding the hand of her little daughter was running. Her daughter was crying and asking for help when suddenly her foot tripped with her leg and she fell there on the road with her teddy bear. The little girl lying there on the road cries while calling out to her mother her mother turns and runs toward her daughter to take her with hers. Meanwhile, the boss monster gets near them and roars, and then he opens his huge mouth and throws her sticky tongue toward the lady and her daughter. Sees the monster's tongue coming toward them the lady while crying holds her daughter tightly and hugs her. Meanwhile, Kim gets there and splits the monster, and the little girl hugging her mother stands there on the road and opens her eyes slightly to check why the monster hasn't attacked them. As she opened her eyes she was surprised to see Kim standing there before them holding the monster's splurt mouth in hand. Then the lady holding her daughter runs away from there thanking Kim for saving them from the monster while Kim stands there plop the monster's head on the road. However, the citizens were still running away to save their lives from the monster and Kim stood there beside the splurt monster silently watching this all. After this, Kim stands there looking toward the citizen and asks to system to check if his mother is there, the system replies receiving the command. Then a window appears before him, and he will begin searching the area based on his memory information. While Kim silently stands there to get the exact location of her mother, the system tells him two seconds until the search is complete the time is counted down, and when the system informs the search is complete. Hearing this, Kim's eyes open wide and the system tells him zero match found exiting searching mode. However, Kim stands there hears this gets hopeless presses his lips and remembers his family when his mother lovingly calls his name and when his father lovingly calls him his son. Also, he remembers his little sister when she calls him big brother remembering his family Kim with teary eyes hopelessly stands there quietly. Then he thinks 3000 years throughout all that time, he struggled to not forget them, but it all just feels so faint now. Kim thinking this all, squeezes his eyes meanwhile the monster gets there and roars behind him so loudly. While Kim silently stands there before the monster corpse the monster roars so loudly that Yoon Lee puts her hands on her ear and closes her eyes thinking what's this noise. After this, she winked and looked toward the monster, while the monster cracked and threw the magic balls that he created in its mouth with that loud noise toward Kim. Kim silently stands there with his back to the monster and asks the system to activate his ability and physical enhancement skills. However, the system does the same Kim asks it to be done, and the bright light spreads all around him. Therefore, the notification window shows that the physical enhancement is activated and his awakened mode is now on. Kim's eyes and hair start to glow, he turns his head, activates his energy, and remembers the chat that he had had with his mother before entering that holographic room. Then he jumped up toward the monster while remembering the time when he was chatting to his mother in the store. He hits the monster's magic ball with his hand and blocks his attack remembering the message of his mother when she asks him to bring some fried chicken for her. Sees this, Yoon Lee stands down surprisingly looks up toward Kim blocks the monster's attack and thinks incredible he is deflecting the boss's attack out of the town. After deflecting the magic ball Kim tapped on the ground while Yoon Lee stood behind him and surprisingly looked toward him thinking he didn't even leave a single one. The monster gets furious to see how Kim has blocked his attack and killed all his companions then he roars and angrily looks toward Kim and creates a huge magic ball in his mouth. 
the monster throws that magic storm from his mouth toward Kim, while Kim silently stands there in his power. A bright wavy light came out of Kim's hand, and he made a fist with his hand and ran toward the monster to kill him. As Kim ran toward the monster tears were flowing from his eyes because he was missing his family and the time he spent with them. As he runs toward the monster the tear from his eyes falls on the ground. The monster creates the magic tornado and throws it toward Kim, but that magic does not affect Kim. Sees this, the monster gets surprised and roars Kim jumps toward the monster boss and punches him with his fist, the boss monster with Kim's one punch destroyed and starts disappearing. Sees this, the citizen and the military people stand there get surprised, and then the bright light emerges from the sky and Kim's body is completely covered with that bright light. Kim stands there before the ruined ground and Yoon Lee sits there aside and sees this all she is shocked and speechless. Kim stands there, deactivating his ability, and stares at the ruined ground with teary eyes, thinking he is tired of all this. Then he squeezes his eyes meanwhile Kim's mother runs and quickly climbs the stairs holding the poster in her arms move toward Kim. See her Yoon Lee sits there with folded legs on the ground and surprisingly looks toward her. Kim's mother looking toward her son extends her hand and smiles stands behind her and calls out Kim's name. Kim stands there turns his head and looks toward his mother. Sees his mother before him he is surprised and the notification window appears that voice data is identified. The information matches with the player's memories while Kim looking toward his mother thinking the past 3000 years ran through his mind. Tears start flowing from his eyes and he stands there thinking his long lost emotions begin to burst within him. Kim cries out to his mother and his tears drip down on the ground on the other side his mother stands before him also cries and while crying she puts her hand on her mouth. After this, both mother and son ran toward each other as his mother ran the poster she held in her arm fell from her hand and flew in the air. And that posters were of Kim's missing report. Furthermore, on that poster, Kim's name, a picture of the place where he worked, and all of his information were mentioned. Both of them tightly hug each other and burst into tears. Kim's mother holds his son tightly, sobbing, asking where in the world had he been. She searched everywhere, looking for him. Kim, while holding her mother, bursts into tears and presses his lips. He cries and apologizes to his mother for that. He can't get her fried chicken as he promised. As both of them stand there hugging each other tightly, the monster throws his tentacle toward Kim's mother and splurts her. That tentacle pierces Kim's mother's stomach and she takes a deep breath. Kim stands there holding his mother and with teary eyes, he looks toward his mother and calls out her name. Also, the drops of blood spurts on Kim's face. Kim stands there thinking about 3,000 years, which is how long he spent training on top of his corpses, but this empowered body couldn't even protect the one he cared for. Kim's mother's blood dripped onto the ground and the tentacle pierced from her stomach and blood was flowing from her stomach. Also, the tip of that tentacle that pierced from his mother's stomach pricked on Kim's stomach while Kim stood there holding his mother in his arms. The monster squelches the tentacle from Kim's mother's stomach, and she plops on the ground, then she thuds there. While Kim sits beside her, he calls out to his mother. The bloody monster swings its tentacle, while Kim sits there holding his mother in its arms, crying. Seeing this, the monster gets happy and screeks its tentacle toward Kim. But before the monster attacks him, Yoon Lee gets there aside, clunks her gun, and starts shooting the monster. She hits the bloody monster, and the bullets pierce from its head. Kim put his mother's head in his lap and cried, calling out to his mother. His mother was injured, lying in her son's lap, brushing her hand on his face. Also, blood was flowing from her mouth. Kim's mother lovingly looks toward her son, saying don't cry, and that she loves him, and then, her hand plops on the ground. Kim sits there holding his mother in his lap, looks up, screams and cries, he feels hopeless and the darkness around him. However, in the 39th Battalion, Capital Defense Force in the Control Center, the Lieutenant Colonel was smoking a cigarette while sitting on a chair with his legs on the table, and Yoon Lee stands before her, folding her arm back. Colonel turns his eyes and looks toward her, asking if they have been talking about him non-stop, haven't they? Yoon Lee replies, yes sir. After this, Lieutenant Colonel clicks the lighter and lights the cigarette, saying goodness. Then he asks Yoon Lee what Kim is doing to gather so much attention in a single month. She replies he is clearing every dungeon he can find, and the nearby dungeons of this region have already been devastated. Further, she says the guild's complaints are piling up, and several are expected to take action very soon. 
In response, Lieutenant Colonel sits on his chair, smokes, and stays silent. He rips the envelope from his pocket, then extends his hand and puts it in front of her, saying they have their orders. She silently looks toward the envelope, and he says her recruit Jibong Kim before he causes any more trouble. On the other side, Kim is killing the monsters in the dungeon. He killed so many monsters there as he killed many of them. Meanwhile, a vast monster gets there. Kim attacks the monster and punches it in its stomach. The monster gets the hole there, and blood spits out of its mouth, and everything falls out of the monster's stomach. However, Kim skids and jumps toward the monster, attacking it with all his might, and a vast dust explosion occurs in the dungeon. As soon as the dust explosion ended, Kim stood there holding the monster's skull in his hand, and the blood was dripping from the monster's mouth. Sees this, a bunch of monsters get there holding the sword. Kim kills them all one by one with their sword. Moreover, the monster spurt corpse lying there around him on the ground, and thousands of more monsters run toward him to kill him. Kim pulls out the sword from the dead monster's corpse and raises it, then activates his physical enhancement ability. Kim's body starts to glow, and his eyes and hair turn gray. Also, the wavy light spreads around him, and the window that Awakened Mode Level 1 is on appears before him. Kim creates the storm with his magic, and then he points the sword toward the monster, and due to that storm, the sword cracks into pieces. The storm moved toward the monster, and the ground cracked there due to that storm. However, the window appears that all monsters are eradicated and the dungeon has been cleared. After this, Kim sits on the stone under the sky on a rainy night, while Yoon Lee gets there holding the umbrella. She puts her umbrella on Kim, he heads up and looks toward her. She is getting drenched in the rain, but she raises her umbrella on Kim. Looking toward him, she says she searched everywhere for him, then she slightly smiles and briefly introduces herself, saying that she is Jin Yoon Lee from the Capital Defense Forces. Furthermore, she says this was the first time they had met, but it wasn't the best time to introduce herself before. Kim sits there, head down, and silently listens to her, but doesn't respond. Sees this, Yoon Lee says she understands what he is going through with the monsters, then she asks him if he wants to destroy all the dungeons in this world. Is she right? Then, looking toward him, she says, but that would be utterly pointless because the dungeons respawn after a certain amount of time. He would only waste his time and energy by venting like this. Kim doesn't respond to her, and she stands there in the rain, keeping the umbrella over him. Further, she stood there silently, staring at him. After some time, Kim replied, asking her if he should sit there and do nothing. Yoon Lee looked toward him, saying not what she was trying to say as she was about to complete her sentence. But before she completes her sentence, Kim adds his point, saying that for 3,000 years, he had to suffer bone-breaking, flesh-ripping pain. Every single day back there, even as his body broke down and turned to dust, he still endured that hell to return to where he belonged. Then Kim quickly gets up, and that umbrella falls in Yoon's hands. She surprisingly looks toward him, and he stands there before her, looking into her eyes and asking, but all of that effort is wasted now and she still wants him to corpse himself. Then, looking toward her with teary eyes, he asks if she wants him to endure more than this as they both stand in the rain. He stepped ahead to leave while she stood there, head down in the rain, gritting and turning, saying she would help him to get his revenge. Hear this, he stops there, and she stands behind him and says, Dungeons Monsters. She will help him get rid of all of them, but he has to come with her. Kim silently stands ahead of her in the rain, and she stands back at him, looking toward him. However, six months later, in intense care, Kim's mother was admitted, and she was in a coma. Kim goes to the hospital to see his mother. He stands outside, looks at her through the mirror window, and puts his hand on the window. He silently, looking toward his mother, smiles, calling out to her mother. Moreover, he says he has become a civil servant and a pretty high-ranking one, so he won't be able to visit as often now. Further, he asks if she knows how government employees are always busy. Then he smiles, saying don't be sick just because he is gone for a while and asks her okay. After this, he brushes his hand on the window, saying he will be back soon, and then he opens his coat button and moves toward the exit door of the IQ. There, he scanned his thumb in the thumb scanner as he scanned the door open, and he came out. As soon as he came out, on either side, civil servant officers were there to take him. Seeing him there, they all salute him, and he extends his hand, gesturing to them all. It's all right, and then he steps ahead and pulls his tie. As he steps ahead, his clothes become physical armor, 
and he comes to his power. He activated his physical enhancement power. A bright light came out of his body, and he stood there, ordering the officer to let go. After this at night, they all go to the dungeon where the colossal monster hawks are flying. Kim stands in his activated energy and looks up toward the hawk monster. He jumps up. The monsters are squawking. He attacks the monsters and kills them all in one blow. After killing the monster hawk, Kim, in his power, stands there, and a bright aura emerges from his body. However, Captain Chiol Beak sits in the bar, wearing his uniform and hat on his head, sitting on the chair where he is drinking the wine. Also in the bar, the news was on television that the government had officially announced its relationship with the SHIELD Guild. Two reporters were giving this news when one told the viewers about the government's decision. Another one, the lady added her point, tells the viewers about discontinuing the SHIELD Guild's protective services in the Seoul metropolitan area. Captain Chiol sits on the chair, fills his glass of wine, adds the ice cube to the glass, and then clans it to melt the ice in the wine. After this, he gulps half a glass of wine, puts the glass on the counter, and sighs. Meanwhile, the director of the SHIELD Guild comes there and sits on the chair bedside Chiol. Captain Chiol heads down and asks him what business he has there. Looking toward Captain Chiol, the director grins and replies, asking what he means. He is just there to drink with their scouting Captain Chiol Beak. Hearing this, Captain Chiol remains silent, then he removes his hat from his head and looking toward the director, replies get to the point sir. The director looks toward Captain Chiol and answers that honesty is what he likes about him. Then he asks if he is aware of him too right. While Captain Chiol sits there gulping wine when the director smiles, saying to Captain Chiol that everyone's been talking about the men. Hearing this, Captain Chiol flinched the wine glass from his mouth while the news reporter on television was giving the news that due to the sharp decline in the dungeon breaks recently. Experts have speculated that the government may have acquired a secret weapon as Captain Chiol was still gulping wine and the director sat there listening to the news. Putting his hand in his pant pocket, he says the guy is ruining it for them out there. He has caused a significant setback in their business. However, while rattling the ice in the wine glass on the table, Captain Chiol asks the director if they should get rid of him. Hearing this, the director asks Captain Chiol why he always has to be so frightened talking about removing someone so quickly like that. Captain Chiol, refilling his wine glass, remains silent. After this, the director swishes the paper on the counter before Captain Chiol, and Captain Chiol sits there, turns his head, and silently looks toward the paper. However, the director grins and looks toward Captain Chiol, saying there has been an order to contact him and recruit him into the guild, and he will be treated as a team captain. Meanwhile, Captain Chiol starts to say something but stays silent and presses his lips together. Then he gets up, picks up that paper, and turns from there, holding his hat. Captain Chiol put that paper in the inner pocket of his coat and stepped toward the exit door, replaying understanding. While the director sits on the chair behind, looking toward Captain Chiol, he asks where he is going. He still needs to finish his drink. Captain Chiol creaks the door, answering he has done drinking already. However, the director sitting on the chair thunk and surprisingly looked toward the wine glass on the counter. On the other side, in the five-star dungeon, the monster bird nests at nighttime, the sky is dark, and a bright light emerges in the sky. And from that bright light, Kim and his team members wearing their costumes appear. They all stand on the cliff, and Kim stands first while his team members stand behind him. Then, the notification window appears before Kim that he has entered the five-star dungeon, the monster bird's nest. This dungeon is due for a dungeon break soon. Kim and his team stood up the cliff looking down toward the monsters flying there as Kim stared at the monster. His team member stands behind him and informs Captain Kim that this is the last that's due for a dungeon break this month. Kim turns his head, answering all right, all units stand by at this location. After this, Kim jumped up the cliff toward the monster bird nest while his team members stood there watching him. Kim flew in the air and moved toward the monster's nest while the monster's birds were squawking. Standing there in the air, Kim asks the system about the boss's location. The window appears before him, and the system responds to him, receiving a command scanning for the boss's location. As Kim stands there in the air, monster birds, while squawking, start gathering all around him. Kim punches the monster bird and splits it. After this, he starts crashing the monster bird. Then he sat on the monster bird, hit it, and jumped up. The monster fell away injured while Kim jumped up in the air. 
The window appeared before him with five seconds until the scan was complete as the time was counted down. In the meantime, Kim crashes many of the bird monsters. As the system says, three seconds are left while Kim is crashing the bird monster's head, then he hits the monster and splits it. Sees this, many more monster birds, while squawking, quickly move toward him. As Kim was killing the monster bird, the system informed him that there was one second left. The bunch of monster birds gathered around Kim, and he crashed them all with his one hit. Meanwhile, the system tells him the location scan is completed. The boss is located 7-8 miles southeast of the current location. Kim kills the monster birds with his activated physicality enhancement power storm, and the bright light spreads there while all the monster birds crash. However, Kim stands in the air, and the bright light comes out of his body while the window appears before him, activating the ability of physical enhancement. Also, his awakened mode is on, and then Kim flies fast in the air and quickly crosses all the mountains in his path and finally arrives at the destination. Kim's body was completely covered with the bright light and the window appeared before him that he had arrived at his destination exiting navigation mode. Kim stands there in the air, meanwhile, the monster bird boss Albatross gets near him, and he looks up toward the monster boss. The monster boss Albatross angrily looks toward Kim and squawks, while he silently stands before it. On the other hand, Kim's team members stand up on the hill. One of them looks through the binoculars to find out what is happening on the other side. The team vice captain asked the one who was looking through binoculars how the situation was going. The one who is watching through the binoculars replies it will probably be over soon, with Captain Kim winning by a landslide. Hearing this, the team members murmur, and one of them surprisingly says incredible, he is defeating hundreds of monster birds and the boss by himself. He is a complete monster. After this, the Vi captain stands behind him and says all right, they should be moving soon as well, retrieve all of the monostones they can find, and don't leave a single one behind. All the team members stand there, turn their heads, and reply yes, vice captain. As they all stand there, suddenly a bright light emerges from behind, sees this vice captain, surprisingly thinks why, is the dungeon entrance opening right now. And from that light, a dagger swishes and moves toward them quickly sees the dagger coming toward them, the vice captain's eyes wide open, and he fearfully thinks of a dagger. However, the dagger fips and splits the skin of the vice captain's face, and the girl with her team comes out of that dungeon entrance holding swords. The girl attacked the vice captain with her sword and slashed him. She stabbed the sword in the vice captain's stomach, and he thuds down. Also, Captain Chiol had arrived with the attackers. However, the girl stood there holding her sword, and the blood of the vice captain was dripping from the sword. The vice captain drizzles with his blood and lies on the cliff upside down, while the lady holding her sword stands there before the voice captain near the dungeon entrance. Seeing them there, the voice captain team member surprisingly asks who they are people. However, the voice captain team member stands there and flinches, and the lady takes a side and points her sword toward the voice captain asking Captain Chiol if that guy had just died from that. Chiol steps toward the vice captain's body, answering the fact that he died from a blow like that means he wasn't Jibong Kim. Hearing this, the team members are surprised, and one of them thinks Jibong Kim is after their captain. After this, Captain Chiol stands before Kim's team members and looks toward them, asking if he only wants to know one thing, which is that one of them is Jibong Kim. On the other side, Kim, with all his might, makes a fist and punches the boss monster Albatross, while the bright light spreads there when Kim punches the monster. Also, that bright light was coming from Kim's body, and this light spread wherever he went. Kim hits the boss monster Albatross, while the monster squawks and blood spurts out of its mouth. After this, the monster boss gets furious, and while squawking, he creates a fireball in its mouth. Kim stares at that fireball. Then the monster throws a firestorm toward Kim with its breath, and it causes an explosion, and Kim completely sinks into that firestorm. On Captain Chiol's side, he stands behind Kim's team member, waiting for the answer. Then suddenly, everything there starts shaking. Captain Chiol stands there surprisingly, thinking an earthquake could have been a large explosion at a distance. After this, looking down, he sighed, thinking, could it be? Then he angrily cracked his hand and stepped over to Kim's team members, saying it looked like none of them was Jibong Kim, what a shame. After this, Captain Chiol heads up and looks toward them, saying he guess he will just have to kill all of them until Kim decides to show up. 
On the other side of the dungeon, a man with silver hair stands up at the hill edge thinking the man is there. They are scared, and then he asks himself why he has come already. Furthermore, he needs to find out if it is because the rift formed earlier than he thinks it was. What was that rift about, he doesn't know, nobody does. They need to find out if the rift is harmful and go and find him. However, at Kim's side, the firestorm crackles, and the window appears before him with that unique trait-generated elemental resistance rank S. Therefore, Kim stands there controlling that firestorm with his left hand, and his status window appears before him that his level had already reached the maximum points. At this time, by directing that firestorm, he got a new elemental resistance rank S. After some time, the firestorm ended, and there the smoke remained only Kim stood before the injured albatross, and Albatross furiously looked toward him. Kim looks up toward Albatross saying let's wrap this up, and then he clenches his fists, turns and jumps toward Albatross to attack. Kim punches the Albatross on its stomach with all his might and splits it. The Albatross crashes to the ground into pieces, and the window appears before Kim that the boss monster has been eradicated. He has cleared the dungeon. As soon as Kim killed Albatross, the moon's color flashed and got into its normal color from red to yellow. Kim stands there before the albatross's corpse, and the sparkle occurs in albatross's head. From that sparkle, a sphere falls. Kim picked that sphere, thinking did the boss drop this, he had never seen this thing before. Stand there, Kim stares at that sphere, asking the system what this thing is. The system starts scanning that sphere and answers him that time is a daystone. Kim surprisingly asked a daystone what is it for and then a window appeared before him on which it was written that the system was unable to access further information in offline mode. Hearing this, Kim makes an annoyed face, asking the system why he doesn't know anything useful. Meanwhile, several windows of warning appear before Kim, and he surprisingly looks toward the windows. Then, another window appears before him, showing that his allies are under attack at the dungeon entrance. On Captain Chiol's side, he was beating Kim's team members one by one, he crushed one of them and punched him in the face, and his teeth fell out, and then he hit and fell him away. Sees this, his companion takes out his sword and moves toward Captain Chiol to attack him. But before he attacks, Captain Chiol punches him and injures him. Blood spurs out of his nose and mouth, then Captain Chiol hits him with his leg, then he jumps and crushes his head, and then Captain Chiol cracks his head on his knees while his teeth fall out. The sword fell from his hand, and Captain Chiol hit and thud him away. After gravely affecting all of them, Captain Chiol stood there saying no, one of them was Kim, while the blood of those people was on his clothes and face. As they all stand there up on the cliff, the moon flashes, and they all look up toward the moon. Then Captain Chiol's companion comes to him and bows his head before him, informing him someone has just defeated the boss and cleared this dungeon. Hearing this, Captain Chiol, looking up toward the sky, remains silent and thinks that Kim had made an explosion earlier. After this, Captain Chiol turns, and with his one hand, he wipes the blood from his face and puts his second hand in his pant pocket, saying his companion let's go, find a path for them to climb down this cliff. His team members turn and step ahead on their boss's order, answering yes sir, as they all move to leave. Meanwhile, Kim, with his bright light, jumps there on the cliff and crashes into the area of the cliff where he lands. They all stop there, and Captain Chiol turns his eyes to look at a brilliant light spread all around. After some time, the light fades and the dust and smoke spread there while they all get scared and step backward. From that smoke, Kim's team member lying there injured notices a reflection. The smoke disappears and Kim comes out of that smoke. Seeing him there one of the team members smiles, saying Captain Kim, while Kim stands there angrily, clenching his fist and looking toward Captain Chiol and his team members. After this, he steps ahead toward Captain Chiol, while Captain Chiol stands there, putting his hand in his pocket, and says to Kim he is finally there. Also, Captain Chiol's team members stand behind him, holding sticks. Kim keeps stepping toward him. Captain Chiol looking toward Kim, says they have been wanting to see him for a long time, and then he gives Kim a little introduction of himself. Telling he is Chiol Beak, the scouting captain of the Shield Guild, he presses his lower lips between his teeth. As Kim stepped toward him, and the sky aside them got purple. Seeing Kim in front of him, fear fell on Captain Chiol. However, the sky and trees become purple, and Captain Chiol becomes afraid and continuously looks at Kim unblinkingly. Captain Chiol's face starts to sweat, and the bright light reflects in his eyeballs. Kim stands before him, turning into a monster. 
That monster takes out his tongue and puts the tip of its tongue near Captain Xiao's eyes, sees this, Captain Sweat, and understands Kim's powerful aura. However, everything gets normal, the weather, the sky and Kim. Kim stands there before Captain Xiao, seeing him near the captain stepping backward, his eyes wide open due to fear. Both Kim and Captain Xiao stand before each other, and the sweat is dripping from the captain's face. He was unable to speak, and then he started to tremble, thinking about this overwhelming pressure. Then, he stands there and questions himself. Is he shaking right now? Kim stands before him and calls out to him while Captain flinches and his mouth falls open in fear. Captain Xiao starts trembling, and Kim asks him if he has just said that he is from the Shield Guild. Captain's companion sees this, stands behind him, and gets angry. Then, one of them points toward Kim angrily, asking to show some proper respect toward their captain. After a second, the other one stands beside them, shouting at Kim if he wants them to end his life. Captain Chiol stands there before them, turns his head on them, scolds them, and orders them to shut their mouth. Captain Chiol's companions reply yes sir, and then Captain squeezes his eyes, recalling the words of the director who comes to him in the bar. Then he remembers when the director looking toward him gave an evil smile, saying there had been an order to contact him and recruit him into the guild. He will be treated as a team captain. Remembering the words, Captain Chiol pressed his lips, he thought that was a load of nonsense. Furthermore, he believes this man is far too powerful to be recruited as a mere captain, and they have to make him an ally, even if they have to recruit him as an executive for it. Stand there. Captain Chiol regains his spirit and says Kim listen. He is sure he has heard of their guild as well. Everyone knows that they are effectively the strongest guild in South Korea, and they extend the offer for him to join them. If he does, they will let him have everything he could ever desire. However, everything he could ever do didn't contain a single lie because the minimum annual salary of a guild's captain was 3 billion won, and the authority of a major guild could not be challenged even by a national government. However, Kim's team member, the one whose eye was plopped lying there injured on the cliff, thinks that without Captain Kim, their team will be hopeless. Moreover, many players considered a guild's recruitment offer to be a significant turning point in their lives. It was an offer that nobody could refuse and a desperate wish for any player in this world. Captain Chiol's team members stand behind, laughing, gossiping to each other that they won't reject this offer. Kim stays silent, and then, after a minute, he says he has one question for him. Captain smiles responding to being his guest while thinking yes, Kim is interested. Kim asks the Shield Guild, who is responsible for the capital city's defense, if he is right. Then he clenched his teeth and remembered the time when the monster stabbed its tentacle in her mother's stomach. Then Kim angrily asks Chiol if the B neighborhood shantytown emergency sector is also under the guild's responsibility. Chiol smiles and replies of course, and their guild will have control over many more as soon as Chiol replies, Kim punches him and falls him at the feet of his team members. Captain Chiol gets severely injured, and his teeth fall out while his team members stand there to abuse Kim asking what he thinks he is doing. Kim stands there and asks them, but they can't tell. Then he answers he is trying to avenge his fallen subordinates, so this has absolutely nothing to do with his emotions. However, the Shield Guild is South Korea's strongest and greatest guild. They are the protectors of the perilous capital region. They are the Shield of South Korea. The guild has over 5,000 members, including one of the 3S rank players in South Korea. Moreover, Kim makes Chiol severely injured, and his team member, holding their weapons, run toward Kim to defeat him. Kim, with his one blow, attacks one of Chiol's team members, and the stick he holds in his hand to attack Kim hits his neck so hard that he gets badly injured. After this, Kim attacks the other man on their team. Kim slams his leg on his neck, and in return, he bites Kim's leg. Kim punched and crashed him, as there were many, Kim attacked them all together with his one blow and hit them all. All of their legs, arms and bones get broken, and their teeth are broken and thrown out of their mouth, and they all get severely injured. But they don't give up and come forward to attack Kim with their broken bones and teeth. Kim grabs one of them and quickly spins him around, and due to that spin, a strong gust of wind occurs there, and the other team members hold their weapons back away in fear. After twirling him, Kim throws him far away. Sees this, they all get scared. Captain Chiol is severely injured, lying his head up and clenches his teeth to see the situation. Also, he is shocked to see Kim's courageousness. 
After this, Chiol asks himself what on earth is going on right now. He brought their most elite members on this mission to make sure they succeed, but he is just wiping the floor with them. Then, looking toward Kim, he thinks, and he is even doing it with such a bored expression on his face. However, in Bangbi, Seoul, the Shield Guild headquarters, the injured are brought to the hospital in an ambulance and put on a stretcher to take them to the emergency ward. The doctor there, pointing ahead toward Ward B, says to his team they have five more patients in critical condition. They have to hurry because patient C has internal bleeding and prepare for surgery immediately. However, the director gets there in the hospital holding the cigarette in his mouth, and he says this is why he told Chiol to recruit the man peacefully. Seeing the director there, two doctors stood aside and said good evening, director. In contrast, the director stands there with a cigarette in his mouth and, putting his other hand in his pant pocket, replies he thinks they can all agree that this is not a good evening, doctor. Then, he asks the doctor if he needs to speak with Captain Chiol, could they give them a little privacy? The doctor respectfully replies, but the captain is still unconscious, sir. The director steps ahead toward Captain Stretcher, saying he will take care of it and leave it up to him. The doctor slides the curtain, replaying of course, sir. After this, the director takes out the object from his coat's inside pocket, asking to look at this mess, he beat him up badly, didn't he? Then he clicked that object saying that he still needed to hear what happened there, and then he stabbed that object in Chial's stomach. After this, he glued the button. As soon as the potion-like thing goes into Chial's body, his hand starts to twitch, and lying there on the stretcher, he starts shaking. While the director stands there holding that object after a minute, Chiol jumps and sits up on the stretcher, panting. After this, the director sits on the bench, lying beside the stretcher and looking toward Chiol. He says he never expected to ever see him like this. Captain looking toward the director, calls out his name fearfully, then he heads down and stays silent, and after a minute, he replies he is ashamed. However, the director gets up from the bench and, with a cigarette in his mouth, asks him to tell him everything that happened. Captain Chiol head down, presses his lower lip, and then regains his spirit and replies Kim single-handedly defeats the entire scouting team, including himself, sir. Hearing this, the director is surprised. Then he takes the cigarette out of his mouth and surprisingly asks if it is really that strong. Captain with a disappointed face replies yes, he is incredibly strong and his power is almost immeasurable. Hearing this, the director squeezed his eyes because it was hard for the director to believe that Captain Chiol would admit his opponent's superiority. After this, the director sighs, saying let him ask him this, then he asks Chiol if he thinks Kim could compete with their guild master. Captain replies well of course he can. Then he presses his lips and gets silent. Because he could not come to a conclusion, Kim and the Shield Guild's guild master's strengths were both beyond Chiol's comprehension. A small man cannot see past the wall he is facing. Thus, he cannot properly grasp what lies beyond the other side. After much thought, the captain replies he doesn't know, sir. Then the director, leaning back on the bench, is slightly forward, asking Chiol if he thinks they can get him to join their guild. Captain Chiol clenches his fist and presses his lips, then he replies no, sir, he is not sure why, but he seems to be hostile toward them. Then he remembered the time when Kim was crashing his team member on the cliff. Retaining that time, his eyes wide open and his face started to sweat. Then he says, extremely hostile at that. Sees this, the director surprisingly looks toward him, then he gets up from the bench, saying, well he thinks he understands now. After this, the director moves toward the curtain. He pulls back the curtain, saying take some rest, for the time being, Captain. His body should still be under some stress since he used a drug to wake him up. Captain Chiol sits there, turns his head, looks toward the director leaving, and replies yes sir. After this, the director stands outside the captain's room, smokes a cigarette, and blows the smoke out of his mouth, thinking they will have to take care of Kim before the other guild recruits him. Then he took out his mobile phone and dialed the number, and while coming toward the exit door of the hospital, he called someone, saying he sent a request for execution to the vice guild master. After this, the call ended, and the director stepped toward the exit door. He thought they would have to get rid of him if he didn't join them, and he wouldn't leave a single threat to his well-being. The next day at Four Star Dungeon, the Abyssal Shore, the crab monster appears, and Kim, wearing his armor, stands there. The monster roared, and Kim splattered the monster in one blow. After killing the monster Kim calls the system, saying he wants to ask it something. 
The window appears before him to warn him to go ahead, playing as Kim stands his back toward the shore. Suddenly from shore, the water started blubbing, and the huge fishy monster got out of the water. With the rapid wave of waterfalls there, Kim clenched his fist, jumped, pet up toward the fishy monster, and punched it so hard that the huge fishy monster splattered in his one blow. After this, Kim stands there and asks the system to give him a detailed explanation of the daystone that he got from the albatross corpse. The window appears before him. The command received from the daystone is the black orb he obtained previously as the system was about to complete his sentence. Kim added his point, saying he was aware of that already. He was asking if he knew anything else about it, and then another window appeared, indicating that he was unable to access further information in offline mode. Hearing that, Kim waves his hand and sighs, saying forgets it, and then another window appears before him. However, he can absorb the day stone into the system. As Kim was waving his hand, hearing those words, he stopped there and looked up toward the window, asking the system to absorb the day stone into the system. After this, Kim took the stone from his pocket and stared at it, holding it in his hand, and asked the system if he could absorb it. As Kim stands there staring at that stone, a window appears before him, telling him that the absorption of the day stone will grant two results. Firstly, a system upgrade. Secondly, the access to the source of the dungeons. Hearing this, Kim stares at the stone, surprisingly thinking the source of the dungeons. He replies that the system absorbs it. The system answers to the command received, initiating Day's stone absorption. After this, the guy with silver hair wearing a hat and holding the sketch page in hand enters the crowded place. People pass by him, turn their heads and glance at him. Looking toward him, people start murmuring. He passes by the crowd of people staring at that sketch page, thinking this is not easy. As he was looking suspicious, people there got scared to see him. He called the lady passing by him. The lady flinched, and he showed the sketch page to her, asking if she had seen a person who looked like this around there. The lady stares at the sketch page and flutters, then she gets surprised and remains silent. On the other side, Kim was absorbing that day's stone. A bright light was coming out of it, and it spread there upward. As the guy stands there showing that sketch page to the lady, a handmade cartoon picture is drawn on that page, and its bottom side is written with distinct features, black hair turns white sometimes. Seeing this picture, the lady fearfully turns, answering no, she doesn't think she has while thinking how she is supposed to tell from that. While the guy stands there on the footpath, stares at the sketch page, and scratches his head laughing. On Kim's side, a bright light spreads everywhere there, and the system absorbs that stone. As soon as the system absorbs the day stone in Kim's hand, his hand starts to sparkle. The window appears before him that the day stone absorption is a complete launching system expansion. At the same time, that guy stands there on the footpath, spinning in the distance while people pass by him. He silently stands there, then he grins and swishes his hat. He removes that hate and looks aside, smiling, saying there is he Jibong Kim. However, another notification window appears before Kim that new features have been added to the system. The first is character analysis, and the second is emoted. Hearing this, Kim looked up, asking if the system character analysis was different from the previous character search feature. In answer, the window appears, explaining to him the character analysis function, allowing him to search for a character's detailed information including their height, weight, date of birth, and so forth. Additionally, if the subject is a player, the character's stats are accessible. Hearing this all, Kim stands there and says the system is good, so he will finally be useful to him from now on. After this, Kim asks the system what this emote function does. However, in response system shows Kim the emoji, Kim silently stands there and asks if it is, and the system showing the emoji on the window replies yes. After this, Kim flies from there to the textile company's roof. He thumps on the rooftop, closes his eyes, and says the system deactivates his ability. His ability starts to halt, and his armor also begins to disappear, and he returns to his original officer look. He pulls back the door and enters the stairs, saying system, find the nearest bus stop that heads toward the military base. As he was descending the stairs, the system replied command received, navigating toward the bus stop so 93 miles from his current location. Kim gets out of that company and moves toward the footpath, thinking so 93 miles as he thinks this. The system asks him why he is taking the bus when he can fly to the base. Hearing this, Kim is surprised and remains silent. 
Then, surprisingly, he thought the system asked him a question, is this an effect of the recent expansion? Then he thoughtfully replies to the system Lieutenant Colonel O asked him to do so. He says that he wreaks havoc in the Air Force whenever he flies over there. Saying this, Kim thinks he is begging him to travel to the base by land, and then the system replies he sees by showing him the emoji. After this, Kim asks the system again about those emoticons, the system sent a question mark to him, and he replied never mind. Kim moved toward the bus stop. While on the way, he noticed the unknown guy was following him. He stopped there and turned his head, asking who is this guy. Then he steps ahead, thinking he has been following him this whole time, is he from the SHIELD guild? Furthermore, he questions himself, and then he answers that no, this wouldn't make any sense because he is not hostile to him at all. He can't detect any aggression toward him, then he stops there and turns his head to look back toward him, thinking he should use this opportunity to test out the character analysis function. Then he asks the system to run a character analysis on this guy. The system replies that the command has been received, initiating analysis. While that silver-haired guy stands far from Kim's smile and system replies error analysis failed. Kim looks up toward the window, saying he thought he was supposed to be upgraded, in the response system shows an emoji. After this, Kim arrives at the bus stop. He sits there on the bench, and the window appears and gives him a warning. Also, the stranger is approaching Kim. Meanwhile, the stranger comes and stands before Kim. While Kim sits there on the bench, head down. As soon as the guy stands before Kim, he heads up and looks toward him, thinking finally, let's take a good look at him. The boy stands before Kim with his hat on his chest. Kim looks at him from top to bottom, and then the boy sits beside Kim on the bench and plops. Kim sits there slightly, turns his eyes, and looks toward him, thinking, what's with this guy? Why is he smiling then thinks, and he doesn't recognize his face, what could be his motive? He is not trying to hide the fact that he is following him, judging by that smile. Meanwhile, the bus screeches at the bus stop, and the system tells Kim his bus to the army has arrived. After this, Kim got up, and that boy sat there on the bench, staring at him. Kim entered the bus and made his payment for the ticket. While making the payment he thought, let's ignore him, he doesn't want to get involved in this. After this, he goes and plops on the seat. Kim looks out of the bus window while the silver-haired outside disappears, and Kim is surprised, thinking about where he went. Meanwhile, the guy appears on the seat next to him. Sees him there, Kim gets shocked and silently sits there with folded arms. However, this was the first time Kim had ever been shocked in the last 3 or 20 years since his confinement. After this, the bus goes to the army base. However, in the four-star dungeon, the giant snake swamp was hissing there. Meanwhile, Park Terum, the Emperor, and the Vice Guildmaster of the Shield Guild, got there holding his sword. He threw the sword into the ground and stood there while his torn clothes fluttered in the air. He stares at the multiple giant snakes there, pulls his sword from the mud ground, and steps toward the snake barefoot. After this, he strikes his sword and attacks the hissing giant snake, slicing it in one blow. As soon as he cut one of the giant snakes, many more gathered around him, hissing. He jumps and slices two of them with his sword. After killing them, he moves toward the remaining snakes. He attacks them with his sword and kills them. Only one snake remains. After this, a huge giant snake at its back opened its mouth and loudly hissed. Terum crashes the snake with his sword while the injured snake tries to squelch, but he jumps on the snake and splats it with his sword. After killing all the giant snakes, Terum placed his sword on the shoulder and moved from there. While on the way, he notices someone. He tightens the grip of his sword and throws it ahead. The sword crumbles into the ground and dust and smoke spread there. Terum stands there and says, show himself. And from that dust smoke, the director comes out. The director kept a hand on the sword cross guard smile, saying that could have almost killed him, vice guild master. Terum steps toward the director, answering he is still as creepy as ever. The director laughs, saying and his choice of words is harsh as well. And then the director return him his sword that was stuck there in the mud ground. Terum takes his sword and places it on his shoulder while the director stands there smiling, saying the venom of a giant snake corrodes metal. He understands that he is their vice guildmaster, but he would appreciate it if he kept the guild's finances in mind. Terum replies stop his nagging and explain to him why he is there. 
After this, he steps ahead to leave, then he stops, turns his head, and angrily looks toward the director, saying he thought he told him to leave him alone, unless it was for something important. The director stands there, taking out his cigarette from his pocket, and asks if their guild has not contacted him at all. Well, he guessed he has effectively been living inside the dungeons. Then he put the cigarette in his mouth, saying to put it simply, they need him to get rid of someone for them. Tarim stands there and remains silent. Then he splats his foot and replies he is not interested in leaving something like that to the scouting team. The director stands behind him, smokes a cigarette, and blows it out of his mouth to smile, answering they already tried, but the entire scouting team was annihilated. They couldn't even leave a single scratch. Hearing this, Tarim was surprised, his eyes wide open, and he turned his eyes to look back. However, the scouting team they are the Shield Guild's specialized combat team designed to take on other players. All of the members had been trained to be the guild's elite fighters, except for some experienced hunting. They were specifically trained for combat against players, and had priority to the guild's best equipment, which is why they had just succeeded in a mission. Hearing this, Park Tarum remained silent, then he turned his head, smiled, and threw his sword in the mud sword. Then he looks toward the director and gives an evil smile, saying now he has his attention and explains everything to him. On the other side, in the Prime Minister of South Korea, Seongrong Gu's office, Tarim, killed many of her men with his sword after killing them and destroying the accessories of the office. He sits there on Gu's chair, placing his sword on his shoulder. Also, the blood of the killed people is dripping from his sword tip. However, Prime Minister Gu got there with her subordinates. Seeing her there, Park Tarim sat on the chair and smiled, saying long time to see MS Gu. However, Seongrong Gu is the Prime Minister and an S-rank player in South Korea despite being one of the strongest players in the country. She chose to become a politician to help as many people as she possibly could. She is the hero of South Korea. Seeing the situation in her office and the dead and injured people, she stands there furiously looking toward Tarim. Sitting on the chair, Tarim smiled, asking for a long time to see how she had been. Gu heatedly looked toward him, answering that it should be none of his concern and that she didn't think they should be exchanging friendly greetings anymore. Hearing this, Tarim laughs, saying she is as cold as always, then he asks if she thinks she is being a little harsh on him. Furthermore, he says it's been three years since they have seen each other. Gu remains silent and clenches her fist. After a minute, she replies he is right. It has been three years. Saying this, she takes out her magic sword and activates her magic powers. Then she furiously looked toward him, asking if he had completely forgotten about her temper in such a short period. As soon as he activates her magic power, her subordinates stand behind her angrily look toward Tarim and clench their fists and teeth. Moreover, Gu is an S-rank player as well as the Prime Minister of Korea, but those aren't the only distinguishable titles she has. She was one of the first players to be awakened on that fateful day ten years ago. Also known as the first generation, Gu stands there, puts her sword in a horizontal position and raises her voice, saying activate the ability. The bright light spread there, and her mass teleport seven star teleportation spell created a flash of light that appeared there in the office. Also, the light flash comes out of the building floor where the Prime Minister's office is located, and then both Gu and Tarim disappear from there. Sees this, her subordinates, putting their hands on their eyes, surprisingly look around in the office, after this, at a coastal cliff in Ganjung City Gangwon Island. A flash of purple light falls there, and from that, both Gu and Tarim appear holding their swords. Both of them stand before each other, and dust and smoke spread behind them due to that flash of light. After this, Tarim, looking toward Gu, smiled, saying she hadn't lost her touch in the slightest. She even managed to exclude the wounded in her spell. Also, the area where that flash of light fell got dark on the ground, and the smoke was emerging outward. Gu points her sword toward him, answering Vice Guild Master of the Shield Guild, Park Tarim. He is under arrest for treason against the Republic of Korea. Saying this, she activates her seven-star teleportation spell. On Kim's side, the bus was about to arrive at its destination. After arriving there, it squeak, and the announcement was made this stop was the Capital City Defense Force Headquarters. Kim stepped out of the bus, as soon as he stepped out, the boy also stepped out after him, and he glanced all around there because he was impressed by the military base area. Kim was getting irritated by his actions. He follows Kim wherever he goes. 
Kim steps toward the manual barrier and two soldiers stand there seeing him there and salute him. Surprisingly, they look toward the silver-haired guy who is humming along behind Kim. Kim passes the manual barrier while the guard stands there and asks Kim if he is his guest, sir. Kim replies with an irritated facial expression he has nothing to do with him. The soldier stops that guy there, saying stop right there sir, he is not allowed to enter from there. The guy gets surprised and surprisingly asks why. The soldiers replies this is a military zone and the base is a restricted area for ordinary civilians. Kim stands ahead size and then he moves toward his room, thinking seriously, what is up with that kid? After this, standing in the room, he removes his coat and hangs it in the cupboard, recalling the time when the system absorbed the black ore. Also, remember the notification window that was about his access to the sources of the dungeon. Then he pulls his tie, asking himself what the source of the dungeon is supposed to be exactly. He could ask the system, but he is sure it will be clueless again. After this, he takes off his shirt, asking himself if he should gather some more day stones and feed them to the system. Then he thinks that might make the system smarter than it currently is thinking this, Kim was changing his clothes while the boy was looking in through the glass window. While wearing his shorts, Kim's eyes fell on the boy who was watching him from the window. However, outside the Kim apartment soldiers holding their guns were finding that guy. Looking at him hanging from the window above on the second floor, the soldiers raised their voices, there is he, get him, stop him there. Sees the soldier there, he jumps down and runs away, laughing while Kim stands up in his room and surprisingly looks down toward the boy, then sighs. While the soldier runs after him, shouting stop there. They are warning him. While running after him, one of the soldiers asks what a complete mess this boy is. On the other side, at the cliff, the duel continued between Gu and Terum. Both were in their powers. Gu clangs her sword with Terum's sword, and in return, he jumps and clangs her sword. As soon as he banged his big sword, and in return, with all her might, she pushed back his sword. Terum also pushed her sword while going her sword and heatedly looked toward her, asking Kim to hand him over. This is his demand as the Shield Guild's Vice Guildmaster and the Blade Emperor. Hearing this, she surprisingly looks at him under her sword, then she presses her lips thinking, so that's it. Now, she understands what the Shield Guild is trying to do. After this, Gu pushes his huge sword, answering thanks to Kim's recent demolition of the dungeons, and Tarim remains silent. Then she says the government did not renew its contract with the Shield Guild for the capital city's defense. Hearing this, Tarim remembers the director's words when he tells him about the news, which he listens to in the bar with Captain Chiol. The news was when the news reporter said the government had officially announced its relationship with the Shield Guild and the discontinuation of the Shield Guild's protective services in the Seoul metropolitan area. Gu stands there pushing his sword and says since he couldn't profit off of their taxes anymore, their guild found itself in financial trouble. So they tried to persuade Kim to join them using money and violence. Hearing this, Tarim is surprised, and she crashes her magic sword to attack him, but he jumps backward. Gu stands there, starts creating her power, and angrily looks toward Tarim, saying the Shield Guild has always gotten away with abusing its power. Until it realized that both wealth and authority did not matter in front of Kim, he must have wiped the floor with his team. And now that they failed to recruit him, the last option for the Guild was to kill Kim instead. It would be a waste of talent to kill a warrior like him, but he had no other choice but to obtain the contract for the capital city's defense. Then she heatedly looked toward him, saying but he made a huge mistake, then she asked if he thought he could threaten her to hand over Kim. He even dared to injure her innocent subordinates. On top of that saying this, she sent a flame wave toward him. He looked up toward the flame wave, and then she pinched and smiled, saying she thinks he needs another good old beating from Goo, little Tarim. As she snaps the pinch, a lot of flame waves move toward him to attack him. On the other side, in the army base, they tied that boy's arms with rope and made him sit on the ground. He sits there cross-legged, and Kim and his other team members stand there before him. Kim, holding the door handle, silently stares at him, and then he asks his team members if they manage to capture him. They both head down replies, well actually, it's more like he decided to sit down there instead of them catching him. They just tied him up since he wasn't moving at all. Kim stood there and stared at him, and he, with a smiling face, looked toward him. After this, Kim looks toward him and says well, let's hear it then asks why he is following him kid, the boy looks toward Kim, puts his lips inside his mouth, and makes an innocent face. 
Then he laughs, asking Kim what he means and why. Then he says he just wanted to see Kim. Hearing this, Kim and his team members are surprised, and then Kim's team member lady starts to blush. Sees her expression Kim and his male team member make the annoyed face. After this, Kim slightly bent before the boy asked who he was, and if he did not even know anything about him. The boy laughs at this, and Kim scolds him, saying stop laughing. After this, the boy replies of course he knows him Kim, he is the one who came from the rift. Hearing this, Kim slightly bent before him looked toward him, surprisingly, asking what while thinking about the rift. The boy replies he was curious as well about what had come out of that rift. Then he asks what makes him so special to make him find him like this, and then he says he wonders. Hearing this, Kim is surprised and stands there thinking he knows about him. Then the boy sits there and says he hopes they can get along very well, and Kim remains silent. The boy laughed, saying that he would be living there with him from now on. Hearing this, the vice captain of Kim's team put his dagger on the boy's neck from behind. The boy gets scared, and then the vice captain stands his back and abuses him angrily, saying he has heard enough of him. Then he says this is a military base. It's not a place for him to walk in whenever he wants. The boy sits there and turns his head to look at the vice captain. Then he excitedly smiles asking if can he be a soldier as well. Hearing this, the vice captain splurts, then laughs and sees this the boy surprisingly looks toward the vice captain to get the answer. After this, the vice captain answers fine, and then Kim and his team members stand there surprised. Then the vice captain put his sword in the belt saying, but they do require everyone to pass a special test before they can join them. Defeat him in one-on-one -on -one combat. Only then will they accept him as a member of their team. Hearing this, the boy is surprised, and Kim stands there looking toward the vice captain, calling out his name, and the vice captain stops him, saying captain, he needs this. Then he grits, saying he can't let this kid be disrespectful to him any longer sir. Then the boy, looking toward the vice captain, says but if everyone has to defeat him to join the team, then he asks, does that mean that everyone there has done that already? Hearing this, Kim's team member stands there PFFT the vice captain angrily looks toward them, and they both get scared and turn their head. The lady starts using her mobile phone to avoid eye contact with the vice captain. Then vice captain stands there angrily, looking toward the boy, crackling his hand, saying that's right, he is this team's weakest link, so let's see if he can take him on. On the other side of the cliff, the flame-waving storm was quickly moving toward Terum, he clashed his sword, then slashed his hand on the ground and splashed the flaming storm. Sees this, Gu gets surprised, then Terum laughs and puts his hands under his shirt pocket, saying alright he gets it. Then he asks her, so she refuses to hand over Kim to them. Then he takes out the stone from his pocket and tightly holds it in his hand and shows it to her. Sees that stone in his hand, and she surprisingly thinks that it's a recall stone, then she jumps toward him to stop him from breaking that stone sees her coming toward him, and he smiles, saying come to think of it. Then he asks her if she is one of the most capable protectors in Korea, isn't she? Asking this, Terum shatters the stone in his hand. She jumps up to attack him with her sword. He stands there and gives her an evil smile, saying well, let's see if she can protect her new precious toy. But before she attacks him, a flash of light emerges from the ground and goes upside down toward the sky. However, the stone activated, and Terum was banished leaving her in the area. Gu stands in that banished area holding her sword grit, then thinks Kim is powerful, he is undoubtedly an S-rank player. But Tarim is also an S-rank player and has the mythical weapon Chaos Dragon Fang. Furthermore, she stands there and clenches her teeth, thinking he is the worst possible opponent for Kim. On the other side in the military base, the vice captain stands there, cracking his hand, saying that's right, he is the team's weakest link, so let's see if he can take him on. After this, he abuses the boy and makes his fist, then jumps toward him to attack him, but before he punches him, the boy steps backward and lifts his leg to kick him. Vice Captain is about to fall then he looks up toward the boy's leg. The boy smiles and jumps up, asking if he is allowed to stay there if he defeats him right. Then the boy clenched his fist and extended it to punch the Vice Captain with all his might. The Vice Captain stands there, stares at the punch, and gets scared thinking of an overwhelming difference in power and inevitable defeat. Vice Captain feels his hand reaching toward him so big that his eyes widen in fear as the boy is about to punch his face. Meanwhile, Kim gets there and stops his punch with his index finger. 
The bright light spreads where the boy's fist and Kim's finger meet. Sees this, the boy surprisingly looks toward Kim as he is shocked to see how Kim has blocked his punch with his finger. Once this became obvious, he broke out in a cold sweat. The boy stood there, slightly smiling, and Kim swished his fist with his index finger. After some time, Kim and the boy stand before each other. Kim tells him they haven't even asked for his name yet. Then, looking down with a tired face, Kim briefly introduces himself and asks the boy his name. The boy smiles, answering he is H.W.I. Kang, and the vice captain stands behind Kim, calls out his name, and extends his hand toward the boy while Kim stands ahead of him, his back to the vice captain, and replies he is not a match. Then Kim turned his head, saying he must learn to recognize his opponent's strength, vice captain. Hearing this, the vice captain stands there, extending his hand, stops there, and gets ashamed and disappointed. Then he holds his hand and heads down. Then, with teary eyes, he leaned down, replaying yes sir, and clenched his fist. Kim stands there, turns his eyes, and looks toward the vice captain, remaining silent. After this, H.W.I. Kang stands before Kim, looks toward him, and asks if he must learn to recognize his opponent's strength, those words were directed at him. Kim looks toward him and replies that he guessed he was not an idiot. Then he asks if he still wants to start a fight with him. Kang responds well, he has no other choice, he has his circumstances, and he is also very curious. Kim surprisingly asks what he is talking about. Hearing this, Kim's team members get surprised and then press their lips, thinking, is that guy planning to fight their captain? However, the special dungeon control team, Aka Team Kim, has been the closest witness to Kim's power over the last six months. Vice Captain stands there, is lost in his thoughts, then he thinks that moron. He could tell he was pretty strong from his movements, but Captain Kim was on a whole other level. As Kim and Kang stand before each other, Kang sets himself and cracks his hand to attack Kim, saying there he comes. Kim stands there, putting his hand in his pant pocket, and surprisingly, asks where he thinks he is going. Kang jumps to punch Kim, while Kim silently stands there Kang punches Miss, and his hand passes by Kim. After this, Kang again extends his fist to punch Kim. Looking toward Kim, he sticks out his tongue, but before he punches Kim. Kim kicked him with his leg and injured his arms, saying that it was for trying to hurt his subordinate. Sees this, Kim's team members and the vice captain stood there surprised. Vice captain starts trembling, thinking as he would expect from their captain. After this, Kang again moves toward Kim to punch him, and Kim stands there, setting his leg to hit him again. This time, Kang extends his crossed arms before him to save himself from Kim's hit. Sees Kang before Kim cracks his hand and surprisingly says it looks like he is fine, even though he kicked him pretty hard there. Kim tries to punch him, but Kang moves aside and Kim's punches get missed. Kim extends his fist again to beat him, asking So Kang his name who sent him to find him and what he wants. Kang steps backward, squeaks his foot and remains silent. Kim punches him again, but Kang, bending back, replies he can't tell him it's secret. Kim punched Mist whenever he tried to beat him. Kim stood before Kang to beat him, but before he hit him, Kang hit Kim with his leg and threw him away. Sees this, Kim is surprised, and while flying in the air, he surprisingly thinks that this is the first time he has been sent flying. Meanwhile, Kang creates a magic-like purple aura with his hand and throws it toward Kim, saying don't be so surprised already. Sees that aura coming toward him. Kim stands in the air and gets surprised, then he twangs that aura and hardly douche that magic attack. After this, that purple-like aura flashed in the sky, and Kim stood there surprisingly asking himself, what was that, some magic, then he answered himself, no, it was something different from that. After this, Kim gets down on the ground and stands in front of Kang, asking if that magic was a gi blast Kang stands there, extending his hand toward Kim's smile. Kang created that purple aura ball from his hand and threw it toward Kim, answering something like that. That aura crashed on the ground, and a dust explosion occurred where Kim stood while Kang was still creating that aura, and his body was wholly covered with his magic. As the explosion occurs, Kang keeps throwing his magic ball toward Kim, and these balls attack Kim like bullets, and the explosion continuously keeps occurring there. Sees this, Kim's team members get surprised while Kim is in that explosion, and Kang throws his magic balls toward Kim. Vice Captain's eyes widened, and he started sweating thinking he didn't expect him to be normal, but how was he this strong? After this, Kang stops throwing his magic balls toward Kim. 
Only the dust and smoke remain there. From that smoke, a shadow emerges. Sees this, Kang gets surprised, and after a second, Kim comes out of that dust explosion shirtless, saying he only survived because he said that. Looking toward Kim, Kang starts to sweat and stick out his tongue, saying he is pretty tough. Hearing this, Kim and Kim's team members show annoying facial expressions. Kang stared at Kim's body, then looked impressively toward Kim, he says he didn't expect him to be so unscathed after that. Kim, while ripping off his half-ridden shirt on his body, asks unscathed, can't he see how badly his shirt is damaged? After this, Kim angrily looks toward Kang and asks if he has done anything. Then he crack his hand, saying cause if he is, now it's his turn, he is done. Kang lifts his arm, saying he gave up, Kim clenching his fist angrily moves toward Kang and sees Kim's team members flinch and step backward. Kang stands there looking toward Kim and says he is impressed that he is really strong. He is much stronger than he ever imagined. Hearing this, Kim's team members stand there surprised, thinking, what is up with this kid? Then Kang points toward the vice captain and laughs, asking if he can stay there now, he did beat that man in a fight. Vice captain angrily looks toward Kang, then Kang laughs and raises his hand to stroke Kim's hand, saying, let's be good friends from now on, Kim. Kim remained silent and angrily replied that he had never said he was done yet. He punched him in the face, and as he stood, sticking out his tongue, asking what did he mean. Kim punches him, and Kang falls far into the air rolling. Then he thuds his head on the ground. Kim turns and, putting his hands in his pocket, asks his team member to help the rookie unpack his belongings, and then he goes to his room. Kim's team member stood there surprisingly and silently, gulping and looking toward Kang, thinking who thought this monster was their new rookie. Also, the ground was cracked in many places, and Kang was lying on the ground, slightly injured. His eyes were rolling, and his mouth was opened. However, Inchin Field Dungeons, the Fire Dragon's Nest Dungeon, rank 8 stars, the highest currently available. In the news, the news reporter Bok Rai Kwon from the Special Dungeons Research Center told the viewers various speculations about this dungeon. Still, all the experts agree on whether the Fire Dragon ever awakens. Then, the Republic of Korea will face its greatest crisis since its foundation. Moreover, Tarim stands in the dungeon and intentionally awakens the Fire Dragon by killing the Fire Dragon Hatch. He stands there stabbing his weapon in its head and loudly laughing. Thus, the Fire Dragon awoke and started crashing the city with its fire, destroying the whole city with fire. It roared, and therefore, humanity's downfall had just begun. Ten minutes before the Fire Dragon's awakening, Dragon Fire Hatching was in the dungeon. Terum placed his sword on his shoulder and stood there beside the Dragon Hatching. Also, the director puts his hands in his pant pocket, and the Shield Guild members holding their weapons stand there. While looking toward the Dragon Hatching, the director says to Terum that this was tougher than he expected. He guessed it was still a Fire Dragon Hatching and not. Tarim, placing his sword on the shoulder, turns his head, angrily looks toward the director, and answers stop dragging this out and tells him how they will drag Kim out. The director exhales cigarette smoke and answers it quite simply. Then he sits before the dragon hatching and gives an evil smile, saying they will awaken the fire dragon by killing its hatchling. Once the government notices the fire dragon's awakening, they will dispatch the special forces to buy some time for the city and by special forces, he means the special dungeon control team, Aka Kim's unit. Hearing this, Tarim asks him then what about the aftermath, and how will they deal with the fire dragon's wrath? Even if they manage to kill Kim, they can't handle the fire dragon on their own. The director sits there takes out the daystone from his coat's inner pocket, and smiles, saying that's the most important part of this plan. Then, showing it to them, he smiles and says they will use this to seal the dragon again. Tarim, looking toward the Daystone, gets surprised then surprisingly, asks a Daystone, and the director answers they had recently completed a study on it in Saudi Arabia, and they discovered that even the Fire Dragon could be put back to sleep with a Daystone. Hearing this, Tarim splurts the Dragon Hatchling with his weapon. The Dragon Hatchling starts to tremble, then plops on the ground and dies. Tarim stands there stabbing his sword in the Dragon Hatchling's head, gives an evil smile, and then loudly laughs. Then he looks up, saying it is amazing, now come and face his death Kim. On the other side of the city there, on the school grounds, the children were swinging during recess time. A child named Jun Hyuk stands on the ground looking up toward the sky, and her teacher surprisingly looks at him, asking what happened. Then she goes to him, asking what it is Jun Hyuk. 
he pointed up toward the sky. The teacher looked up, surprised to see the sky had turned red. However, many military tanks pass the road and helicopters fly over the city. The breaking news starts coming on TV, and in the news outlet Emergency, the reporter informs the viewers that this broadcast is not a drill. All citizens must evacuate immediately to a nearby emergency shelter. People stand on the road, gathering to listen to the news, and the news reporter further repeats that all citizens must evacuate immediately to a nearby emergency shelter. The government of the Republic of Korea has declared martial law. Listening to that news, the people get scared, and chaos spreads everywhere, and it was just like the catastrophe ten years ago. During the interview with a professor, the journalist says they have invited S. University professor Garam Park to run through the situation. Then, the journalist asked the professor how he would explain this situation. Professor Parkine said he would describe it as the dawn of a horrible catastrophe. Russia has experienced a situation like this in the past. Their government had to use nuclear warheads to neutralize the dungeon break since it was too overwhelming for their players. Furthermore, he says that was only possible because their disaster occurred in an uninhabited region in Siberia. Unfortunately, their country is in no position to implement such a solution. Hearing this, all the people standing outside the news outlet get sacred. Moreover, South Korea developed into chaos just as it did ten years ago. Gu, with her team member in the helicopter, was exploring the city's situation. Sitting in the plane wearing an aviation headset, she says this must be the SHIELD guilds doing those psychopaths. Then she turned and looked toward her companion, ordering her to call the National Intelligence Service and tell them to locate the SHIELD guild immediately. After this, Gu remains silent. After thinking for a while, she asks where the president is. Her companion replies he was evacuated to an underground bunker and his full authority has been delegated to her. Hearing this, she set her aviation headset and squeezed her eyes, sighing, asking if his full authority just meant he wanted her to die first. After this, the pilot of Gu's helicopter, looking outside the glass window, informs her they have located their target destination. Then, standing up in the air away from the red color shield, the pilot informs the Incheon Field dungeon is two miles ahead. The government created the red color shield to control the dungeon break, and when the shield breaks, the fire dragon comes out and destroys everything. Gu stares at the red shield from the helicopter window, and then orders her team members to send emergency notices to all the guild masters. On the other side, in the news outlet, two news reporters were discussing that matter with a professor. The male news reporter looking toward the professor asks well how can the government react to this situation professor? The professor replies he is not sure, but if they are going by the books they will probably. Gu in the helicopter orders her team members to summon the top 100 players in South Korea to this location. However, the bright wavy light was coming out of the red shield meanwhile Kim with his team member wearing physical armor got there. Kang was also with them, as he had become their team member Kim stood before the red shield and said they were finally there while his team members were scared. Hearing this, the vice captain gulps, and they all start trembling. Their hands are shaking, and the vice captain stands there, thinking he knows why they are there. They are a hero to sacrifice their lives to buy some time. An orange-haired man Kim's team members stand there sweating, thinking a fire dragon is not a creature they can deal with. Their job is to stall the monster as much as they can until the top hundred players arrive. They will most certainly end up dying if they enter this field. As they all were scared meanwhile Kang excitedly jumped up from them, looking toward the shield barrier says it's so huge so this is where the fire dragon lives. See Kang reacting like this in that complicated situation Kim's team members get surprised. After this, the vice captain comes to Kim, and looking toward Kang he asks Kim what should they do with him captain, they brought him along since it was an emergency, but he hasn't been officially enlisted yet. Kim stands ahead of him and replies, just leave him be, he decided to follow them anyway. Then Kim remembers the time when he fought with the Kang in the military base ground. Remembering that time he thinks, and they might have some use for him too, then he steps ahead toward the shield ordering his team members to let go of the shield. They all follow him, replaying yes sir. As soon as they enter, the shield starts making a loud noise and throws them out. They all thud on the ground backward except Kim. Vice Captain sits up and stares at the shield, thinking about what happened. The dungeon rejects them while Kim stands alone in the shield and surprisingly looks back. Then he stands inside the barrier shield head down and presses his lips, thinking he has never seen this happen before. 
Then he asks himself, is this what happens in an eight-star dungeon? After this, he presses his lower lip between his teeth and sighs, thinking he guesses he has no choice. He will have to go in alone. As soon as he believes this suddenly Kang appears near him, Kim surprisingly looks toward Kang stands beside him and asks how he is. In return, Kang asks him what it is. Kim replies never mind, let's go. As they both stood there, they decided to move ahead. Meanwhile, Tarim holding his weapon, ran toward Kim to kill him. Standing there, Kim feels that someone is behind him. He turns his head to look as Kim looks back at Tarim, within a second runs up and stands before Kim in the air, holding his weapon to attack him. Tarim, with an evil smile on his face, calls out Kim's name. Kim stares at him and surprisingly thinks he is fast faster than anyone he has ever seen. After this, within a second, Kim activates his physical enhancement ability, and the bright wavy light starts coming out of his body. The window appears before him and his physical enhancement ability activates awakened mode on. Tarim strikes his weapon to attack Kim, but before he attacks, Kim extends his hand to stop that weapon. Kim tries to save himself, but Tarim strikes his weapon and slashes Kim's arms and chest, then jumps down. The blood spurts out of Kim's arm, and the notification window appears before him. His physical armor has been ignored. However, the whole sky was red, and in the city, military helicopters were flying. A man named Yubin Chin, the official player ranking fourth, was standing on the rooftop. Looking at the situation of the whole city, he sighs, saying what a complete mess. Then he asks himself if the fire dragon truly awakened. Meanwhile, his mobile phone vibrates. He takes out his mobile from his pocket and sees there is an emergency notice on his mobile. Seeing this, he sighed on the other side, a girl named Yui, the official player ranking 99. She was streaming the whole situation of the city. She poured the video, and many people were added to her video chat. She waved her hand, greeted everyone, and recorded the outdoor situation of the city. She was doing her outdoor recording by attaching the mobile phone with a selfie stick, then she pointed the mobile camera at her back, asking the viewers if everyone could see this. The sky is red in Inchin right now. Then, while streaming, she, with a surprised face, asks the viewers if this means that the fire dragon is waking up. As she was pouring the same emergency notice given to her mobile, she checked the notice and then sighed while the viewers asked her what was wrong with Yui. The same emergency notice was given to the official players of rank 14, 68, and 32. They all checked the emergency notice. This notice was about martial law declared, and they are summoning up the top 100 players. On Kim's side, the blood drop was dripping from his body, and he was surprisingly looking toward the blood that was rapidly flowing from his body. And falling to the ground, he looks toward the blood, surprisingly asking what he is bleeding, then thinks while he is in his awakened mode. And the system just mentioned that his physical armor was ignored. After this, Tarim, placing his sword on the shoulder stands before Kim, and asks him if this is the man that everyone has been making a fuss about. Kim heatedly looks toward him. Then, looking up, he says how disappointing Kim is. He remains silent, then looks toward the tattoo on Tarim's body, thinking that tattoo he must be from the Shield Guild. However, Kim sighed, thinking what bad timing, his priority was stopping the Fire Dragon. Then he turned, saying that Tarim got lost. He doesn't have the time to play around with him. As Kim steps ahead, Tarim strikes his sword on the ground, and the fire emerges from the ground upward, and the ground gets cracked. Then Tarim, angrily looking toward Kim, says he doesn't have to worry about the fire dragon. He is going to die right there right now. Kim stands there, turns and silently looks toward him. While the blood drops were rapidly flowing from his body, Kim pulled his physical armor off of his body and tore it from his body. Then he makes a fist with his hand and jumps toward Tarim to punch him, answering let's get this over with. He punched Tarim with all his might. A bright light emanated from there upward, and the dust smoke spread there. As soon as the dust and smoke disappear, Kim plops on the ground there, and Tarim stands before him, pointing his sword toward him. Sees this, the director with his subordinate stand up on the cliff and laugh with a cigarette in his mouth, and then he takes the cigarette out of his mouth and laughs loudly. Kim sits there injured, and Tarim stands before him, holding his weapon. Then, the sound of a crash crumble, and a thud comes out of that red barrier shield. Kim's team members stand outside the barrier shield and get speechless, and the vice captain squeezes his eyes, thinking is there nothing they can do. Meanwhile Gu, with her subordinates, gets there from behind. 
The vice captain turns his head and looks toward her, and then they all turn and look toward her, saying Prime Minister. Gu asks the vice captain where is their captain Kim and why they haven't entered the dungeon, yet the vice captain replies well she sees. The fire dragon's barrier blocked them off madam, hearing this Gu steps toward the shield barrier and touches it to check. After checking it she stands back to them and tells them this barrier wasn't made by the fire dragon vice captain surprisingly asks what she grits thinking this barrier was made by the shield guild. Then she abuses the shield guild asking herself if they went this far to kill Kim. Meanwhile, the media people holding their accessories get to that location and start capturing the pictures making videos and writing all the details. Gu turns her head and looks toward them and the news reporters from different news channels holding the mic to record that scene. One of them says this is NBC News broadcasting live in front of the fire dragon. The other news reporter says this is CMM they are live at the scene of this horrible catastrophe they will be back with more information very soon. Sees this, Gu looking toward her subordinate angrily says get those reporters under control immediately one of them subordinate looking ahead replies that's impossible madam. News agencies from all around the world have already gathered in the area, hearing this Gu clench her teeth. On Kim's side, Terum attacks and splits Kim's body the blood spurts out of his body and seeing this Terum gives an evil smile. Kim was about to fall backward when Terum attacked him again with his sword and severely injured him, seeing this the director stands on the cliff laughing saying the Chaos Dragon Fang Sword. It's the Vice Guildmaster's ultimate weapon, which he obtained from a 7 star dungeon. Then stands there he laughs saying despite its gigantic size, the Chaos Dragon Fang is as light as a feather to its wielder. And its blade can cut through the toughest metals, hearing this shield guild member stand behind the director says he thinks he has heard about it sir. The Chaos Dragon Fang is a mythic tier weapon, the highest tier weapon there is. As the shield guild member was about to complete his sentence the director added his point saying that's right. But its lightweight and razor sharp blade aren't the only things that make it a mythic tier weapon. The Chaos Dragon Fang is also enchanted with various magical effects, and its most well-known enchantment is. On Kim's side, Terum slices his body with his sword, and the window appears before Kim the damage reflection all damage inflicted on the Chaos Dragon Fang is reflected to the opponent. Hearing this, Kim says now he gets it, and Terum stands before him holding his sword, and surprisingly looks toward him. Further, Kim says he was getting injured from his attack earlier, then he asks armor penetration and a damage reflection effect that's quite an impressive weapon. Hearing this, Terum angrily looked toward Kim remained silent, then clenched his sword saying so he still had the energy to talk on his last breath. He swings his sword to attack Kim to kill him also his eyes turn red due to anger, and then he jumps and slices Kim's body with his sword. After splurting Kim's body Terum jumps down behind him and Kim's head stands there and the blood spurts out of Kim's body. Then Kim turns his head and looks toward Terum he takes the weapon in his hand and gives it to him then he extends his hand toward Terum saying it will be perfect for his subordinates. Terum turns his head and looks toward Kim angrily then he shouts at Kim asking how is he still alive after losing so much blood. Kim scratched his head and remained silent then he answered well. He has a little more blood than most people, and then his status window appeared before him on his HP was mentioned. As his HP was a little less than before the window appeared before him, and the majority of the damage he took was from his attacks. Hearing the sound of that window Kim in his mind silently told the system, it was all his fault for giving him the information so late he was useless, and the system replied to him by showing the silent face emoji. However, Terum stands there looking toward Kim Grit, then jumps toward him holding his sword saying he has had enough of this nonsense. Kim stands there silently watching Terum holding his sword quickly coming toward him and answering well he is the one who started all of this. However, Kim clenched his fist to punch Terum with all his might a bright light spread all around there upward. After that, Kim stands there with his punch on Terum's sword while Terum is pushing Kim backward both do their part to push each other. As Kim pushes to push Terum blood spurts out wherever Kim's body is cut. The window appears before Kim and his damage has been reflected hearing this Kim presses his lower lip. Terum while pressing his sword thinks Kim a maniac, then he glances aside asking himself if is this powerful. Blood starts dripping out Kim's mouth and he stands there says Terum as he expects his attacks to hurt. Then he clenches his fist asking so his sword has a damaged reflection, then he stands there holding that sword with his one hand. 
and with his other hand, he clenches his fist saying well, let's see just how much damage it can reflect. Kim's window status appears before him and his HP is getting down. Meanwhile, the fire dragon started roaring in the shield as that fire dragon was so big that when it shook almost half of the city crashed. The red shield starts to crack when the fire dragon throws storm fire from its mouth toward the red shield. And that barrier stops the dragon there it tries to damage it with its fire as well it doesn't stop attacking once at the barrier. The fire dragon attacks the barrier again with the firestorm and that barrier starts crumbling. Sees this, the director and shield guild member stand behind look up toward the barrier and get surprised. After this, the director stands there and starts smoking, while the shield guild member stands behind him fearfully looking up to call out the director. But the director keeps smoking and calmly asks them to calm down further, he says breaking an 8-star dungeon barrier from within is extremely difficult, that's why a high-level dungeon break doesn't occur very often and they still had some time left even a fire dragon can't force a dungeon to break so easily. The fire dragon was roaring and started throwing a firestorm in the city, the director looked up toward the dragon monster thinking, even though he said that an 8-star boss is no joke. Then he takes out that daystone from his pocket and holds it in his hand stare it thinking the barrier is slowly whittling down. They might have to use the daystone sooner than they expected staring at the daystone. He clenched it, then standing up the cliff he glanced toward the explosion that occurred. Then looking toward the explosion that occurred from the area where Kim and Tarim were fighting the director says hopefully the situation will be settled before they have to do that. Meanwhile, Kang gets there and stands beside the director asking situation what situation the director looking down replies well he is referring to Kim. Kang stands beside the director, putting his hand on his head to stare at that explosion. The director heads up and looks toward Kang standing beside him he gets surprised and raises his voice asking who is this kid, then he raises his voice ordering shield guild member, he is the one who was with Kim get him. Hearing this, Kang runs away while the shield guild member runs after him to catch him. On Kim's side, he clenches his fist and keeps punching Tarim's sword while Tarim stands there keeping his sword before Kim and pushing him. While punching the sword Kim gets the notification window that the Chaos Dragon Fang's effect has been activated. His damage has been reflected Kim heard the voice of the window stop there while the blood was dripping from his mouth. As soon as Kim stops punching the sword Tarim stands before Kim keeping his sword before Kim gives an evil smile saying he fools his body and will pay the price for his stupidity. Moreover, Tarim was certain of his victory, no physical attack could escape the damage reflections effect. Kim's great power only meant that he would suffer more damage this battle had already been decided. When a physical damage dealer decided to fight against the Chaos Dragon Fang, Tarim looked toward Kim and smiled saying give it up he already had no chance of, but before he completed his sentence Kim punched the sword and clanged it. The bright light emerged out of the sword where Kim punched as he punched the sword the blood spurt out of Kim's wounds. The window appears before him and his damage has been reflected Tarim looks toward Kim and smiles calling him an idiot. Kim doesn't stop there and again clangs the sword with all his might while the blood from his wounded body is splashing and he squeaks there. Kim jumped toward the sword and kept clanging it with all his might and the bright light was emerging from his punch and spread there. Kim keeps clanging the sword with all his might and Tarim holding his sword falters backward. As they both were standing on the cliff and there they were fighting as soon as Kim clanged the sword Tarim pushed backward surprisingly thinking how is he being pushed back right now. However, the military helicopter gathers up the red shield and Gu with her subordinate stands out that shield. Standing outside the shield Gu and Kim's team members hear the sound of a clang crash coming from that dragon shield get worried and the vice captain standing behind them worriedly calls out the prime minister standing above him. Gu hears that sound of grit thinking the tremors are not from the fire dragon, then she calls out Kim's name. While calling out Kim's name she touches the red shield thinking the shield guild's barrier should she just force her way. Meanwhile, Gu's subordinate stands behind her and tells her she must refrain herself madam, then the subordinate with a sad face head down says she understands how she feels, but she is currently their country's commander-in-chief. If she abandons her post the raid against the fire dragon will almost certainly fail even with the top hundred players, and if that happens the Republic of Korea will be finished hearing this Gu stands beside the red shield and clenches her teeth answering she knows it and she is aware of that already. 
On Kim's side, the explosion occurred due to the clanging of the sword. Suddenly Kim stopped there to clang Tarum's sword. See this, he gulped thinking he finally stopped attacking. Then he asked himself, is it over now? Kim heads up and looks toward Tarim, while the blood is flowing from his mouth and body, as soon as Kim looks toward him, he gives an evil smile considering Kim the monster. Tarim holding his sword stands near the edge of the cliff and Kim stands ahead of him, then Kim clenches his fist to punch the sword saying keep blocking. This time Kim doesn't punch the sword but he crashes it with his elbow, and the bright light emerges from there where Kim was crashing the sword. Kim kept crashing the sword and a light explosion occurred there while Tarim holding his sword was pushing it toward Kim. After crashing it Kim punched the sword and clanged it then he kept clanging and crashing sword. However, it was the bizarre sight that one side kept attacking while the other side blocked, but it was the attacker's body that kept spilling more blood. Tarim stands there blocking Kim's attack and starts to tremble then standing at the edge of the cliff, he falters then he coughs and blood spits out of his mouth. Tarim gets internally injured and stands there at the edge holding his sword, he surprisingly asks himself how is this possible and how is he receiving any damage. The Chaos Dragon Fang's effect should've, and then he got silent while his sword got a little cracked. Sees the sword cracking before him, Tarim's eyes wide open, and holding his sword, sits before Kim while the blood is flowing from his mouth. He silently looks toward Kim and Kim stands before him and says he told him to keep blocking his attack, hearing this Tarim shudders and looks up toward Kim. Then Kim clenched his fist to clang the sword as he extended his hand Tarim sat there fearfully shouting about what to hold on to. But Kim punches the sword and crashes it Tarim falls from the cliff holding his sword and Kim also jumps after him. Tarim falls to the ground keeping his sword before him and Kim keeps crashing his sword as Kim punches his sword, he sinks into the ground. Kim keeps crashing his sword and that sword starts cracking and the bright light emerges there also Tarim keeps sinking into the ground. However, the sword cracks and Tarim coughs. Blood spurts out of his mouth Kim stands on him, punches the sword and slices it. Kim slicing the sword extended his fist to punch Tarim in his face Kim punched his face with all his might and sank him into the cracked ground. Kim destroyed Tarim's face by punching him and he fainted. Then Kim turned and looked toward that broken sword lying there. A bright light was emerging from Kim's head. On Kang's side he was running with joy and SHIELD guild members were also running after him tiredly. After knowing that Kim has won the battle, he stops there on the cliff and excitedly points toward the SHIELD guild members, informing them Kim won his fight. Hearing this, the SHIELD guild's members get shocked and look down toward the light that spreads all around there. That light was a signal of Kim's victory sees that light, they were speechless. On Kim's side, he picks up the broken piece of sword and stares at it, thinking what a waste he broke the sword. While the shield guild member stands up on the cliff, gets surprised, and then looks down toward Tarim and says it's impossible, the vice guild master lost. Sees this, the director stands there up on the cliff with a cigarette in his mouth and remains silent. However, the vice guild master Tarim was unquestionably one of the top three players in South Korea. Nobody had anticipated his loss in this battle. Up until now, the shield guild has gotten away with numerous crimes because they wielded such incredible power. But that unquestionable authority had just been shattered by a single player known as Jibong Kim. After this, one of the SHIELD guild members stands aside from the director and asks him what they should do with the plan now the director remains silent. The SHIELD guild's original plan went like this. They were going to lure in Kim by awakening the fire dragon, have vice guild master Tarim kill Kim, and then use the daystone to put the dragon back into slumber. The world would have seen Kim as a hero who sacrificed his life to stop the fire dragon, but he would have been quickly forgotten. And once Kim was out of the picture, the Korean government would have been forced to rely on the SHIELD guild for the capital city's defense, and the SHIELD would have been revered as the heroes who defended the nation from the fire dragon. That was how things were originally supposed to unfold. The director stands there, squeezes his eyes, and looking down toward the light, says they are falling back and tells everyone to prepare their recall stones. Hearing this, the SHIELD guild members get silent and scared, and one of them surprisingly asks the director what about the daystone sir, the fire dragon will break the dungeon barrier if they don't use it. The director squeezes his eyes and replies the raid against the fire dragon is unlikely to succeed even with the top 100 players in this country. 
and since many of the top 100 players are also their guild members, the raid will be almost impossible if they decide not to be involved. Hearing this, the SHIELD guild member says but sir, if they do that as he is about to complete his sentence, the director laughs saying don't worry, they will make their dramatic appearance at the end of the battle. And shut down the fire dragon using the daystone. Hearing this, the SHIELD guild member becomes speechless. Then the director clenched the daystone, saying it will be different from their original plan, but they will ultimately still come out as the heroes who defended the country. Once that happens, even the Prime Minister will not be able to condemn them. Then he turns and raises his voice, ordering them to come on, let's go, and the SHIELD guild members move from their replaying. Yes sir. Then they stop there, and looking toward the Terum, ask the director about the Vice Guild Master. The director smirked, answering, and they left him there. Hearing this, the SHIELD guild member surprisingly asks what, but he is their vice guild master sir. The director angrily looks toward him, asking if he would rather go down there and rescue him from that monster himself. Kim stands down and looks up toward the cliff, there the director and the SHIELD guild members stand. As Kim is looking up, the director stands up, looks down toward Kim, and flicks the cigarette down. As there the director and the SHIELD guild member stand on the cliff, the magic spreads all around them, and they all excrete the dungeon. Sees this, Kim looks up toward the cliff and sighs. Meanwhile, Kang gets there, asking him if he isn't going to go after them. Kim turns his head, looks toward him, and sighs, answering forget about them. They have a much more urgent problem to take care of. Meanwhile, the fire dragon starts to roar and begin releasing the fireball from his mouth, and then it throws the firestorm toward the shield guild barrier. The barrier begins to crack, and the news reporter stands outside the barrier and gets scared. After this, Gu's subordinate sits there aside and uses her phone system, informing Gu that 89% of the barrier has been destroyed, madam. They have five minutes until the dungeon break commences. Hearing this, Gu stands aside, clenches her teeth, and one of her subordinate males stands behind her and says Gu, she aids five minutes, madam then he requests her to order the player to step in immediately. Meanwhile, the bright light spreads in the barrier shield, and that light slowly starts to fade away. Sees this, the news reporter stands outside the barrier and looks up toward the light, saying look, the barrier is going down. They all get scared as soon as the light fades away, and the fire dragon begins to see through that shield barrier. Sees that fire dragon in the shield barrier. The reporter and Gu's subordinate gulp, asking if that's the fire dragon. The news reporter was recording the whole situation, and the lady Gu's subordinate, while using her phone system, asked them to wait, and then said the barrier had yet to be completely broken. Then she tapped the screen of her mobile system, telling them that it was only a separate white layer that was taken down. Hearing this, Gu touches the shield barrier and thinks the removed layer is the shield guild's barrier. Furthermore, she grits, thinking then, which means that Kim has already been as she heads down with a sad face and touches the barrier thinking. Meanwhile, the news reporter stands there and raises their voice, saying there are some people inside the barrier. Hearing this, Gu heads up and quickly looks toward the barrier, saying it couldn't be. From that shield barrier, two men were seen standing there and these men were Kim and Kang. Sees this, the news reporter stands there and starts recording and getting the signal from the signal antenna while Gu's subordinate stands in the distance and surprisingly looks toward them. The news reporter, while recording, moves his camera toward Tarim's body lying there on the ground. Sees this, his companion tells him to hold on a second and check that person lying on the ground. Then he surprisingly asks, isn't that the shield guild's vice guild master Terum, and his companion replies HM, yes he thinks that's him, he has seen him on the TV before. Hearing this, Gu stands there, sighs and smiles, then she gulps and looks toward the shield and thinks he defeated Terum Kim is that powerful. Then she turned, asking her subordinate if there was a way for them to reach him from there. They needed to get Kim out of there immediately. Her subordinate replies they are trying to contact him, but the dungeon is interfering with a connection. Meanwhile, the fire dragon starts roaring, and hearing the sound of the dragon, they all get scared. The fire dragon roars and throws the firestorm toward the shield barrier. Sees this, Gu's subordinate, checking her phone system, informs them the dungeon has been broken down by 7%. They are extremely close to a dungeon break madam hearing this, Gu stands behind and gets scared, then she clenches her teeth thinking they need to delay it. Somehow, they can't let the fire dragon unleash in the city like this. 
Then she turned her head and looked toward the news reporter, and players thought it was not like this. They are not already there. There are only about 30 of the top players right now, but they need to gather at least 80 of them to do anything. As she stands there thinking this, all her subordinates stands behind her and say, Prime Minister, they have established a connection with Kim. Hearing this, she turns her head and quickly moves toward her and then grabs the wireless phone from her hand, saying give her that. Holding the phone, she loudly asks who is this, is there anyone, is this not Kim, Kang, wearing an earpiece, replies from inside the shield, no, this is HWI Kang. Gu shouted at him to put Kim on the line immediately, and he replied okay, madam also, Kim was standing beside him. Kim wore that earpiece, saying Kim was speaking. Hearing this, Gu asked Kim if he was all right as one of the earpieces was in Kang's ear and the other one was in Kim's ear. Kang stands beside Kim and answers Gu yes he guesses and then Kim answers her he is still okay. Hearing this, she says then, and then she stops there and presses her lips. Kim waits for her to speak, but she doesn't talk. Then Kim asks her what she needs him to do madam. Gu stands there pressing her lips, then after a minute, she answers they need more time. She needs him to stall some time for them. However, she was asking him to die for them. This was essentially no different from a death sentence. Hearing this, Kim's answer understood. Then the call ended, and the mobile fell from her hand and thuds on the ground. She stands there silently before the shield barrier. On the other side, the news reporter, while recording, stands outside the shield barrier and looks toward Kim and Kang standing there. He turns his camera toward them asking the viewers, ladies and gentlemen, if they are witnessing this. The man who was found inside the fire dragon nest is walking in even deeper right now. He seems to be heading towards the fire dragon, judging by the direction in which he has traveled. As he was recording this all, the news was on the news channel. Moreover, a man standing behind Gu, pointing toward Kim in the shield barrier shouts, asking who he is and what he thinks he is doing right now. Is he even aware of what's at stake there? Gu turns her head and angrily looks toward him, answering to shut his mouth, and he flinches. Then she answers him that man is the hope and future of this country, and she has just ordered him to walk toward his death for the rest of them to live. However, Kim stands there inside the shield barrier, injured and moving toward the fire dragon. While moving toward it, he activated his physical enhancement ability, and his status window appeared before him on which his strength, mana, agility, and everything was mentioned. Also, his HP was decreased as it was about to expire. However, Kim stepped ahead injured. Also, his energies were activated, and the bright, wavy light was emerging from his body. Also, the blood was dripping from his body. The system warned him, and the notification window appeared before him. He had less than 8% of his HP left. Rest is recommended to replenish his health. Hearing the voice from that window, Kim stood there and thought he also wanted to take a rest. Another window appears before Kim, showing that his HP is constantly decreasing due to the bleeding. Taking a rest is recommended. Kim silently stands there communicating with the system and hearing the voice of that window, he replies he can't do that. Also, Kang stands with him at a little distance. Hearing this, the system gets surprised and remains silent, then replies, asking him if he does not understand why. Furthermore, a window appeared on which it was written he could easily escape from this location instead of choosing to fight. Kim replies no, everything in this area will be destroyed if he runs away. His mother will be in danger if he lets that happen. The system sends another window to him, and this time, he asks Kim then how about escaping to another country with his mother. Hearing this, Kim looks up toward the window and thinks he is the worst and the system apologizes to him for this. As Kim stood there, he was communicating with the system, and Kang stood there to call his name. Kim turned his head and looked toward him. Then Kang asks him if he is going to fight this dragon as the dragon is so big that they stand before it looking like tiny dots. Kim, looking toward the fire dragon, replies yes, they need to defeat it, and Kang surprisingly asks. Then, with a surprised face he says, but it's so powerful, he asks how they defeated it ever. Meanwhile, the fire dragon throws the firestorm toward them with its breath, a huge heated explosion occurred there, and it destroyed half of the city. However, the shield barrier starts rumbling, and Gu's subordinate stands outside the shield barrier, checking her mobile system. She raises her voice, saying an intense heat explosion has been detected within the barrier. They presume it to be the fire dragon's breath then, looking toward the barrier, she says the barrier has yet to be destroyed. 
but the flames are too strong for them to see what's inside anymore. Hearing this, Gu looks toward the shield barrier grit and remains silent, thinking about Kim. However, inside the shield, the fire dragon keeps attacking them with its breathing fire and destroys the surrounding area. But before the fire hit them, Kang created the shield above them and saved them from that firestorm. Kang stands there creating the shield and says he barely managed to block it. Hearing this, Kim stands behind him and says he has said this before, but that's an interesting ability. It doesn't quite feel like it's Gi, but as he was about to complete his sentence, Kang turned his head, saying yes, it's something similar to Gi, but it's actually as Kang was about to finish his sentence. But before he completes his sentence, the fire dragon hits him with its tail. The shield breaks, and he falls through the shield. Kang thuds on the ground away, and Kim stands there in the broken shield, turns his head, and looks toward him. Kang thuds on the ground so hard that his nose starts to bleed and his head starts to spin. Therefore, Kim, looking toward him, says he didn't finish his explanation again. Then, looking toward the fire dragon, he says well, then he guess it's just he versus him now. Kim's eyes start to glow, and he looks up toward the fire dragon and says bring it on, the oversized lizard. The fire dragon roars and extends its claw to attack Kim. The fire dragon crashes the ground where Kim stands and crumbles it, but Kim jumps up from the crash ground, sees the fire dragon roar, and extends its hands to hit Kim. As soon as the fire dragon sees him before him in the air, Kim disappears, and the fire dragon turns around to find him. But as the fire dragon turned round, its tail crashed into many buildings. The dust smoke spread there and Kim appeared from that smoke. Kim stands there under the fire dragon's tail, holding it with his left hand. Also, the area where Kim stands is crushed by the weight. Kim's wounds split and blood spurts out of his body and the window of warning appears before him while the blood from his body is dripping. Then another window appears before him that he has less than 7% of his HP from the bleeding. The fire dragon roars and the fireball is created on its head. It quickly steps toward Kim and Kim stands there holding its tail, and the explosion occurs on its tail side. Sees that explosion, the fire dragon turns and looks toward its tail, while the round magic circle is created all around Kim. However, Kim punched the dragon's tail and threw it away while the magic round shield made all around Kim. As soon as Kim threw its tail, the dragon roared, and Kim ran and jumped up toward the dragon. While jumping up, he clenches his fist to punch the dragon. The fire dragon sees him before he roars. Kim, surrounded by his power, jumped from place to place very quickly, punched the dragon with all his might, and cracked it. The dragon roars while Kim stands there in the air with his bright, wavy light. Then Kim punches it again and crashes it on the ground. The fire dragon thuds and falls away on the ground, and a dust explosion occurs there while Kim stands there making a fist of his hand. The window appears before him that his HP is 4%, and his HP is taking additional recoil damage from his attacks. Hearing that voice, Kim sighed, clenched his teeth, jumped up with his lightning energy in the barrier shield, and then jumped down toward the dragon to punch him. As Kim was on his way in the air to arrive near the dragon, meanwhile, the injured dragon lying there got up angrily, looked toward Kim, and created a firestorm in its mouth. Then the dragon turned and threw the firestorm from its breath toward Kim as Kim moved toward it quickly to punch it. Sees the firestorm coming toward him, Kim gets surprised and clenches his teeth, thinking this is dangerous. That firestorm hit Kim and fell him down. Therefore, Kim's judgment was indeed correct. The breath of an eight-star fire dungeon was hot enough to melt steel. Even the elemental resistance trait was meaningless in front of these flames. Since he no longer had Kang's support, Kim had to avoid being hit by this fatal attack. Kim falls on the barrier shield and sits there. He notices the firestorm moving toward the people outside that barrier shield. However, the dragon's breath was flying straight toward his allies, seeing the firestorm coming toward them. The people standing outside the shield got scared. The barrier was already at its limit. It was nearly impossible for it to endure the impact. Sees that firestorm coming toward them, Gu raises her voice everyone runs. Meanwhile, Kang quickly jumps from one side to the other, then he jumps up above the firestorm and creates the shield with his purple magic aura. However, the firestorm hits with that shield that Kang creates up in the air and stands there holding it, and due to that shield, the firestorm is unable to cross the shield barrier. Sees this, Gu and her subordinates get surprised, then Gu grits, thinking, who is that supposed to be? 
The people standing there are amazed, and they are watching Kang holding his purple magic shield before the firestorm. The firestorm was so heated, and due to its heat, the purple shield started to crack. Then, an explosion of fire occurred there, and Kang fell and thudded in that destroyed building. Kang crashed there, and then he excitedly got up and lifted his hands, saying he did it. The dragon fire roared, and Kim looked toward him, slightly smiling. Kim stands up in the air, smiles and talks with Kang with the help of a wireless earpiece. He touches his earpiece button and cooperates with Kang in his work. Kang stands there in the destroyed building, touches his earpiece, looks up and smiles, answering it is nothing, Captain Kim. However, Kim stands in the air and moves toward the fire dragon, saying alright, then let's finish this. The dragon roars and Kim stands up on its wing. The dragon, with all its power, creates a huge fireball on the other side. Kim, with all his might, makes his bright, wavy light punch. Moreover, the bright light spread all around Kim. His eyes start to glow, and his punch is covered with his bright light. Kim's colorful light wave extended toward the dragon while the dragon was creating its fireball storm, and then from that bright light, Kim quickly moved toward the dragon to punch it. However, both energies collapsed, and Kim hit the dragon. Due to this punch, the dragon's body started to crack, and from wherever its body burst, Kim's bright light flashes emerged. The fire dragon was about to fall backward, and then its body started to crash, and the flashlight emerged from the dragon. However, Kim stands there, clenching his fist while the bright, wavy light emerges from his fist. Stands there, he gets the notification window that the boss has been successfully defeated. He is the first player to clear the 8-star field dungeon, the Fire Dragon's Nest. The bright, wavy light starts coming out of Kim's body, and the window appears before him. His strength has increased, and his agility and power have increased. Furthermore, his stats have reached their maximum values, converting his extra stats into currency points, and his remaining points are 3,694,831p. Also, he has obtained the unique ability of the first Dragon Slayer, and the Dragon Fear ability is now available. He deals 50% more damage against Draconic Monsters. The Fire Dragon thuds to the ground dead, and Kim stands there sighing. His stats window appears before him as all his statuses were the same, but his HP has decreased to the lowest point. However, the dead Fire Dragon was lying on the cracked ground with its mouth open, and Kim stood ahead of its body. Kim was standing there injured, clenched his fist, and there the window appeared before him, and the system warned him that his HP was below 3%, and he needed healing. Kim sighed, hearing that system's robotic warning voice, and replied all right, he gets it. He is tired enough without his nagging right now. Meanwhile, Kang excitedly jumps and gets behind him, waving his hand and calling Kim's name. Kim turns his head and looks toward him. Kang excitedly asked him if he had just seen his block the fire dragon's attack, wasn't it amazing? Kim was exhausted while the voice from either side was going into his ears. On one side, the system continuously warned him and suggested that he rest. On the other side, Kang continuously asked him if it wasn't amazing. However, Kim stands there and notices something behind him. He turns his head and looks back toward the fire dragon's body. The fire dragon's body, the dragon's heart in particular, was an enormous mass of energy. However, Kim killed the dragon before it could deplete most of its power. As a result of the excess energy left in its corpse, both Kim and Kang turned their head and looked toward the dead dragon's body. However, the fire dragon's body bursts out like a supernova, and the shield barrier rumbles while Gu and the people standing outside the barrier get scared. Gu's subordinate stands behind her search on her mobile system, saying they are detecting more energy from the fire dragon. This is the largest amount they have seen so far. Hearing this, Gu grits, asking herself what kind of battle is going on in there. Meanwhile, her subordinate stands behind her and calls her name, informing her they have gathered all of the top players in the country except for those affiliated with the Shield Guild. Further, they have their troops standing by for fire support, Gu remains silent and presses her lips, and then she takes out her magic sword with her magical power. As the sword appeared in her hand, she stood there and raised her voice, saying she was breaking through the barrier and preparing all units to enter the battlefield. Then she extended her hand toward the shield barrier to join there, but as soon as she raised her hand, she was surprised to see the ashes start coming out of the shield barrier. 
As the ashes came from the barrier and fell in the air, people outside the barrier stared at the ashes and extended their hands to catch them. From that crowd of people, a top player girl looking toward the ashes says ladies and gentlemen, it appears to be snowing outside. Gu stares at the ash before her. She remains silent and her mouth wide open and the ash collides with her hand and ends. Gu understands that this isn't the snow. She quickly runs toward the shield barrier and enters. Sees this, her subordinates get surprised, their mouth wide open, and they call their prime minister. Moreover, it was ash and ashes were falling from the sky. Gu quickly ran into that destructed place, thinking, Kim, please be alive. While running, she screams because she hears the sound of panting there from the crashed ground. She slightly heads down to check with bated breathing. Meanwhile, the rocks aside her start to crumble. She sees the rocks crumbling, and she calls Kim's name. Meanwhile, Kang Crush crumbled the rocks and came out to see this. She shut her mouth wide open and called Kim's name, while Kang poked his head out of there, says no, it's he HWI Kang. After this, Kang sits up and gets out of that destructed place, and Gu stands there silently, looking toward him. Then she asks him where Kim is. Kang replies he is not sure. Then he puts his hand on his forehead and looks around to find Kim, and finally he finds him. Then he waved his hand and called Gu's name while she was looking aside and lost in her thoughts. She looked toward him, and he pointed ahead toward the destroyed building, telling her Kim was there. Kim, standing against the wall of the broken structure, sees him there. She remained silent for a second, and then she quickly stepped toward Kim. Looking toward Kim, she slightly smiles, saying good work, captain, and in response, he sighs and slightly smiles. However, Kim's status window appeared there, and his HP was about to end. Meanwhile, the military helicopter got to that area. In the Bang B Soul Shield Guild headquarters, a Shield Guild member quickly steps toward the director's office. He slams the door and enters, calling the director. As the director stands before the mirror wall, looking outside and looking toward the director, the member of the Shield Guild informs they have just received some reports from the Fire Dragon's nest. As he was about to complete his sentence, the director stood there adding his point, saying he had heard it already. Then he asks the director what they should do now and the director remains silent and keeps smoking. Then he flicks his cigarette on the floor. Then move and step ahead, looking toward the director. The SHIELD Guild member is surprised and remains silent. However, the director goes toward the door and sees this. The SHIELD Guild member stands behind in worry and calls the director, but the director doesn't listen to him and keeps stepping toward the door, putting his hands in his pants pocket. Therefore, the news was reported on all the TV channels. The South Korean government has officially announced that the eight-star dragon in Incheon, the fire dragon's nest, has been cleared. Furthermore, it was reported that the Ministry of National Defense launched a private operation to clear the dungeon, and they are going to hold an exclusive interview with the Prime Minister. Additionally, they have just received some breaking news that the police have arrested the Vice Guild Master of the Shield Guild, Terum, along with his followers. The report says that Prime Minister Gu personally directed the operation to apprehend all of the perpetrators, and the SHIELD Guild is being held responsible for the recent crisis with the Fire Dragon and all of their members involved. The incident is expected to face serious charges, including treason for their crimes. However, the Shied Guild's director, James Lee, has been reported to still be on the run. He is presumed to be one of the main perpetrators of the incident and is currently wanted by the police. After telling this all, the news reporter moved ahead to the next announcement by the government on the other side. In the headquarters of Audit, the journalist and interviewer were working there to take Gu interview to collect the news. Also, media people were there. Gu got there at the conference table, and the reporter asked her questions about that recent incident. Gu stands there with the dice before Mike, and the reporter asks her questions, and the media is recording all this. She starts her speech with a smile, and then she gives a little introduction about herself. She is the Prime Minister of Seongryong-gu, and she is so grateful to see all of them again. The news reporter stands there and tells her about their news channel. One of them says Prime Minister, they are from NAV News. The other one says this is Er Daily. After this, one of them asked her if she could give them a detailed explanation of the recent crisis in Incheon. She answered she was sure they all listened to the announcement on the news, but the question on everyone's mind right now is not how, but who diverted the recent crisis. 
Then she extended her and pointed aside a smile saying so, allowing her to introduce the captain of the special dungeon control team, Jibong Kim. Kim stands there wearing his uniform. A bright light falls on his. He stands there, sighs and steps ahead toward the dice. As soon as he steps forward, the media stands there and starts capturing his picture. He stands there and flinches backward, then he smiles and moves to the dice before the mic. He stands there, greets them all, and then starts his speech, saying he is the captain of the dungeon control team, Jibong Kim. The next day, Kim and Kang go to meet Lieutenant Yoon at her military base office. Both of them enter Kim in a descent way, piping ahead while Kang wakes and hums steps there. As they both were stepping forward, Yoon got there, holding the file, and called Kim from behind. Kim stands there, turns his head, and looks aside toward her while Kang stands beside Kim, turns his head behind Kim, and looks toward her. Yoon looked toward Kim's smile, saying Greta's work. She saw what he did out there. Hearing this, Kang quickly turned ahead toward her excitedly, asking what about him. Did she see him too? Sees this, Kim scratches his head, answering thanks. Yoon and Yoon, seeing Kang's childlike behavior, smile and put his hand in her mouth, answering him. Of course, he was amazing too, Mr. Kang. Hearing this, Kang excitedly clenched his fist, and sometimes he turned his head and looked toward Kim, asking if he had heard Kim and some time at Yoon, saying he was amazing too. Kim grabbed his ear, twisted it hard, and got near him, saying in his ear quiet down. Kang sweated and shouted in pain, answering okay boss. See this, Yoon laughs and Kang's head is down with a sad face and his ears turn red. After this, Yoon looks towards Kim and asks if this must be his first time there. Right, he replies yes while Kang stands behind him and listens to them. Then Kim answers her, saying this is his first visit today. Then Kim looks toward the strange equipment and people gather in the back of the room. He asks Yoon who those people are in the back of the room are. Yoon hears this, gets surprised and remains silent, then replies that he is the national hero who saved their country Kim. Hearing this, Kim silently looked toward the people there as they were media and press reporters and they were setting their accessories. Kang looks toward Kim and those people clench their fists. However, Yoon smiles, saying to Kim that everyone's attention is focused on him right now and Kang stands beside Kim, clenching his fist excitedly, looking toward her to show her that he is too. Also, when Kang excitedly looks toward her, the light flash gathers there, and his eyes start to glow Yoon. Smiles, looking toward Kang, says of course, he is a national hero as well, Mr. Kang. She has heard that he already has his fan club, Kang, blushes his eyes, and he excitedly asks. However, Kim, seeing Kang's actions, put his hand on his mouth, asking her why he was called a hero today. Yoon stood there looking toward them, smiling, answering no, they wanted him to come for his physical examination today. Further, she says when he first enlisted, they needed to have the proper equipment to examine his body, so his data still needed to be uploaded to their headquarters. Just as she said, Kim was unable to go through an official examination because the army lacked the necessary equipment to assess his strength at the time of his enlistment. Due to this fact, Kim didn't receive a rating in the government database and was able to remain largely unnoticed by the public. But had Kim been ranked in the database, the members of the SHIELD Guild would not have made such horrible management decisions. Kim stands there, stares at his hand and laughs, then he scratches his head asking so, should we get started right away Yoon smiles, answering that Mick should be there any minute now. Hearing this, Kim scratched his head and thought about MC. Meanwhile, one of the top players from that hundred players, Yui, the streamer, got there from the door streaming. She held her mobile phone with a selfie stick and was recording. As soon as she entered there, she waved her hand, looking toward her phone and saying all right chat. They have finally made it to their destination. As she placed her cat on her shoulder, both of them and her cat looked toward the mobile screen and smiled. Seeing her there, three of them turned their head and looked toward her. Yoon stands there looking toward Yui, smiles, saying there she is now, and sees her there. Both boys are surprised. However, Yui extends her hand toward Kim to greet him. As soon as she greets them, her cat makes an excited noise. She spreads her hand toward Kim, saying she is Yui, the live streamer. Nice to meet him. Kim shook hands, and wearing nice to meet her too, he was Jibong. Kim. Hearing this, she grabbed his hand. Yui grabbed Kim's hand and started shaking it saying this was so great she wanted to meet him. With her other hand, she held the selfie stick and showed this all in her live chat. 
After this, she stared at Kim's hand, asking if this was the hand that saved their country. It's a lot prettier than what she expected. Kim stands there and gets a little tired of it. Then he asks her if she should go on with the examination, and she excitedly jumps and claps, answering all right, sounds good. While Kim stands there, holding his wrist and looking toward her sweat then, Yui turns her camera toward Kim and says all right, they are finally going to have their national hero. Then she pointed her hand toward Kim, saying Kim took a physical exam with them. Then she turned and with a smiling face looking toward Kang, said of course Mr. Chi Kang is there as well. Hearing this, Kang gets excited, and that flashy light starts emerging from his eyes, and his eyes start to glow. And thus, the examination began, and four of them move toward the examination room. However, they enter the examination room, and Yui, looking toward the equipment there, surprisingly says this is so different from when she had her exam. Then Yoon, pointing toward the equipment, speaks well. It took a lot of work to conduct a proper examination of Kim with their previous equipment. So, they manufactured new ones for today's test, and then she pointed ahead toward the equipment and held the handle, which the examiner had to squeeze to measure his physical strength. She lifts the handle of the machine upward and starts the machine saying first, they will measure his muscular strength. Their previous equipment could only measure up to an A class level, then holding that handle she says, but this new machine can measure up to an S class level. Sees that equipment, Yui taps on the ground and looks toward Yoon, saying allow her to go first. Yoon tells her to use that machine. Yui kept her mobile camera there, and everything started recording. Then Yoon gave her the handle, telling her to hold it with her right hand and squeeze it down as hard as she could. Yui follows the steps that Yoon tells her to do. She squeezes that handle, thinking squeeze is as hard as she can. She clenches the handle with all her might. However, she embraces the handle, her eyes begin to bulge, and her pulse swells. While squeezing, she thinks her subscribers, Yumi Hours, are watching her. As her turn was complete, Yoon came to her, telling her they got her result and she could come back down now. Yui, holding her camera stick, descended the stairs and held her head, thinking she hoped she got good results. Kang stands there, thinking that it looks like so much fun, and then Yoon shows Yui her result on the tablet and tells Yui she received the same score as last time, on a class grade. Yui excitedly shows her muscles before the camera asks the viewers if they saw that Yumi Hours hadn't been clacking on her workout. Her subscribers start messaging in the video chat and praising her strength. After this, Kim climbs the stairs for his turn, and both Yui and Kang look toward each other lovingly and blush. Kim stands near the equipment and holds that handle, and Yoon stands aside and says to him they need him to squeeze down as hard as he can. Kim, holding that handle, asks her if this be alright, and she smiles, answering don't worry. This was built from a specially designed, indestructible material. Prime Minister Gu had already tested it out as she was about to complete her sentence. Kim squeezes that handle and crashes at Yoon, is surprised. However, the machine explodes when Kim exerts his strength, the three of them are surprised, and their eyes and mouths wide open. However, Yoon turned her head and fumbled, asking what had just happened. Kim scratched his head and apologized to her. Yui's camera was pointed toward them, and all this was being recorded in her camera. Sees this Yui subscriber, Yumi Hours in the chat room and starts texting as they all were also surprised to see Kim's strength. Yui stands there holding the selfie stick and gets speechless, and Kang stands behind her with teary eyes, thinking that he wants to try it, but this is only the beginning. The giant punching machine designed to withstand any physical attack crumbled into pieces once Kim laid down his fist. The magic measuring crystal ball shattered as soon as Kim's mana flowed into it. The three of them get shocked and their mouth wide open. While Kang stands behind them with teary eyes, he gets speechless and presses his lips, thinking he should have gone first. After this, Kim looks toward Yui and Yoon apologizes. Yoon, holding the machine accessories in her hand, replies no, it must be a problem with the machine. But they were working perfectly before, and Yui stood there holding her selfie stick, laughed, and waved her hand, saying yes, it's probably just the faulty equipment. Yoon was speechless and shocked and stood her head down, while Yui stood behind her, smiled and waved her hand, saying well, now that they have got some testing done. Then she asks why don't they switch things up a little and start with their interview. After this, the interview starts, and the four of them sit on the chairs while the media and press stand before them and start recording and capturing the picture. 
Yoon Kim and Kang sit there on the chair in line while Yui sits beside them to create the streaming. She puts the mobile camera in front of her, saying first, let's start with some introduction. Then she shows her mobile screen to them, and she opens the tab of her subscribers, as her subscribers are more than 2 million. Showing that tab to them, she says they have over 100,000 viewers watching them right now. Hearing this, Kang sits there and looks around, surprisingly, asking 100,000 viewers where they are waiting outside. However, Kang got up run away to find the people. Then he jumped over to where the media and press people were sitting. Then he fell over the bench where some of them were seated. Kang falls upward and knocks the bench down, asking if they are over there. Sees this, the media people standing there with the camera are surprised, and one of them falls from the bench. However, Kim goes and lifts Kang, saying his apologies while Kang puts his index finger on his mouth fearfully. After this, Kim plopped Kang on the chair and saw that Yui put a hand on her mouth. Then he looked toward Kim, and Kang asked if it was that little joke and if he was serious. Kim points his hand at the left side of his face where Kang sits and replies he is serious. Hearing this, Yui surprisingly asks, really, then says that's hilarious. Kang sits there looking toward Kim, sticking out his tongue, asking a joke he loves jokes. Kim stands beside him and scolds him, telling him to keep his mouth shut. Then Kim sits on his chair, and Yui points toward Kim and says well then, go ahead and introduce himself. Kim remains silent, and after a minute, looks toward the camera and gives a little introduction of himself, telling his name. After telling them his name, he says he is the captain of the special dungeon control team. He is about to tell them about his age, but he stops there. Kim paused for a moment to consider what he should say about his age, and the window appeared before him that he was 30 years old in this world's time. Then Kim says he is 30 years old and hears this Yui clap, saying he looks very young for his age. While in the chat room, people start texting about Kim's age as they don't believe that he is 30 years old. Kang sits beside him, looking toward him, and asks no, he is not. Isn't he a lot older than that? Hearing this, Kim clenches his teeth and angrily looks toward Kang, and then he punches him on his head. After this Yui, looking toward Kim, says she now wants to ask him the question that everyone has been waiting for. How did he become so strong, Mr. Kim, and what inspired him to use his power to serve this country? Further, she asked if they offered him a very high salary. Yoon sits beside Kim and looks toward him to know the answer, while Kang stands beside him, holding his head, and a lump forms on his head. Hearing these questions, Kim remained silent, and Yui looked toward him, slightly smiling because she was waiting for the answer. However, Yoon's head is down, and she presses her lips because she knows the answer, and Kim isn't using his power to serve the country. He is fighting for revenge against his mother. After some time, Kim opened his lips to speak. Then he said he had a family, and with that, he began to explain his bitter past. As his words slowly echoed through the microphone, hearing about Kim's past life, everyone there was speechless. While the people in the chat room start texting there, some of them get sad and remind their family whom they missed during the dungeon break. However, Kim tells them his past life story. Hearing his life story, Yui bursts into tears. Yui sits there on the chair crying, with her hands on her mouth. Sees this, the two media men stand behind her surprised. One of them captures her picture, asking what Yui is crying right now. The other one, his companion, putting headphones on his ear, surprisingly asks why she is crying. Could it be that she also lost her family? Seeing her crying, Yui's cat also starts crying, sitting on her shoulder. Yoon looks toward Yui, squeezes her eyes, and presses her lips, thinking she sees Miss Yui is the same as Mr. Kim. She must have also lost her family to the monsters. Meanwhile, a certain household was watching the broadcast there. Yui's brother and father were watching her on the news while having their meal. Yui's father, picking up the food from the plate with a chopstick, says that the lying scoundrel and her mother sit before the chair to her father's chair and say she is doing it again. Then she beat her chest, saying they are both sitting right there at this table, and she is just acting like they are dead on TV, she can't stand it. Sees this, her father, with the food in his mouth, sweats and sets his glasses and adds his point, saying just let her be their daughter. He is famous now, she needs to put on a little show for the audience. Deoxun is just trying to do what's best for her. Let's try to be understanding of her. However, Yui's real name was Deoxun. Yui sits there in the military basement for the interview, wipes her tears with her hand, and continues the interview. 
The same day before the interview, Yui was sitting in her room holding a burger. Also, a lot of packed burgers were lying before her on the bed. However, the interview ended, and she ended her broadcast by saying to the viewers all right, they finished recording now. Good work, everyone. After the interview, four of them stood there, and it was getting dark. Yui wiped her tears, looking toward Kim and thanking him for coming there for the interview. Kim scratched his head, also thanked both ladies for the interview, and Kang stood behind Kim in anger. He pressed his lips and, with teary eyes, thinking he didn't even get to say anything. After this, Kim cracked his hand, asking the ladies if was it for today. Yoon looked toward Kim, thinking she was not the one who had planned them, but it was still a little hard for her to tell him about their remaining schedule. Then, Yoon replies that they have other tasks designed for him in the future, and she points her hand toward Yui. She says, but it would be better for him to hear it from her. Hearing this, Kim answered he would rather not do this again if that was everything she had, and his time would be better spent destroying a dungeon instead of this. However, at first, Yoon is surprised, but then she laughs, telling him that might be true, but their next schedule should be helpful to him, Mr. Kim. Kim surprisingly asked useful to him, and she nodded and stared at him, answering what she promised him. Hearing about the promise from her, Kim recalls the time when he first time met her on a rainy night, and she raised her voice, telling him she would help him get his revenge. Dungeon monsters, she will help him get rid of all of them, but he has to come with her, and she will help him to bring an end to this tragedy. However, Jai Yoon Lee only thought of the promise that he made back to Kim as an empty pledge made to recruit him into the army. Both Kim and Yoon stand before each other. She looks toward him and says she has been trying her best to keep her word. Then she smiles, saying they have all been trying their best. Kim keeps looking toward her, then says Lieutenant Lee explains their next schedule to him. After this, Yoon, Kim, and Kang go to the military lab in the basement. The lab's automatic iron door opens. Three of them enter. The siren, alarm, and red and yellow lights were set on the wall, and the lab technicians were working there before the system. Kang entered there, putting a hand on his forehead, looking all around as he was impressed by that place, but there was no expression on Kim's face. However, military doctors and researchers were working in the lab before the system, and in the huge glass container, they preserved the monster. Kang, standing before Kim, was saying to him something, this is so cool. Meanwhile, Yoon turned her head, telling them to follow her, and then the three of them went to the glass container in which they put a daystone. That day, the stone released a purple, bright, wavy light, and that light spread there in the container. After this, Yoon turns her head and, looking toward them says modern-day physics cannot explain several aspects of the dungeons, but their understanding of them has gradually improved. Kim, looking toward the glass container, replies he sees it while Kang stands behind him, scratching his head, thinking. What are they talking about? After this, Yoon says if they want to understand their behavior properly, they must first learn about their energy. Hearing this, Kim asks for their energy while Kang stands beside him, turns his head, and stares at Kim. Yoon replies yes, they have investigated where the dungeon draws their energy from and the manner of its preservation. They would likely be able to control the dungeon if they learned how to handle their power, and eventually, they were able to come up with a minor solution. Hearing this, Kim asks what she means they can control the dungeon. Now, she shakes her hand and squeezes her eyes, answering no. Unfortunately, they have not reached that point yet. Then she points toward the glass container and says look over there Mr. Kim. Kim turns his head and looks toward the glass container. He thinks that the window appears before him, which is a fragment of a daystone. Hearing this, Kim says daystone. As soon as Yoon hears this word from Kim's mouth, she becomes amazed, and then she surprisingly asks him if he knows about the Daystone. Kim replies yes, he has heard about them. Then she smiles and points with her hand, and says Miss Yui will give him a better explanation. But the dungeon that he and Miss Yui will investigate has a high chance of containing another Daystone. Hearing this, Kim asks is something she can already tell. Kim was quite surprised by this information since he had only ever obtained a single day stone, even after destroying so many dungeons and monsters. After this, Yoon points toward another glass container in which they preserved the fire dragon's body and replies yes, thanks to the remains of the fire dragon he recently defeated. They are now able to make some predictions, and to a certain degree, they believe that the day stone will be their key to controlling the dungeons. Hearing this, Kim asks why she wants him to go with Miss Yui. 
wouldn't it be easier for him to go and bring it back alone? While Kang stood behind him, with his finger in his ear, Yoon looked down slightly, smiling, replaying well. He saw this dungeon would only activate when three players of an a class and higher entered it at the same time. Unfortunately, there are not many players available for them to summon since it's not a state of emergency, and they would have to risk leaking confidential information if they wanted to involve the major guilds in this hearing. Kim closed his eyes and nodded. After this, Kim says that means that Miss Yui is trustworthy enough to join him, and Yoon nods yes, answering that's right. Further, she says that the third chosen player is a close associate of the Prime Minister. They are all people they can count on. This is why the Prime Minister allowed Miss Yui to stream her broadcast. Meanwhile, Yoon's phone rang, and she put her hand inside her lab coat and took out her phone. However, the call was from Yui. She tells them Yui is calling, and Kim replies all right, while Kang stands behind him yawning. Furthermore, Yoon shows her mobile phone to Kim, on which there is a call from Yui, then asks him if they should head outside so they can all talk about this together. However, three of them come out of the lab. While on the way, Kang insists he takes him with him. Kim doesn't answer and keeps stepping ahead, putting his hand in his pocket. Kang thumps on the ground while pressing him. Kim replies to him no, and Kang bursts into tears and shouts at him, asking why not. Then Kim, pointing ahead, replies look at this. Kang with teary eyes looks ahead, and on the dungeon shield, it is mentioned that the maximum number of entrants is 0 over 3. Sees Kang with teary eyes, clenching his fist, and Kim points there, saying only three people can be inside the dungeon at the same time. Kang screams and with blue eyes, punches Kim and pats him, asking why it can't be the two of them, then asks for another person in there. Kim pulled him back from him. Meanwhile, a jeep flying in the air crashed near them on the ground. Sees the jeep there both turn their head to look at the dust smoke spread there when they break the jeep. However, the jeep door opens and Yui comes out, recording. After coming out of the jeep, she slams the jeep door with her foot and looks toward the recording camera, greets the viewers, saying chat, as she mentioned in her last stream. She is having a heart-pounding date with their hero, Kim today, hearing this, the people in the chat room start texting. Sees her there Kim points toward her, telling Kang that he needs to go in it with her, and Kang, with teary eyes, sob, saying that it's still just the two of them. Meanwhile, the jeep door opens and a guy steps out of the jeep. Kim stands there, pointing toward him and answering Kang. Now there are three. After this, both Yui and that guy step toward Kim, and Kim sees them there, closes his eyes and punches his lips. Yui looking toward Kim, stands there and waves her hand, while Kang head down, stands there silently. However, they greet each other. The guy extends his hand toward Kim to shake his hand, saying he is glad to finally meet him, while Kang sits there angrily on his feet with his back to them. Moreover, the guy extending his hand toward Kim says, he is the guild master of the H. Warren Guild, Yubin Chen. Yubin Chen is the guild master of the H. Warren Guild, as well as the first generation player who awakened during the first dungeon break 10 years ago. He was one of the heroes who saved the Republic of Korea alongside Prime Minister Seong Grong Gu. Therefore, Chen stands before Kim, extending his hand toward him, and Kim, looking toward him, thinks. Hence, this is the person Lieutenant Lee was talking about, the associate of Prime Minister Gu. Kim shakes their hands with him, and he grabs Kim's hand. Kim, while shaking his hand, gives a little introduction of himself to him. He tells his name, and he is the captain of the special dungeon control team. Hearing this, Chin, shaking his hand, answered he looked forward to working with him. However Yui, while recording her stream, says to the viewers that for today's stream, she will be entering and clearing a dungeon with Mr. Kim and Mr. Chin. She was alive, and more than 200,000 people joined her. She stood there, her back to them, showing the viewers the dungeon shield and both Kim and Chin. While asking, they have all been waiting for this too, and then she says everyone has been dying to see the dragon-slaying hero Jibong Kim in action. It's been 24 minutes since she went live, and the numbering of people was also increasing rapidly. She turned her mobile camera toward Kim. Seeing Kim, people in the chat room start texting because they are excited to see Kim live. As she stands before Kim, pointing her camera toward his face then, she stares at him, saying the dungeon they will be clearing today is the six-star dungeon in the moth chamber. As she was staring at him, he looked ahead and ignored her further. She said to viewers that this dungeon is notorious for being difficult, even among the six-star dungeons. 
and this is her first time entering a six-star dungeon with only two other people. Then she points her selfie stick upward and looks toward the mobile camera excitedly, saying but since she is with these two heroes, she won't have to worry about a thing. They are both known to be super overpowered after all, while the people in the chat room kept texting, and many of them wanted to know if she would keep streaming inside the dungeon. Then she answers the people with a sad face that, as they may all know, she won't be able to keep the stream going once she enters the dungeon. Further, looking toward the mobile camera, she waved her hand and winked, saying that she would have to end the stream there for now, and come back once they clear the dungeon. See them all soon. However, the people in the chat room don't want her to end the stream. Then, the option before her appears on the screen that she would like to end the broadcast there, and she clicks the end button. The stream ends there, and she sighs. Then, holding the selfie stick in her hand, she jumps excitedly and thanks Kim for coming there. Further, she excitedly asked if he had heard about everything from MS Lee, and in response, Kim answered yes. Then he looks aside, recalling Yoon's words when she tells him he has to be the one to retrieve the day's stone as Miss Yui and Mr. Doenchen are both reliable. But he has to be the one to bring it back, Mr. Kim. Recalling these words, Kim stands there, pressing his lips, thinking as the lieutenant says he needs to retrieve the day stones himself. Then he replies all right they both look toward Kim. Yui smiles, looking at him while Chen angrily stares at him. Then, pointing ahead, Kim asks them if they should go inside. Yui lifts her hand, answering okay while Kang sits behind them. He turns his head and looks toward Kim, pouting with teary eyes and a flowing nose. After this, Kim turns and calls Kang, and Kang sits there on their foothead and looks toward him. Then, Kim tells him to go and rejoin their team. If anything happens while he is gone, handle it with the vice captain. Hearing this, Kang sulks and replies okay. However, three of them move toward the dungeon shield, while Kang heads down, turns and moves ahead alone. After this, three of them stand behind the shield. There it was written that the maximum number of entrants was 0 over 3. As soon as the shield scans them, the number gets changed from 3 to 3. However, the bright purple light spreads all around three of them, and then a flash of light occurs there, and three of them disappear from the ground. However, from the ground where the flash of light occurs and disappears, it gets cracked, and the dust, smoke, and purple wavy light emerge there. After this, the flash of light spreads and appears in the dungeon, and three of them appear from that light there. Three of them entered the dungeon, and the window appeared before Kim that he had entered the six-star dungeon, the Moth Chamber. Kim stands there, turns his head, and looks toward them, asking now then, should they get this thing started? Meanwhile, Yui attaches the camera to her shoulder, saying she can't use a selfie stick anymore since they have to be prepared for anything. Hearing this, both Kim and Chin surprisingly look toward her. Further, she attached a camera on her shoulder and winked, saying, but this camera should still be fine since she was not streaming anymore there. Hearing this, Chin responds that she has a very strong sense of professionalism with Kim. Remain silent, and she replies, Chin alright, she thinks they should get going now. After this, the three of them move ahead. As they walk there from morning to evening, Yui's feet get hurt, and she lifts one foot sometimes to press and sometimes the other. While walking there, Chin says to them that's strange, and Yui turns her head and looks toward him, smiling, asking what he means. Chin replies they have been inside the dungeon for a while now, but not a single monster has come out yet. Yui pouts, asking him if that isn't a good thing for them. She only needs to film them defeating the boss anymore. However, Chen touched the handle of his sword that he kept in the sword belt attached to his pent and answered her that wasn't his point. As soon as he touches his sword, both Kim and Yui look toward his hand further. Chen says the moth chamber is notorious for having a swarm of monsters waiting for them right away. But even though they are almost midway through the dungeon, they have yet to see a single monster. Hearing this, Yui laughed and pointed her hand to him, answer come on, that shouldn't be a big deal. Then she told Kim, saying after all, they have the hero, who defeated an eight-star dungeon with them. There is nothing for them to worry about. Hearing this, Chin replies he guessed that's true, and then they move ahead as it is getting dark. On the way Yui, hopping on one leg, says alright, well they have a lot more left to go, so let's get moving again. However, it was nighttime and dark everywhere. Yui turned on the light of her camera, and Chin turned on the torchlight. While Kim stands there, they enter this place in the morning, and it doesn't feel like that much time has passed. 
Yui stands there looking toward Kim and says the day is much stronger inside the moth chamber, and the night there is very dark, so it will be difficult for them to move around. Further, Chin stands there and adds his point, saying it usually takes three days to reach the end of a moth chamber on foot, so they should set up camp there for the night. Hearing this Yui, while creating the fire with her hand, says if that's the case, it's time for a campfire, saying she throws the fire toward the ground. The fire there starts crackling, and three of them sit near the campfire. Yui Cat sits there and starts yawning. While Yui sits there, folded arms on their knees says because the day is so much stronger inside the giant space, the moth chamber is one of the most time-consuming dungeons there is. However, Kim sat there looking up toward the sky silently. As Yui had explained, Kim could see the sky fade to black, and there were no stars and the moon that shined in this night sky as it was shrouded in perfect darkness. Meanwhile, at the Korean Army HQ, Vice Captain Jung Ham taps the recorded paper on the table before him. Then he started working on the computer system, and as he was typing there, he got tired of the work. Then he sits there and holds his head, saying ever since the captain joined their team, they have been too busy clearing the dungeon to get any paperwork done. However, he starts doing his work on the computer system, saying himself, but he guesses there are no dungeons broken due to the capital region, so that's a relief. Meanwhile, the alarm rang outside the administrative office. Seeing this vice captain while doing his work, he headed up and looked toward the door. Then one of their team member with orange hair rashly enters, telling the vice captain. The vice captain, seeing him there in that rushing situation, gets up from his chair. The guy informed the vice captain there had been an unexpected break in the Jonggi province. Hearing this, the vice captain gets shocked and starts sweating, asking himself if it had to be today. Then the guy stands in the door fearfully and asks the vice captain what they should do sir, they need the captain with them. The vice captain becomes sweaty and out of breath due to fear, and then he looks down with wide open eyes, thinking they are missing Captain Kim. When they are supposed to be Team Kim with their captain, they are nothing. However, both the vice captain and the orange-haired guy stood before each other as both were scared. The guy stands before the vice captain, looking down, and presses his lower lips under his teeth, saying he will go ahead and gather everyone since they must protect the citizens. Hearing this, the vice captain clenched his fist and squeezed his eyes. Meanwhile, the alarm rang, and the vice captain's eyes were wide open. Then, looking toward the orange haired guy, says assemble every one of their units. Further, he says he could be wrong, but they might still have a small hope left, and they still have more solid Yong Di Kim, HWI Kang, Gong Jin Lee, and Jin Su Park on their team. On the other side, Kang, lying on the bed in the dark, was sniffing. He was lying down with his head on the pillow and crying, asking himself how he could do this to him. Also, his nose was flowing. However, in the moth chamber, Kim Chin and Yui were having their meal sitting beside the fire camp on the other side, in a military base. The vice captain was staring at the board on which four of their brave soldiers' names were mentioned, and then he, with two subordinates, moved toward Kang's room. Standing outside the room, the vice captain thinks he actually ended up coming there, then pulls back the door slide and opens the room door. As the door creaks and they see Kang lying there alone in the room in the dark, Kang turns his head to look with teary eyes. Then, looking toward them, he stands at the door and asks what. Then he sits up, and the vice captain, holding the slide of the door, recalls the time when he first time met with Kang and put the dagger in Kang's neck. Further, he remembers how Kang punched him and defeated him before Kim and their team members. Recalling that time, the vice captain heads down, holding the door slide, and starts sweating, thinking, how does he address him rookie, but this kid is far too strong. To be called a rookie, assuming this all, the vice captain remembers the time when Kang created his magic, attacked Kim with his magic ball, and flew him in the air. Kang sat there on the bed with teary eyes looking toward them, standing at the door, and asking them what they wanted. However, the orange-haired guy stands behind the vice captain, excitedly calling Kang their rookie. Sees this vice captain standing ahead of him, turning his head, and angrily looking toward him. Vice Captain opened his eyes and clenched his teeth, thinking this stupid man had just called this kid a rookie without a second thought, what if he gets angry? However, Kang sits there angrily and asks them he said what they want. Sees this Vice Captain surprised. Then the orange-haired guy laughed and sweated, asking if they got to go out for work. 
he heard the siren right while the vice captain stood beside him, squeezed his eyes, and sighed, thinking, thank God he didn't get mad. Hearing this, Kang lies down on the bed again and takes the crotch back to them, saying he doesn't want to go without Kim, and he is in a bad mood right now. Sees this, the vice captain gets surprised and thinks neutralizing a dungeon break is a race against time if they don't bring this kid with them right now. Also, the collateral damage will be immeasurable. Thinking this, he coughed and called Kang Rookie. Then he stepped ahead into the room, saying Captain Kim might end up praising him if he clears this dungeon break. He hears Kang with teary eyes scratching the pillow. After this, the vice captain whispers his plan into the orange-haired guy's ear. Hear this, and that guy surprisingly puts his hand on his mouth, saying he is not an idiot sir. There is no way he will trick him with that. The vice captain scolds him, saying he is not a baby. Clearing a dungeon is their job. Then he asks him to zip it if he has any better ideas. While Kang is lying there with teary eyes, he thinks if he clears the dungeon break, Kim will impress him, and when Kim returns, he will excitedly inform him that he will take care of everything in his absence. Kim would open his arm to hug him and praise him for his work, and he would hug him and lovingly pat his head. Thinking this all in his mind, he quickly gets up, saying they are right, sees this vice captain, and his subordinate gets surprised. After this, Kang excitedly cheers up, saying Kim is going to compliment him. Then he quickly jumps and passes between them, saying lead the way guys. Sees this, they get surprised, and the vice captain surprisingly asks, didn't just tell them to lead the way. The orange-haired guy presses his lip, answering he is already way ahead of them. Meanwhile, Kang excitedly goes through the corridor, humming and jumping with joy. On the other side, in the moth chamber, three of them were still walking. Kim, moving ahead, closes his eyes and asks the system to locate the nearest monster. The window appears before him, searching for a beast within two miles of his location. Then the system started the search and counted down the time, and then another window appeared. They informed Kim the search was complete, and there were no monsters within his area. Here's this, Kim thinks that strange as Yui and Chin are ahead of him. Yui surprisingly puts one hand on her mouth and the other hand on the camera and looks around. Says this is getting suspicious everyone. Then, she surprisingly asked why they couldn't find any monsters around there. Also, the camera was on, and she was recording everything. Kim stands behind and replies there are no monsters within two miles of their location. They can go faster than this. Both of them turn their head and surprisingly look toward Kim. However, Chin asks him how he knew that, and Kim replies he just sensed it. Hearing this, Chin thinks, can this SS class player clear an 8-star dungeon? And felt the presence of another monster too. Yui folded her camera, looked ahead, and asked them if they could pick up the pace and speed things up now. However, she runs away from there, saying she will race them to the top. Everyone sees her running away, and Chin also runs. Kim silently stands behind and thinks he won't be able to finish his mission if he keeps trying to match their speed. It is time for him to retrieve the Daystone. Then he takes out his Daystone and activates his energies. His clothes turn into physical armor, and a bright light starts emerging out of his body. As soon as the shining light spread there, both Yui and Chin stopped and turned their head to look. However, both of them are surprised, and in a second Kim, with that bright light, passes through between them, and due to his passing speed, the dust and smoke spread there. And they both, putting their hands over their faces, jump backward, and then Chin, surprisingly looking ahead, asks if that was a flying spell, and Yui, in surprise, replies no. She would have sensed it if he used any magic that wasn't a spell. Therefore, Chin stands there and looks ahead, surprisingly, thinking if it's not a spell, then what is it? Meanwhile, Kim flies in the air and looks around, saying the system has located the Daystone. However, the window appeared before him, searching for the Daystone's location, and the time start counted down. Also, from the place where Kim flying upward, the bright light spread everywhere, and where he stood in the air, the bright light was emanating from his body. Then, another window appears before him, and the system informs him that the location search is complete, initiating the navigation toward his destination. However, Kim flies from there toward his destination. On the way, he crosses the hills and the bright light spreads with him wherever he goes. After this, Kim jumped onto the ground. As soon as he jumped, a bright light came from his body and the light ended when he jumped and the smoke emanated from his armor. Then another window appeared before him, telling him that he had arrived at his destination and exiting navigation mode was on. 
Kim stood before the hill, and a considerable daystone was stuck on the top. He stood there staring at the daystone, then he stepped ahead toward the stone, but as soon as he stepped ahead, a dark aura came out of the ground upward, and then this aura spread all around him. Therefore, Kim clenches his teeth, asking what? Meanwhile, a notification window appears before him to warn him. Then, hundreds of flying monsters emerge from the dark aura, and another window appears before him, the monsters, over a hundred monsters have been detected and generated. However, the hundreds of monsters fly in the air over Kim and move toward him. The flying monster bees move toward Kim to attack while Kim stands there silently, stare the monster coming toward him. After this, the explosion occurs and something crashes in the distance. See this? Both Yui and Chen stand in the distance and get scared. They both look toward that dust explosion and Yui worriedly asks what it is Chen answers quickly and lets go, and then both run away from there toward that explosion. Yui's cat runs after them. While running away, Yui turned her head and looked toward Chen, saying it would be nighttime before they reached the top of that hill if they kept running like this. Here's this, Chen asks if there is anything else they can do, and Yui answers it's a little extreme, but she thinks she can do this since there are no monsters around them. However, she creates the bouncy shield around Chen and herself, then she puts the fireball in her hand, saying she apologizes to him, but this is the only thing she can come up with right now. After this, she attacks with a fire magnum on the bouncy shields and both shields from there. The round moves forward. Then the fire explosion occurs and that explosion throws this bouncy shield upward toward the cliff and then both the shields thud up on the cliff. Then both the shields move there and they both in that shields fall up and down as the shields stop there and they are both surprised to see the bee monster's corpse lying there on the ground. Also, the bright sunlight like a flash was coming there from the hillside and they both sat there in the bouncy shield loo. King toward Kim stood there between the monster's corpse. Sees this Chin gulp, thinking it's barely been five minutes since he flew there. Then he asks himself if he killed all these monsters on his own. Kim stood there staring at the daystone. He also got slightly injured while defeating those monsters. Moreover, the day's stone throb and the dark aura emerge from it. After this, the bouncy shield ends and Yui sits there and taps her hands on her legs. Then, they both get up and move toward Kim. Yui, while stepping toward Kim, waves her hand, asking if he is alright. Kim stands there near the monster bee's head and replies yes, he is fine. Then he asks them if they should carry on them, and Yui excitedly replies yes, and then the three of them move ahead. But as soon as they move toward the daystone, a dark aura emerges under Kim's shoes. Both Kim and Chin look toward that aura. While Yui steps ahead, as she steps ahead, a barrier wall is there. She surprisingly asks, what is this, then she touches that wall to go on. But as she touches it, her hands feel an electric current, and a dark aura emerges from the barrier where she touched it. Then Yui stepped backward and started pressing her finger with her hand, saying she had never seen something like this before. Kim stood beside her, turned his eyes and looked toward her. Chin adds his point, saying neither has he. Then Yui instructs them to step backward because she, with her magic, is going to break that barrier. However, she creates her magic wind, but before she attacks that barrier, Kim punches it and crashes it with his left hand. Fees this, both Chin and Yui get surprised, and then an explosion occurs there, and the barrier breaks. After this, Kim turns his head and looks toward them. Say let's keep going Yui sulks and replies okay, and then the three of them move toward that daystone. However, that daystone looked huge from a distance, but as they approached, it was trapped with a small rock. As they both stand before that daystone, a window appears, and the system asks Kim if he would like to absorb the daystone. Kim, in his mind, replies to system no, they need to analyze it first and don't absorb the daystone. Hearing this, the system that reacts to a command receive the daystone will not be interested. After this, Kim extended his hand to grab the stone, but as he tapped the stone, it throbbed, and a dark aura started coming out from it. Sees this Kim, staring at the daystone and asking what's going on. Suddenly, a bright light emerges from the stone, and a dark aura spreads there. And in that dark aura, the explosion occurs. However, the next day, military helicopter jeeps and soldiers gathered in the city's main area, and they imposed a curfew in the town. The lieutenant colonel stands there on the road. Meanwhile, the vice captain and his subordinate get there, saluting the lieutenant. Standing at lieutenant colonel's back, the vice captain salutes him, calling his name. 
The colonel turns his head to look, and the vice-captain, while saluting him, says this might have something to do with that. Sees them, and their colonel answers they have arrived. Hearing this, the vice-captain asks what's going on sir, while the colonel takes out the cigarette from the cigarette pack. Then, the colonel put the cigarette in his mouth, while the vice-captain stood there looking toward the colonel, saying they were sure that they had cleared every dungeon that was imminent for a dungeon break. Colonel shakes his hand, answering he doesn't get it either, but there was a report on the strange behavior of the dungeon recently, and this might have something to do with that. Hearing this, Colonel answers he has also listened to that report, sir. It said that the dungeon break forecasts have been off recently. Furthermore, this vice captain thinks he just assumed that it was a glitch with the computer, but now he is worried about seeing the situation unfold. After this, the Colonel asks him about Kim, and then asks if they all come there without him. Hearing this, they all head down, and the vice captain looks down and replies Captain Kim is currently on another mission ordered by the Prime Minister. However, the colonel throws the cigarette on the ground, saying they are in trouble. He hopes they have enough ammo for this. They have become overly reliant on Kim. Vice captain, after a minute, nervously replies they don't have Captain Kim there, but there might still be a way for them to get through, sir. Hearing this, the colonel turns his head and surprisingly looks toward him, asking what the lives of the citizens are at stake there. Then he asks if this is something he is sure of. Vice Captain gulps, answering yes, he is certain sir hears this. Colonel silently looks toward him. Then order him to go on with it, and the vice captain salutes Colonel, answering yes sir. Then he turns his eyes and looks aside, thinking only a handful of people in this country are capable of replacing Captain Kim. Then, while looking toward Kang, who was hiding behind the soldier, he looked at them a little further and thought that the kid was the only person he knew who could help them. However, in Moth Chamber, Yui was lying there on the ground. There, she blinks and heads up, then sits up and looks around, asking herself where she is. There was darkness all around her, and she surprisingly looked around, asking if there had always been a place like this in the Moth Chamber. Then she stands with her hand on her knees and thinks no, she has cleared several moth chambers before, but she has never found a cave inside one. After this, she brushed her clothes, thinking, could this have happened because of that stone? Then she looked around, asking in any case, where was everyone else? Then, looking up at the cave, she raised her voice, calling Kim and Chin. On Kim's side, he stands there in the cave, holding the stone in his hand, and the window appears before him. Insufficient lighting is detected, activating night vision. Kim looks aside and asks System where he is. The System replies, and the window appears he is inside a nameless, unranked dungeon. Hearing this, Kim surprisingly asks a nameless dungeon how they got there, and the System answers he is not sure, but it seems to be related to the Daystone. However, he might be able to decipher the reason if he absorbs the Daystone, and then the System slurps while Kim is staring at the Daystone answer. He can't let him do that yet, and the system shows pout emoji. Further, Kim stands there thinking he was too preoccupied with the Daystone's retrieval to react to this unexpected turn of events. Moreover, he believes this has become quite troublesome. Let's finish this quickly and leave this place. As he stands there thinking this all, a bunch of monsters from darkness move toward him from behind his back. Kim turns his head to look. On Yui's side, she turns on the light of her camera and starts recording. Then she moves ahead into the cave, saying to her viewers Dear Yumi Hours, she has yet to learn where this is. She is very scared right now. Suddenly, she remembers the time when she used her magic power. Then she stopped there and thought this was not good. She used way too many abilities earlier because she assumed there wouldn't be any monsters there. Further, she gulps, thinking that she is almost out of her mana already, and stands there. She starts shuddering when she sees the wolf monster coming toward her from all sides. She gets scared and asks herself if it is a wolf monster. On Chin's side, he was also there in the cave, and the monsters were gathered all around him, and he got stuck in between them. Stands there, he asks himself. He thought this was a moth chamber, but now he is surrounded by a bunch of wolves. Well, now he is 100% certain. After this, he takes out the knives from the belt and twirls them saying that something's going wrong there. On the other side, Kim stands there while the monster surrounds him, and he stares. The monster says the dogs, how adorable. However, Kang stands there with his back to the vice captain and colonel. On the other side, in the nameless dungeon, saliva is dripping from the monster wolf's mouth, and Yui stands between the bunch of monsters. 
After this, she cracked her hand, thinking let's calm down. This was unexpected, but she could still do this thing. Then she taps on her heart pendant, and it starts to glow and create a beeping voice, and then the inventory box appears before her. She looks toward the inventory and thinks no matter what happens, she is still in a rank hunter created by the government. Therefore, she goes near the inventory and takes out her selfie stick and mobile from there. On the other side, Kim punches one of the monster dogs and splits it, then jumps and moves toward the other dog. He hits and kicks them all one by one and splats them. Then he runs and jumps up while the monster dog stands there looking up toward Kim barking. Kim jumped upward and then moved back and hit the monster's face with his foot and cracked it on the ground. The beast starts to tremble, and Kim presses the monster dog's head with his shoes and splits it. After killing all the monster dogs, Kim steps over the blood and wipes his sweat. Then puts his hand on his nose and says what a terrible stench. Looking toward the monster dog's corpse, he thinks these weird dogs are tougher than he expected. They are no threat to him. But he needs to figure out the other two. Then, looking up, he asks the system to find Yui and Chin's location. The window beeps and appears before him, the initiating location scan scanning complete, and then the time counts down. The window appeared before him, studied the full opening map in a head-up display, and then the map displayed before him. There, he checked he was far away from them. However, on Chin's side, he was twirling his knives, and then he slashed one of the monster wolves, and the monster thudded on the ground. While killing the monster wolves, he thinks it's been a while since he has fought in the dark like this. It's difficult to locate these monsters inside the cave. But the first generation has been through much worse ten years ago. Moreover, a bunch of monster wolves surround him, and he jumps and slices many of them with his weapon. Then he twirls his weapon and splats three more of them. He keeps looping his gun and kills them all one by one. Also, his eyes turn red when he is killing the wolves. After killing them, Chin puts his gun back into the belt while thinking he is not worried about Captain Kim, but he is concerned about Miss Yui. Since she had used up a lot of her mana already, a mage without mana is easy prey for the monsters. Thinking this, he ran away, saying he needed to get going as fast as he could, while on Yui's side, a dead wolf was lying on the ground, and the empty mana potion bottle was clattered on the ground there. Also, the bright light spread there, and Yui stood there in her bouncing shield, holding the selfie stick in her hand. The mana potion bottle that she got from the inventory was hers. The monster wolf runs toward her to attack, but they collapse with the bouncing shield and fall backward. She stands there in the bouncing shield, looks toward the camera, and asks what she should do. Yui couldn't even fight back with her spells. At this point, she was capable of casting both offensive and defensive spells simultaneously. Those symptoms are normally only found in monsters infected by a moth. However, Yui's status window appeared there, on which her HP, MP strength, agility, mana, and unique traits were mentioned. Her HP was 6780 over 6780, her MP was quite low, and her strength, agility, and mana were considerable. She stands there worriedly, thinking should she risk attacking them. Mr. Kim and Mr. Chin might be able to rescue her. But she will be completely helpless if she runs out of mana. There also, the light of her shoulder camera was on, and she was recording this all. In that panicking situation, she turns her eyes and looks toward the camera on her shoulder. Looking toward the camera, she slightly smiles, thinking right, she is recording this for her Yumi hours right now. She has to do this. She has to show them how she heroically survived. Humanity had been fighting back without any guarantee of survival, and Yui was also one of the brave warriors of this struggle. However, Yui decides to face the monster wolves. She deactivates the bouncing shield barrier, and the monster wolves jump toward her to attack. She wished for her selfie stick, and the bright light came out of the stick's head heart, and this heart was the same as her pendant heart. Then she released the fire and boomed it toward the monster wolves. The monster roared, and one of the monsters hit her and fell her away. She falls there while rolling, and her stick slips from her hand, but she grabs it from the ground and sits up then throws the lighting magic from her stick toward the monsters. The monster roared and plopped there. As the beast plopped, the dust and smoke spread upward from the ground, and then, holding her stick, she panicked. Her status window appeared before her on her level, which was 200. Her agility, mana, and strength were mentioned as everything was the same as before, only her HP decreased. However, in the fight, her arm got injured. She sweats and looks aside, thinking she fell lightheaded, 
That was all of the mana she had left. Then she looks toward her injured arm and feels that it is hurt as well. She should have dodged that wolf's attack. Standing there, Yui falters, then she lowers her arms, thinking she wonders if Mr. Kim and Mr. Chin are okay. Meanwhile, the monster wolf lying behind her on the ground blinks, and then the monster gets up and jumps to attack her. She stands there, putting her hand on her injury, which is her back to the wolf. As the wolf jumped and was about to attack her, she looked back in fear and opened her mouth. Meanwhile, Chin's weapon twirled, and it splurts the wolf's head. While Yui stands there, putting her hand over her face, when Chin's weapon crashes on the ground. Then, she realizes that someone is there to save her. However, the dead monster thuds on the ground, and dust and smoke spread there. She stands there and looks toward the weapon, which crashed on the ground. Then she looks ahead toward Chin, saying, Mr. Chin, and he replies to her, it's a good thing he noticed her lightning. After this, both of them move from there and there. On the way, Chin gives her the potion bottle Yui gulp it and sighs, saying that's so much better. Then she thanked him for that potion bottle. However, her status window appeared before her, on which her HP and MP were mentioned, and this time, her HP increased and went to its maximum point while her MP decreased. Moreover, she stands there looking ahead, asking if this is a very strange cave. Those wolves were infested with eggs too. Further, she says these symptoms are normally only found in monsters infected by a moth, but wolves don't normally appear in both chambers, and she has never seen a cave like this either. Hearing this, Chin looked up as he was feeling a strange noise. There was suddenly something thud on the cave roof. Sees this Yui holding the potion bottle in her hand, surprisingly asks what that sound is. Chin replies that they should hurry. Then, both of them run away from there. While running away, Chin tells him that if this is like any other dungeon, they should be able to get out of there once they defeat the boss. She runs away and replies he is right. They need to find where it is. Suddenly, something thuds there, and they see the light ahead. Sees that light, Yui runs away and says look, she sees the light. Then, pointing forward, she raises her voice, saying let's go over there. As she stepped ahead to move, Chin grabbed her shoulder and stopped her. There, she turned her head, asking him what, and he put his index finger on his mouth and asked her to keep quiet. Then he pointed aside, and both of them hiding behind the rock slightly moved ahead to look and see the dragon monster-like thing there. She gets scared and puts her hand on her mouth, asking what in the world are those things. However, Chen answers he has seen countless numbers of monsters before, but this is the first time he has found something like this. Some monsters resemble humans, but they only have a few similar features. These things look like an amalgam of a human and a beast, and he has never seen such disgusting creatures in his entire life. They both hide behind the big rock, and the monster stands on the other side of them, sniffing then looking up, raising its voice, saying he smells human flesh. Hearing this, both Yui and Chin get scared, and Chin hears the monster's voice and thinks, did the monster talk? It didn't sound like Korean, but he recognized that language from somewhere. After this, the monster turns with its pointed legs and glances all around to check if there is any human while both of them hide behind the big rock. After studying there, the monster turns from there and returns to his place. Sees this, Yui turns her head and looks toward Chin without anything. Chin nods his head and then they both wish and move ahead to run away, but as soon as they carry, a huge monster stands before them. Looking toward them, the monster asks where they are. Sees the beast there. Both of them start to sweat, and then the beast strikes its pointed leg to attack them. However, the monster strikes and crashes the big rock where they both stand and a dust explosion occurs there. Moreover, they both fall away. Chin sits up there, but Yui turns around and falls back. Then Chin gets up and takes out his weapon from the belt. Chin starts twirling his weapon while Yui stands behind him, using her magic to get her inventory there. However, the monster gets out of that dust explosion while Chin stands there holding his weapon, looking toward the beast. Chin thinks it's fast. Further, he stares at the monster's body, feeling those surgical scars and the stitches. He is sure of it now. This is not a natural monster in this field. The monster was quite big, and they both stood there holding their weapons. Chen turns his head, asking Yui how much mana she has left. She stands behind him, holding her magic stick, and replies she has enough to cast about four or five spells. Chen jumps toward the monster, replaying her that should be enough, then sees Chen coming toward him. The monster stays silent and doesn't move. 
Chen, with his red eyes, tries to stab his weapon into the monster's body. The weapon clangs with its body, and a bright light emerges there. As the light fades, Chen, holding his stuck weapon with the monster's body, sits on its leg while the monster laughs, asking him what he thinks he is doing. Sees this, Chen gets surprised, considering it impossible his sword couldn't cut through. The monster strikes its pointed leg to attack him. Meanwhile, the Yui magic tentacle spurts out of the ground and crumbles the monster's leg. Chen pulls back his weapon, which is stuck to the monster's body and jumps backward. Then he screeched on the ground and thanked Yui for her magic. She smiles, answering don't mention it. The monster cracks Yui's magic tentacles and sees this. Chen stands there thinking this horrible abomination isn't the only one they need to worry about. Then he looks aside, thinking that there are two more of them, but they seem to be preoccupied with their conversation for now. Further, he clenched his teeth, thinking this battle would become quite difficult if these two joined in. They need to finish this quickly before that happens. Then he turns his head and calls Yui's name. She attentively looks toward her. He asked her if she would be able to buff him with her remaining mana, and she nodded. After this, she starts creating her magic, and a bright flash of light emerges from the stick's head. Then she lifts her stick ahead, saying haste fire the sword and enhance strength. However, dex max, star max, and fire attribute magic activate in Chin's body, and the fire gathers around him. His eyes turn red, and he stands there pointing his sword toward the monster, thinking his body is overwhelming with power, and then his legs start to pulse with magic. Then he jumped, twirling his weapon, and sliced the monster's leg and arms. Seeing this, the beast was surprised, turned his head, and looked toward him angrily. Chin stands there in the air, stares at the beast move toward him, flying and slices the monster's body, and the blood spurts out of its body. Sees this, Yui smiles, thinking all right as she would expect from Chin. He is known as the strongest PvP fighter after all, as Chin keeps attacking the monster with the weapon and slicing it into pieces. Therefore, with the new buffs, Chin was able to cut down the monster that he couldn't hurt before. However, he started to notice that something was wrong. The color of the amalgam's blood was crimson red, as Chin had slain countless monsters in his life. But he had never seen a humanoid monster shed red blood. Once he realized this, Chin couldn't help but wonder if the he was cutting down was a monster at all. However, the monster's leg is thudded, and he crash on the ground dead and sees Chin smile while something is panting behind him. Yui was surprised to see how Chin had killed that monster. Then, putting a hand on her mouth, she surprisingly asked if it was over. She didn't want to jinx it. Meanwhile, the other two monsters get there. And see those monsters, Yui raises her voice, calling Chin. He turns his eyes and sees the monster at his back. He gets shocked. However, the beast crashed its pointed leg to attack him. But as the beast crashed its legs on the ground, the ground cracked from that area, and the dust and smoke spread there. As soon as the dust smoke ends, the monster is surprised to see two of them are gone. One of the monsters looks around, saying he is gone. But as the monster turns, both Chin and Yui stand behind them. Seeing this, the monster asks sneakily, aren't they little rats? However, both of them get scared then. Chin stands ahead of her and asks her how much mana she has left. Miss Yui, hearing this, makes a sad face and remains silent. Then she answered she used most of it for the buffs just now, so she only has enough for one and two spells. Hearing this, Chin, looking toward the monster, clenches his teeth and takes out his weapon from the belt, thinking he has to do this, and then he clenches the handle of his sword. He runs toward the monster to attack them, thinking he needs to finish those two before the buff runs out. On the other side, Kim crashed the wall before him, and the dust smoke spread there, and from that dust smoke he came out. Standing out of the dust smoke, he gets the notification window of warning, and then another window appears before him, telling him that his ally has engaged in another battle. However, the map before him which he sees the distance between him and the two of them, Kim stands there in the cave and asks the system how long it will take to reach them. A window appears before him. The shortest route will take approximately 30 minutes on foot. He hears this and shakes his head, saying that's way too long. The system replies it is impossible to fly inside the dungeon due to its cavernous nature. Hearing this, Kim remains silent. Then he asks, but it should be fine as long as he doesn't fly there, right? Then, within a second, he activates his physical enhancement skill, and the bright, wavy light starts emerging out of his body. Further, a bright light spreads there, and Kim flies from there. 
He flies so fast that he crashes every rock and wall in his way. On Chen's side, he jumps to attack the monster, but the monster creates a magic shield barrier before him, and Chin clangs with the barrier and falls away. Chin gets slightly injured and screeches on the ground by stabbing his sword into the ground. Yui stands behind him, using her lightning magic to create light all around Chin. Also, her mana is about to end. Moreover, both of them stand there holding their weapon step, ping backward while the monsters are stepping toward them. Kim was heading toward them, crashing everything in his path, and the window appeared before him, indicating that the estimated time left for his arrival was one minute. However, Chin moves ahead to attack the monster, but the monster cracks the wall and falls him away rolling. Chin got up, and with the help of Yui's remaining mana, he attacked the monster with his twirling sword and sliced its leg and arm. The blood spurts out of the monster's body, and the beast shouts. While Chin keeps attacking the monster by twirling his sword, the other monster, his companion, gets there from behind and strikes its arm to attack Chin. Sees this. Yui, with her magic stick, attacks the monster with her slash lightning magic while Chin is fighting with the other monster. Moreover, the monster crashes Yui's lightning magic strikes its leg on Chin and falls him away. Chin screeches his sword into the ground with the help of his sword, and he stands there. While Yui points her stick toward the monster, says Chin, this is taking her back, and he stands ahead of her, clenching the handle of his sword, and replies yes of course. But they might want to hold off on the pep talk until they finish this. Meanwhile, a bunch of monsters surround them, and one of the monsters cracks the wall and gets out of it, saying Chin is stronger than the rest of the humans that have entered this place but nobody has ever walked out of there alive after finding them. Then the monster squirmed, saying that the implant gave them a new life as immortal as the further evolution of humanity. Hearing this, Chin clenched his teeth, thinking, what is this thing talking about? Then the monster throbs, saying behold the overwhelming power of humanity's next form. Suddenly, the monster stood there, started to split, and started absorbing the dead monster. Also, the other monster there and becomes a huge monster sees this. Both Yui and Chin get gloop, and Yui looks up toward that huge monster and, surprisingly, asks what on earth it is absorbing the dead monster. However, the monster stands there before them, and they both look tiny before the beast. Chin, looking toward the monster, asks for a three-way fusion. He has got to be kidding him, and Yui stands behind him, wide opening her mouth in surprise, and adds her point, saying she is getting sick of this. Further looking up toward that huge monster, she thinks they barely have any mana and energy left anymore. This is the worst it can get. The monster steps toward them and sees Chin clench his teeth, thinking it's almost as if they are facing all three of them again. He grips and grasps the handle of his sword, considering that both of them have survived this far alongside the other first generation. As Yui was fearfully looking toward the monster, Chin stood ahead of her call her name. She asked what, and he saw the sword handle. Answering, he knows that this is difficult for her, but he needs her to gather the rest of her mana. Then he twirls his sword and buffs him one last time. He hears this Yui node answering, she has just enough mana for one more attack, but she will use that to give him three buffs instead, but they will only be one third as effective. However, Yui returned her haste fire sword and enhanced strength mana to him, and the bright light spread around him. Chin stands there twirling his sword, thinking now, let's show this monster the true strength of the first generation. Considering this, he jumps toward the monster, twirling his swords. Meanwhile, the wall there starts rumbling, and Yui stands there and looks up, thinking the rumbling is beginning to get louder. However, the wall crashed and Kim, surrounded by the lighting power, came out of that wall. Flying, he attacked the monster from behind while the beast was stepping toward Chin. Kim punched the monster, crashed it, and sliced its body part. Then, a huge light explosion occurred, and then smoke spread. Both Chin and Yui stand there looking toward the explosion, and from that explosion, the sound of crumble and thud happens. After this, Kim appears from that dust smoke, saying he is glad to see that both of them are okay. Seeing Kim there, both of them sigh. However, three of them stand there before the monster and the window appears before Kim that the energy of another day's tones has been detected. Hearing this, he turns his head and looks toward the daystone in the air behind him, and surprisingly asks for another daystone beside this one. The system replies he is unable to identify the organism. The energy of the daystone is coming from an unknown organism. Meanwhile, the monster there squirms sees this Yui stands beside the monster, 
and says the pieces of the corpses are still moving even after that decisive blow. Chin held the sword handle to take it out from the belt, answering her to let him finish it off. As he stepped ahead toward the monster, Kim stopped him, saying, no wait, hold on. Then he asks the system if he can absorb the Daystone's energy system and replies it is faint and small, but he can absorb the energy which will result in the organism's death. Kim orders the system to do it. The system starts to absorb the monster's power and stone from its body while absorbing the stone. The system tells Kim that commencing absorption is a bit gross, but there he gets to slurp. However, a flashlight spreads over the monster's body, and both Chin and Yui put their hands over their eyes while Kim stands there, closes their eyes, and that flashlight surrounds him. Moreover, the flashlight starts emerging out of Kim's body, and the window appears before him. The Daystone's energy has been successfully absorbed. The quantity is insufficient to enable a new feature, but it could be enough if he lets him drink the one that he is holding. Here's this. Kim stands there with closed eyes, thinking he feels like it is starting to express itself more. Meanwhile, the monster and its body begin to disappear. From its body, the smoke comes out and both Chin and Yui step toward the monster. After this, another window appears before Kim, and the system informs him that he has detected the energy of the boss and another day tone fragment behind the wall next to his player. Here's this, Kim silently looks up toward the window, and then Yui stands there and says she is glad that's over, but they still haven't found the boss moth queen yet. Further, she says that they can only leave the dungeon if they defeat the boss. Here's this, Kim steps ahead and crashes the wall before him. However, the wall crumbled, and dust and smoke spread there. Sees this both get surprised. Yui sticks out her tongue and smiles, asking why he is destroying the wall again. Chin remains silent and doesn't respond. Kim moves ahead and sees this Chin says let's follow him, and she stands behind him and replies okay, and then they both run after Kim. However, three of them arrive at the place where the boss monster is. They see the boss monster, Chin flinch and both of them are surprised while Kim keeps stepping ahead. Also, the boss monster needed to be in better condition. Its hand, neck and legs were tied with seven lightning spell circles, and it was lying on the ground injured. Therefore, the window appears before him. He detects a corrupted fragment of the Dristone within the boss in front of him. Hearing this, Kim asks what the boss of this dungeon is, it looks like it's already about to die. The system replies, absorbing the boss's Daystone will kill the monster and complete the dungeon run. However, the boss monster is lying there, and T and the system tells Kim the beast is currently incapacitated and appears to be begging him to take its life. Hearing this, Kim remains silent. After this, Kim asks the system if he can read the monster's emotions. The system replies he is capable of understanding its basic emotions. He senses its anger and sorrow as well as its fear and despair. Hearing this, Kim thinks the monsters are capable of feeling human emotions, and this one is asking him to end his own life. However, Kim was one of many who found the situation to be strange. The Moth Queen was supposed to be the final boss of the Moth Chamber. But this mysterious dungeon was infested with these unknown creatures, and the Moth Queen was bound to a magic spell circle with a fatal injury. Further, the Arank Hunters had already completed several moth chambers before, so these circumstances were more than enough to convince them that something was amiss. After this, Chin moves toward the spell light, which bonds the monster's arm, and Yui touches the spell circle to check it. As soon as she touched it, the circle spelled light stuck to her hand, and the bright, wavy light started coming out of her hand. After this, Yui gets up, saying this magic circle is a restraining spell, but a magic circle of this size is a challenging thing to cast. Whoever pulled this off must have had an A rank no, an S rank set of skills. Hearing this, Chin stands aside and adds his point, saying that the wounds of these monsters are unusual as well. Normally, the injuries from a battle should be crude and irregular. Then, looking toward the injured monster he says, but the cuts of this monster are far too orderly and clean. It's almost as if someone had cut up this monster to take away the organs they needed. Hearing this, Yui Grit says yes, she agrees he probably has come to the same conclusion as her. But if her deductions are correct, someone must have artificially created this dungeon. However, Chin staring at the monster adds his point, saying this is hard to believe even with all the evidence. Then he asks if someone has been experimenting with the beast as they both are talking while Kim stands there silently looking down. Moreover, Kim stands there thinking that this is only partially implausible. 
After all, the government of South Korea has already been experimenting with the fire dragon's remains. They should all get out of there before anything else happens to them, and then Kim steps ahead toward the monster. Stands there near the monster, Kim asks the system to absorb the day stone energy system replies, commencing absorption. Then the shining stone starts coming out of the monster's chest. Sees this, Yui's mouth wide open in surprise, and she surprisingly says it's the same thing as earlier. Chin. On stands there stares that shining stone, asking what that shining fragment is. However, the glowing stone turns into a bright light while the roaring sound comes from the monster's mouth. Then that flash of light spreads around there, and it starts circulating Kim while he stands there silently closed eyes. A window appears there the day stone energy has been absorbed, and then the monster crumbles and its body starts to disappear, and only the smoke remains there. However, the monster disappeared, and the smoke that was coming from his body ended, while the three of them stood there in the spell circle. After this, the dark aura emerged before them, and Chin was silently staring at Kim. As Chin was staring, he and Kim looked aside, saying let's hold off on any more questions for now and leave the dungeon while it's completed. Yui points ahead and adds her point, saying he is right. Let's get out of there, they can talk outside. Chin angrily looks toward her and remains silent, then he turns his head toward Kim, answering all right, let's go. After this, three of them move ahead toward the dungeon exit shield door, and then three of them exit and the dark aura spreads there on the spell circle ends. As soon as the three of them come out, sunlight hits their eyes, and they put their hands on their eyes, the window appears there, informing Kim of deactivated night vision. It had only been a minute since they had been there. Meanwhile, the military soldiers surrounded them, holding their weapons. However, one of the soldiers raises his voice, saying they have found them, sir, and the other soldier stands beside him, saying they sent in a report immediately. As the soldiers were talking to each other three of them surprisingly stood there looking toward the soldier. However, Yui looks around and asks what is going on. Meanwhile, Yoon gets there from an aside, calling Kim, Yui and Chin names. Three of them turn their head to look toward her, and Kim surprisingly asks what Lieutenant Yoon is. After some time, Yoon tells them they return after two months, and hears this three of them surprisingly ask what two months. And she sighs, answering yes, it's already been two months since the three of them entered the dungeon. Hearing this, Yui shakes her hand, saying that it's impossible. It should only take about three days to complete the moth chamber. While Kim stands behind her, she asks the system if it has been two months. The system answers, calibrating the difference in time he has spent 71 hours inside the dungeon. Then another window appeared, and the system said that while 1441 hours had passed on Earth, the local time had been adjusted. Hearing this, Kim was surprised. He pressed his lips, thinking there was another fluctuation in time just like the one he experienced in the tutorial. After this, Yoon says they have reported their return to the Prime Minister, so she should be coming to see them very soon. But for now, let's all head back to the lab. Yui replied okay, and then the four of them moved from there to the lab. They all walked forward, and Kim followed behind. Yoon turns her head and looks toward Kim, and in response, Kim nods. The four of them then go to the military base lab. However, four of them sit on the chair while Yoon is reading the file lying on the table. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Gu slams the door and enters. Four of them turn their head and look toward the door. Gu sent is there smiling, saying they are all right. However, Seonggir Gu and Yoon watched Yui's recording of everything that had transpired inside the dungeon. Gu, holding Yui's recording camera, was watching the recording, and Yoon, standing beside her, was also watching this. After this, Gu looks toward Yui, and Chin sits there and thanks them for their work. She says she will contact them both very soon, so go and get some rest for now. Hearing this, both of them get up from the chairs and move toward the exit door. As they are stepping toward the door, Gu calls Yui, and she turns her head, asking what. Gu, folding the recording camera, answers she will back the recording once they delete all of the confidential information. Yui smiled, nodding and answered understood, then they both left, and only Gu, Yoon and Kim were in the office. Kim gets up from the chair, takes the Dristone from his backside, and extends his hand toward Gu, giving her the Dristone, saying he has retrieved it. Gu takes the day's stone from Kim and slightly smiles, appreciating the good work, Captain Kim. Further, she says she honestly can't fathom the boundaries of his capability. It almost seems as if he is breaking through the limits every time Kim scratches and looks down, answering no, it was nothing, madam. 
Hearing this, she looked toward him, saying that sometimes he doesn't seem so different from anyone else. Then she stared at the stone, saying that with this day stone in their hand, humanity would be one step closer to bringing an end to this crisis. Kim bent his head, answering yes, madam, and then she smiled. After this, he moved toward the exit door. As he stepped ahead, Gu stood behind him looked toward him, saying some people were waiting for him outside. However, the exit door of the lab creaks its shutter up, and Kim moves toward outside, surprisingly thinking people are waiting for him. As soon as he stepped outside the military base, he was surprised to see his team members there. Also, their appearance had changed. They had become stronger than before, and their muscles had grown, and their feet were swallowed. Also, their clothes were torn apart, and their eyes were turned red. As they all stood there, Kang stood ahead of them with folded arms. Kim, looking toward them surprisingly, asked what happened to them. The window that updates character information appears before him. Every one of these members has awakened as a player. However, the error window appears, and then another window appears, revising character information with updated information. Hearing this, Kim remains silent and surprisingly asks what, and the system replies a new unknown power has been detected. Generating a new category of power includes HWI Kang and the rest of the team members. Hears this, Kim surprisingly asks why they have the same power as Kang, and then Kim's subordinates raise their voice, congratulating Kim on his safe return and saluting him. They all salute Kim while Kang's folded arm stands ahead of them, and then Kim lifts his arm, saying all right at ease. Further, Kim says they all handled the situation while he was gone. Good work. Hearing this, Kang cheered up loudly, saying yes, Kim praised him. They all stand behind him, surprisingly looking toward him. After this, Kang jumps there happily, and while jumping he moves ahead. And they all stand behind and look toward him. As he goes on, Kim asks the vice captain what went on while he was away and what happened to all of them. Vice Captain answers a lot of things have happened to them in the last two months, Captain Kim. Then he explains two months ago, on the first day of Kim's mission in the dungeon, a dungeon break in the city, and Kang, in his absence, kills all the monsters alone with his magic power. Also, military tanks and troops were there to handle that situation, and Lieutenant Lee was surprised to see Kang alone killing the monster. Then, surprisingly, he says he never expected another man like Kim to exist. This kid is incredible, and Vice Captain says he was surprised to see this all. He already knew that the rookie was strong, but seeing him like this makes him realize just how powerful he is. If Captain Kim hadn't saved him back, then he might have ended up like these monsters. However, Vice Captain Juong Ham was in awe of HWI Kang's power, and even realized he was safe under his protection. But a sense of frustration began to rise in him, and stands there silently looking down. He trembled and clenched his fist, thinking he could be sitting uselessly like this forever. He wanted to become as powerful as him. Moreover, Kang kills the monster himself alone, and the military soldiers collect the monster's corpse pieces, and they are carried away on stretchers. Further, the vice captain tells Kim as Kang kills all the monsters, he and his team members move toward Kang, who sits there on the road. While on the way, the guy with orange hair asks him if it would even be possible none of them are players, and even if there was a way, he doubts he would tell them about it. The vice captain replies that they can only rely on the captain and the rookie for a while. Also, even if it isn't possible, they have nothing to lose by doing this. Further, they are the ones who are desperate to hear this, the guy with orange hair fearfully says, but he is just worried that the rookie might have some grudges against him, vice captain. Hearing this, the Vi Captain remains silent and after a minute, answers don't worry about it. He will take care of everything. However, they all move toward Kang, who is sitting on the road and stands behind him. He calls Kang, says him. Rookie Kang turns him, asking what the matter is. Then, the Vice Captain and his team members explain everything to Kang. They all stand before each other on one side, Kang, and before him, the Vice Captain, with his subordinates. Hearing this all from Vice Captain Kang asks if he wants him to teach them about his power, and the Vice Captain answers yes. If he could lead them to use that power and become stronger like him, they could gladly accept him as their instructor. Hears this, Kang grin and then asks them if they want to become stronger, and they all get surprised and remain silent. Then Kang says no problem. However, the next day, Kang took them to the forest. There, he told them they had to run away from the destination where he had done his training. He ran away from there, and they all ran after him. 
After running a mile, the vice captain and his team members got extremely tired, and then they all stopped there on the way to catch their breath. Vice captain, with puffy breath, asks Rook how much longer they have to. Kang, with a smiling face, answers they are almost there now, and then they keep stepping after her. However, after some time, they arrive at the place where Kang used to do his training, which has mountains and rocks and a sparkling stream of waterfall. Kang stands ahead of them, looking toward the mountain and waterfalls there while they stand behind him. One of the team members fearfully looked up toward the mountain with a sweaty face, asking so this is the orange-haired guy looking up fearfully at the training ground of their rookie. Further, the vice captain looks up and asks himself what this place looks like. It's from a historical movie and something. Then he looks toward Kang, stands ahead of them, and says don't tell him that they are going to train. But he is meditating under that waterfall, then he asks and lives off the land. Kang answered yes, that's what they are doing, then asked the vice captain how he knew, and the vice captain sweated, asking if that's actually what they are doing. Kang presses his lips, answering yes, and then the vice captain steps ahead removes his jacket and plops it on the ground. Sees this, his team members get surprised, and the vice captain, with full enthusiasm, says alright, he looks forward to his guidance Kang. However, Kang starts the training that day, and in this training he teaches them martial arts, throwing punches, standing under the waterfall, tree climbing and hanging upside down, mountain climbing rope abseiling, weight lifting, animal fighting etc. Moreover, at night time when they sit down tired, they hunt the animals in the forest and roast them on fire and eat them, and after having their meal they all sleep there in the forest on the ground. Then next day they start their training from where they left off yesterday Kang teams them the use his magic on rocks. Their training lasted for two months in such a way that a small stem of a plant grows out of the ground. They trained every day and each member showed progress their rigorous training continued for two months in such a way that the small stem of a plant grew out of the ground and slowly became a plant. However, they all become strong just like that small stem that slowly becomes a plant in two months. Hearing this all, Kim says the vice captain, so that's what they have been doing for the past two months. Then vice captain calls Kim and also requests him to counter them to have his back from now on. Kim remained silent and then he tapped his hand on the vice captain's shoulder and smiled from now on he has always trusted him to have his back. Hearing this, they all get emotional and with teary eyes they sniff and then they lift him saying they will follow him to the better end. While Kim asks them all right he gets it can they let go of him Kang stands in the distance watching them then he rubs his nose smiling. However, Kim two two month absence was enough to reinforce his team's power level and their sense of comradeship. Further Kim's team members celebrating their happiness throw him up in the air while Kang stands in the distance folded arms backside was watching them. On the other side, in an office in the dark, a man with purple eyes wrapping himself in black clothes was staring at the paper on which Yui Chin and Kim's picture and their bio data were mentioned. As the paper was lying before him on the table, he picked them up and arranged them. Meanwhile, the door knocks and he gets an alert saying come in the door creaks and three people enter and they also wear black clocks. Stands there in the dark in the office while the purple-eyed man sits there before them on his chair holding the pages then looking toward he asks a regretful turn of events isn't it a black eyes witch. Then the three who stood in the middle answered the incident was unexpected, but he could still fix this then the purple-eyed man put the information pages on the table and tapped it answering yes it could still be fixed. Further, he says, and it must be hearing this, the lady in the middle wearing a cloak and mask answers, she will personally make her way to South Korea. Hearing this, the purple-eyed man remains silent. However, in Seoul City at the Dehansen intersection of Natal Park Road, the military was transporting the remains of a fire dragon. Two military soldiers were in the truck one of them was driving, while the other one was sitting in the seat next to the driving seat. The chopper escort informs the convoy that they will head out to the outer road after passing through point A over. Hearing this, the soldier while driving the truck taps the wireless phone on the side and passes through the rest of the trucks honking the horn. While the other soldier sitting next to him was dozing leaning against the seat. Sees him dozing the one who was driving angrily looks toward him asking him to stop dozing off. Transporting the fire dragon's carcass is a serious mission, now that hears this the soldier wakes scared and remains silent. Then he yawned answering right sorry he doesn't know why he is feeling so tired today, but now that the shield guild is gone. 
Then he sighed saying he doubted anyone would try to steal this thing in their country heard this the other one asked does he took the remains of the 8 star boss as a joke. Even the world's most influential countries want a piece of this thing it makes perfect sense for them to guard it like this. Here's this the soldier looking out of the window sighs and remains silent also. On the road military jeeps, trucks and helicopters were passing over there. Their truck was the first on the road, all the other jeeps and trucks were behind, and from the chopper escort the pilot informed them truck one, they were about to enter a tunnel. Try to get through it as fast as they can. Here's this the military driver answers by bringing the wireless phone near to his mouth understanding they will try to pass it as quickly as possible. Then he turns his head and looks toward his companion he is snoring sees this, he clenches his teeth asking fine get some sleep then. As the truck was the first on the road also the chopper escort was following them the truck entered the tunnel and it cracked the wall and crumbled it. However, the chopper escort informed them there was an emergency he repeated they had an emergency while the military driver got scared and panicked drive also the one who was snoring woke up. The military driver looks behind through the truck mirror toward the cracked tunnel rocks and the chopper escort informs truck one to exit the tunnel as fast as possible. However, the truck moves to the other side of the cracked tunnel, and the stones are scattered everywhere on the road. The military soldiers get out of the jeeps and gather their holding their weapons, and the chopper escort informs them the rest of the units will take a detour hears this, the soldier answers while driving Roger that they will be out of there soon. Sees that situation the one sitting beside the driver says he has heard that there have been more tunnel and bridge accidents since the fate opened. Then he fearfully asked why did it have to happen at a time like this, the driver turned his head to look and was listening to him. As they were talking the one who sat beside the driver pointed ahead and raised his voice informing the driver in front of them to stop. The driver pressed the brake and screeched the truck and they were hardly saved from the accident, as they stopped the truck they were surprised to see another truck standing there ahead of them on the road. As the driver broke the truck the other one putting his hand on his head asked why they had another truck in front of them and why is there a truck in the tunnel that looked just like theirs. The driver clunks answering something's wrong there, then both of them with the guns get out of the truck to check. Both of them point their guns toward that truck and move ahead one of them, extends his hand to unlock the truck door, and says his companion covers for him in case anything happens. The other one stands behind pointing his gun toward the truck answer all right as soon as they try to open the door someone puts a gun in front of his eyes and sees this his eyes wide open in fear. However, the door opened and the men wearing army costumes got out of the truck shooting them. They killed both of them while some bullets clang with the truck and their blood also splattered on the truck's front side. The soldier thudded on the ground rolling and the hijackers were three in number after shooting the soldier three of them moved ahead one of them stepped on the military soldier's chest. The hijacker covered their faces with masks and one of them stared at the truck also there was a red mark on his face and he had one grey eye. They stepped toward the truck as soon as they entered the soldier's wireless phone radio lying their rings and there is a call from the chopper escort. They were asking truck number one how much longer would take to exit the tunnel, the one with a red face Mark garbed the phone and put it near his mouth answering they had roughly two minutes until their exit sir. However, the chopper escort was flying up in the air and arriving at the other side of the tunnel to check, and there the same truck with truck number one was on the road. Sees this, the pilot informs truck number one has exited the tunnel truck one keeps following the original route. The remaining units will join them after their detour hearing this, the guy with the red mark on his face holding the wireless phone answers Roger. Then he stares at the phone and looks toward his companion nod also response his companion nods. Then his companion put all the boxes in the truck that was cracked with the bullets from the front side and then they all sit in that truck and move from the tunnel to their destination. However, the hijacker dropped the original truck out of the tunnel. At the same time, Prime Minister Gu was attending the conference outside the hall, a lot of people gathered there. Some of them were people working in big companies and most of them were media and press people who were asking her questions and taking pictures of her. People were very excited to see her there many of them slogging for her and among those people a lady while slogging expressed her love for Gu and Gu humbly thanked her. After this, Gu's subordinate stands behind her and informs her that her next appointment is with the party leader at the National Assembly and Gu stands ahead node. Then they stepped ahead of them to move from there, while Gu's subordinate holding the paper file in her hand informed her, and after that, she had a dinner schedule at the Blue House. 
as Gu was stepping ahead media people and the citizen were clicking her pictures and slogging for her. While walking she stops there on the walking area side and she feels that something is happening behind her back also the people gathering around her become status. Sees this she turns her head to look as soon as she turns her head she clenches her teeth asking herself if it can't be are they under a charm spell right now. However, the people all around her became status, and their eyes turned red, and a charm spell circle was created all around where those were stands. She turns her head and looks around thinking it takes a lot of mana to cast a charming spell, even on a single target. So the fact that this was cast on an entire crowd means this was done by a master sorcerer. However, she was looking around meanwhile, a lady wearing a clock appeared near her sees her standing before her goo grit saying of course. This could only be done by someone of hers power level, the guild master of the shield guild Urim Park. After this, Urim asks Gu why did she it, she wants to get rid of them that badly. Here's this Gu answers their guild was simply punished for their crimes, and in response Urim smirks asking about their crime, then she removes the clack from her body and creates the spell asking then does she plans on punishing her as well. Gu staring at her powerful body and muscles answers of course, a violator of the law will face punishment no matter who they are. Urim gets near Gu and looks into her eyes smiles asking, is that so she is still as hard-headed as she has ever been. Gu stands there and Urim passes by her saying alright then punches her all she wants if she can she will be looking forward to it and she has always wanted to fight her prime minister Gu. Here's this goo turns her head and raises her voice calling Urim's name meanwhile Urim disappears with her charm spell and people around there become normal. As goo stands ahead of them her subordinate and the people around there surprisingly look around and one of goo's subordinates asks her if is there something wrong prime minister. Goo grits and turns her head slightly saying to cancel all of her appointments and summon the national security council immediately. On the other side, in the forest side monster corpses were lying there Kim and his subordinate go to check that situation. As Kim and Kang stand there silently exploring the situation while Kim's other subordinate steps ahead to check Vice Captain hits the monster skull lying in the way with his foot and falls it away. Kim's subordinates were checking around while Kim stood there with folded arms exploring the situation saying they had gone through a change. Further, he says this was only a low-rank dungeon, but they should be able to handle a dungeon break without him now. Then he appreciates Kang for his hard work on his subordinate, and in response, Kang rubs his nose and smiles. Meanwhile, one of Kim's team member call his name from behind Kim turns his head to look and his team member holding the wireless phone in hand informs him he has been summoned to the joint headquarters of the Third Army. Here's this Kim asks what's going on, and he answers the fire dragon's remains have been stolen by an unknown organization, here's this Kim remains silent. However, in a small nameless building in the suburbs of Seoul Prime Minister Gu with her subordinates was through an elevator to arrive at the secret floor. The elevator door opens Gu clank there with her subordinates and scans the entrance card to enter the meeting room there. Moreover, at the basement of this establishment, the high executives of South Korea, including the General of the Third Army, the government official of National Defense and Security and Captain Kim of the Special Dungeon Control Team had gathered for an unofficial National Security Summit. The door opens and Gu with her subordinates enters, seeing her there everyone there gets up from their chairs and salutes Prime Minister Gu. However, Gu in response asks them all to take their seat, and the topics of this gathering were the theft of the Fire Dragons remains by a known group, and the illegal entry of the Shield Guild's guild master into South Korea. After this Gu sat on the chair, and one of the directors of National Intelligence stood with a rostrum to start his presentation with the projector. A video is shown on the projector in which a group of people wearing cloaks exit the airport and take a turn to the side from there. Also, the people in the airport become status due to the charm spell. The director zooms the video to show them those groups of people, but they are unable to see their faces because of the veils wrapped around them. Then the video ends and the captain points toward the projector to inform them. This is where the video ends he says the guildmaster's charming spell was so powerful that they had to check the airport's security cameras to detect her arrival. Here's this, Prime Minister Gu raises her voice saying Director of National Intelligence, this means that there is a break in their national security. Then she raised her voice asking how the people trust and rely on them in this situation, and he apologized to Gu. While everyone else sits their head down and Gu grits thinking she has gotten even stronger Yarum Park has always been skilled in magic. 
but she couldn't charm an entire airport like this before then she asked the captain sitting before her as he had been tracking down the stolen remains of the fire dragon. He nervously answers they have been trying to analyze the security camera on the roads, but many of them have already been located and destroyed by the culprit. And it won't be easy for them to track them down here as this goo clench his teeth and get up them she slams her hand on the table. And shouting at the captain asking for security cameras is not the only resource this county has there are plenty of automobiles with dash cams. Everyone has a camera on their smartphone and stops making excuses for themselves. Hearing this the captain fearfully gets up from the chair and heads down apologizing to Goo. Then she sighed and scratched her head saying this was terrible and then the director of national intelligence added his point, saying the retrieval of the fire dragon's remains should be their priority madam. If this gets taken out of the country then the consequences will be unimaginable. However, this was correct the fire dragon's remains held astronomical values no amount of money could ever match its worth. Since no other country and group has ever officially cleared an 8-star dungeon before. After this, Gu sits at the table and calls Kim's name Kim in response answers. Yes madam sees this everyone there makes a jealous face and pouts. Then Prime Minister Gu tells Kim he is to pursue the Shield Guild's guild master hears this the general and army captain get up. One of them raises his voice asking them what will they do about the fire dragons remains the culprits are undoubtedly a group of rogue players. Then the other general stands beside him saying they could ask the other guilds for cooperation, but they need to be able to handle the situation on their own. However, the Prime Minister answered them she knew that they had no other choice and Captain Kim was only one person. Here's this, the general and army people their grit, then Prime Minister Gu adds her point saying he can't take care of two situations on his own. After this, the general asks them what will they do about the fire dragon's remains, and Gu answers that is why she specifically designated Captain Kim for this mission. Captain Kim will go after the guild master with the National Intelligence Agency, while the rest of the special dungeon control team track down the fire dragon remains with the military. Further, she says to keep this in mind these incidents are first-class national security emergencies that they need to solve independently without the assistance of any other guild. Here's this, one of the directors of National Intelligence asks if will Captain Kim be taking on the mission by himself. Then he says this is the SHIELD Guild's leader they are talking about, fighting the Guild Master on his own could be as he was about to complete his sentence. Gu adds her point, answering that is why she has called another person to help him. Hearing this, the military general and the officer of national intelligence murmur with each other after this, Prime Minister Gu clicks the phone button saying come in. However, the door opens and a lady agent Ju Ae Gu enters sees her the military generals, national intelligence people, and the director are surprised and stare at her. Ju Ae steps ahead and stands before Kim saying to him, it is a pleasure to meet him. Kim sits there silently looking toward her, and she stands before him slightly smiling saying she is Ju Ae Gu from the 1st Division of the National Counterintelligence Agency. However, the National Intelligence Director shouted asking Prime Minister Agent Gu was tasked with an important in Israel, how could she bring her there without any notice? Gu closed her eyes answering her apologies, but the matter was just too urgent one of the intelligence officers asked if this was truly the right decision. Assigning an ordinary agent to a mission like this could hinder Captain Kim's performance. Further, he asks if wouldn't it be better to have a player accompany him and drive the special dungeon control team into groups. However, Gu remains silent, and then the intelligence officer says allow him to explain. Then he explains asking does the name Tamer rings a bell to anyone there, then says during the Battle of Siangnam several citizens could not be rescued by the first generation but they were all transported to safety without any casualties by the hero famously known as Tamer. It was later found out that Tamer was only an 18-year-old girl, and after the dungeon break the government recognized her potential, and specially appointed her as an agent of the National Intelligence Agency ten years have passed since that incident. But Tamer is still actively serving the country as the greatest veteran in the National Intelligence Agency. However, she now goes by her given name Agent Ju Ae Kim. Hearing this, the general answered yes he remembered her now, she was the field commander of Siang Nam back, then she would always disappear whenever he tried to thank her. So, Agent Gu is the tamer, and they have no complaint then seeing that they have come to a mutual agreement. Here's this all Gu smiles asking let's start discussing the actual plan shall they? 
After this, in the briefing room, Kane explains to Kang everything that they discussed in the secret room hears this, and Kang jumps asking why he can't join him again. Kim answered they didn't have a choice, and he was counting on him to take care of everything. Here's this Kang presses his lower lip and bursts into tears, and then turns his head and pout, while Kim is looking behind him their agent is coming toward them. However, Agent Gu steps toward Kim calling her name Kim asks what happened, and she replies she has been looking for him. As both agents Gu and Kim stand before each other while Kang stands in between them with folding arms and pouting. After this, Agent Gu looks toward Kang and asks, and this is Kang turns his head and looks toward her. They both look into each other's eyes and their eyes glow. Kang quickly moves behind Kim and holds him back from his shoulder while Kim turns his head asking him what's the matter this isn't very polite of him. While Kang sitting behind Kim was staring at Agent Gu then Agent Gu coughed saying she didn't expect to find a playful child with Captain Kim. Also, Kang was looking to the side behind Kim with his hands on his shoulder and his mouth on his arm Agent Gu smiled further saying well, perhaps a child would not be the right term. Here's this, Kang looks toward Agent Gu surprisingly asks how she knows and Kim turns his head and looks toward Kang to press his lips. After this, in Area 15, meanwhile, on the prison island, no one has ever escaped the Sin Island. However, the soldier opens the prison door window and sends food inside, saying it's time for his meal for prisoner, No. 4882. The prisoner quickly pulls the tray of food inside, and the cabin window clangs the soldier looks through the bar window and clenches his teeth. However, prisoner No. 4882 was nobody else, but Tarim Park who was eating the food quickly like animals. Sees this, the soldier stands outside and says he sure has a good appetite. Even as a criminal, Tara munches the rice and gulps the whole food. Meanwhile, a group of people wearing the clock moves ahead toward the prison. Also, there was raining while Tara finishes the food and clangs the food tray on the ground. A flash of light falls there on the ground where that group of people stands. Sees those suspicious people, the soldiers point their guns toward them, asking to halt, stop right there, who are the people who identify themselves and will open fire. On the other side, Tarim burps, and on that group of people's side the lady wearing a clock smiles answering the soldiers they are from the Shield Guild. Here's this, the soldier gets surprised, and then the lady smiles and creates her spell charm saying she is the guild master and she has come to find her little brother. However, the siren starts ringing in the prison, and the soldiers raise their voices to stop them then more soldiers gather there and start shooting the culprit. While Urim creates the spell charm shield before her and her companions the bullets clang on the shield and fall to the ground, while the soldiers keep shooting and stepping toward them. On the other side, Urim created the spell charm with her hand and the whole prison caught fire while the soldier stood before Gat scared and sweaty. Asking how they even made it there then raised their voice informing the military base everyone had to pass dozens of checkpoints to reach the Sin Island. Further Urim created the spell charm smile saying well she is sure it depends on who the visitor is. Then with her index finger she created the circle spell charm where the soldier standing holding the gun. Sees that circle the Solider gets scared while Urim gives an evil smile saying now she needs all of them small fries to leave the stage. However they make a fist of her hand with her spell charm and throw the flame storm toward them they all burnt and thud on the ground away. The flame ends and the whole ground cracks where she created the spell charm. Also, the smoke emerges from the ground and Urim with her subordinates moves ahead toward the prison where Tarim his brother is locked. However, they enter the corridor and pass by the prisons there. She touches the iron bars with her hand and crashes it the dust and smoke spread there and she with her subordinate enter ahead. But as soon as they enter they find the player and stand there. One of the players looking toward Urim there says he can't believe she would go this far. Urim with an evil smile and red eyes answers step aside, if they don't want to die she will spare their life if they decide to back down. Hears this the player laughs and then Urim with her subordinates steps ahead toward them. However, the soldiers cluck their guns and one of the players wearing glasses raised his voice saying they fully expected her arrival and reinforced their defenses. As she can already tell her charm magic is nullified in this place and they even prepared their new battle drones the Jai 389. Even a grand sorcerer like her shouldn't be able to charm a machine hears this Urim laughs and creates her spell shield around her there. Then she smiled asking if he was done with his boring speech and the player with the orange clothes angrily pointed his finger toward her. 
However, the drones clunk and move toward Urum to defeat her spell magic, and while sending drones toward them the player raises his voice that's enough to bluff the guildmaster to surrender immediately. While Urum stands there loudly laughs and creates her spell charm there. On the other side Terum, after having his meal lays there on the ground and is sleeping with his hand on his stomach. Terum was snoring meanwhile, he heard the sound of crashing something outside that sound he woke up from sleep and quickly sat up there. After this sitting there in the prison he hears the sound of jumping cracking and crashing. Meanwhile, the prison door crashes he turns his head to look, and the body of a player with orange clothes crashes through the door. Moreover, the dust explosion occurred there due to the crashing of the prison door and Tarim sat there silently watching that explosion. From that explosion Urim with her subordinate gets there and sees her Tarim surprisingly says big sister. On the other side military helicopter arrived at the prison island, the island was destroyed due to the fire explosion. The helicopter landed on the ground and from that helicopter Kim and Agent Gu came out and they were surprised to see an explosion there. Also, the smoke spread all around. There is this agent. Gu says they expected her to come there, but then she quickly turns and orders he subordinates to search for any survivor and they answer yes madam. However, Agent Gu's subordinates move from there to search for the survivors and Kim stands ahead of her and asks the system if there are any survivors inside. System answers and the window appears before him. There are currently no survivors inside the building. Hearing this, Kim turned, informing Agent Gu there were no survivors. She was surprised and asked him how he knew about that. Kim looked aside, answering her he would explain the details later. First, let's head inside. Agent Gu nods, answering all right while thinking he is surprisingly hard to talk to. After this, both of them move ahead, but as soon as they enter the prison, they are surprised to see the soldier's corpse lying there on the ground. Also, the spell charm activated their seize this agent. Gu says the magic circles were fully operational and Kim adds his point, saying that a lesser one can't stop the greater strength. However, Agent Gu, looking toward the soldier corpses, says they were one step too late then. Kim stands and stares at her, asking where they should go now, and she replies she has a way to find that out. After this, Agent Gu creates the magic with her hand, and from that magic, a flash of light occurs. However, she releases the magic sparkle from her hand toward the ground. As soon as that magic sparkle falls on the ground, a bunch of rats gather near her. Moreover, she sat there on the ground on her feet, and that flash of magic spread near her in a circle, and the rats were gathered before her. Sees this, Kim gets surprised, and she sits there looks up toward him smiles saying don't be alarmed they are her friends. Further, Tamer Ju Aegu was gifted with the ability to befriend animals and plants this ability was extremely rare to find even among players. But she was capable of more than just commanding the animals, also the rat's eye started to glow, and in response, Kim nodded. Then he looks toward Agent Gu, and those rats ask the system what is she doing right now the system answers she is communicating with the animals, it's a mysterious ability. Hears this, Kim presses his lower lips inside thinking communicating with the animals is incredible. After this, she says Kim these children are telling her that the culprits commenced a horrible slaughter and then escaped the prison to head west. Further, she gets up saying to Kim they should start a new pursuit toward the west and that the guild master's deceptions might be powerful. But it can't deceive every eye that's watching her. However, Urim, with her subordinate, took Tarim from the prison outside. Tarim stood there, brushing his stomach, and asked her sister how she managed to come and find him. Further, he starts sweating and fearfully says Imizgu couldn't have just let her rescue him so easily. Here's this Urim calls Tarim's name he heads up asking her what, and she turns her eyes answering don't ever mention that name with an honorific in front of her again. That woman is an ungrateful traitor who stabbed them in the back. Tarim shudders node answering okay big sister, he won't do it ever again while thinking big sister has always resented MS Gu. Urim smiles answering him good that's her sweet little brother then she with her magic spell sets fire to the wood inside the iron tin. After this, Tarim asks her what are they going to do now, are they going to leave this country, and are they going to reassemble the S.H.I.E.L.D. guild? Here's this, Urim laughs and answers he will get to find out soon enough little brother. Tarim was speechless also he was scared then she turned and stepped toward her brother saying, but there is something they need to finish there before they begin. Further, she grits saying South Korea abandoned them when they risked their lives to protect it, and that the traitor even tried to have them all killed. 
and they have to punish them all this time they will finally rip Xiang Ronggu and her lackeys with their own hands Tarim. However, he answers he can't win a fight against South Korea, then he fearfully says no to that monster Jibong Kim's big sister. At the mention of Kim's name he started trembling then Yurim grabbed his muscles and stared at him saying her little brother had become a lot younger since the last time they met. Tarim fearfully says let's just leave this country big sister, if they end up going against that monster even as he is about to complete his sentence, she clenches his arm and Tarim in pain clenches his teeth. While thinking was she always this strong. Then she grabbed his both arms and clenched them saying listen Tarim, she is no longer who she used to be before and no one can stop her not even Sangrong Gu and Jibong Kim. Tarim fearfully looks toward her subordinate stands aside and looks toward her her eyes turn red and the mark on his body also turns red. After this, both of them move from there to outside the island prison where the birds are squawking over the sea. One of the hawks while squawking came and sat on Agent Gu's hand, also the bird's eyes were glowing when it sat on her hand. Further, she communicates with the hawk after informing her about the culprits the hawk flies away and she stands there thanks to the bird calling it her child. After this, she looks toward Kim telling him they must be hiding somewhere around there. Then they both move ahead, while on the way Kim asks her what she knows about the shield skilled master. She answered she was a terrifying individual Kim surprisingly asked, and she nodded then she turned her eyes and looked toward Kim explaining she was one of the earliest ones to awaken. Even among the first generation, she was stronger and crueler than anyone else. Moreover, she says she would stop at nothing to gain more power and kill the monsters in her path telling this Agent Gu starts to tremble. Then she grabbed her arm saying so many innocent lives were taken because of that. Kim surprisingly looked toward her silently and then asked how was someone like that had not convicted of her crimes already. Agent Gu looks toward the answer she guesses that's just how things were back then hears this Kim remain silent. After this, pointing ahead she says there's a warehouse complex on the western hill, they should go and check it out. However, both of them walking on foot arrive outside that farmhouse. As they both stand outside near the tress Kim asks her does she thinks they are there, and she stands beside the tree and answers yes. They can't hide from all the animals then Kim asked the system to search the area for any human activity system started initiating its search and then scanned the whole warehouse the system answered informing him about the group of people that were working there. Communicating with the system Kim stands there closes his eyes then opens his eyes and looks ahead telling Agent Gu 10 people are hiding inside the warehouse. The Shield Guild Master and Tarim Park hear this, she is surprised then Kim sits on the ground holding a stick. However, with this stick, Kim drew a block on the mud ground, and he made some small triangles saying he wished they could just charge straight into them. But they need to gain more information and reduce as many casualties as they can, so they will have to infiltrate the building from the right. Then she scratches the stick on the scribble that he draws on the ground to make her understand his plan. Further, he says where they are keeping the least amount of guards both Urim and Tarim Park stand inside the room while the guards stand there at a distance from each other outside that room. Both Kim and Ju Ae Gu were outside the warehouse and two guards stood there near the wall where Kim and Gu were. Kim makes the plan to kill both guards first to move toward both brother and sister explaining this, he tells her to get the job done quickly and effectively. Here's this all Gu gets surprised thinking she could only figure out the general number of the group. Then she asked herself how was he able to figure out their exact number and positions. Thinking this all she was staring at him and Kim sat there before her surprisingly looked toward her asking if there was something wrong she extended her hand and smiled answering no everything is fine. Here's this, Kim says alright then let's start moving then they both move ahead toward the warehouse. Both of them jump over the wall and enter as soon as they jump a guard gets there asking who goes there both of them get alert. However, the guard angrily takes out his sword from the sword holder belt and clanks it while Kim stands there looking toward the guard there said he guessed this was to be expected, and she answered she guessed so. The guard clenched his teeth saying they must leave immediately this place is out of bounds then the other guard and his companion also joined him. However, both of the guards holding their swords move toward them and see Agent Gu quickly stand before Kim opens arms and says let her take care of this. Kim silently stands behind her, then she pinches with her hand, while the guards angrily jump toward them while she snaps the pinch. They both arrived near them to attack them with their sword, but before they attacked a magic cat appeared there from Gu Pinch and attacked the guards. 
See this Kim surprisingly asks is that a cat she replies there were a lot of friendly children by the port. Both guards fearfully fall backward on the cracked ground while the magic cat moves toward them hissing. Agent Gu creating the spell with her hand says to let her show him what a tamer is capable of. On the other side, Kang with his team members and military soldier goes to his mission to find the fire dragon remains. He sits on the ground and sniffs the floor sees him sniffing vice captain surprisingly asks rookie if is he sure he knows what he is doing. Also, the military soldier stands there sees him sniffing laughs Kang heads up and looks toward the vice captain answering yes the fire dragon has a distinctive smell. Then pointing ahead Kang smiles saying they just need to keep going this way hearing the military soliter surprisingly look toward Kang. Kim's team member the guy with orange hair scratches his head saying it might look weird but he does get things done sir. The military soldier turned his head answering. He heard the man they were heading in that direction prepare himself, and in response the orange-haired guy remained silent and smiled, while the vice captain scratches his head and Kang rubs his nose. However, in the warehouse the magic cat attacks the guards and crashes them on the ground the guards thud and fall away while the magic cat keeps scratching them. Meanwhile, more guards get there and the cat crashes them one by one cracking and thudding them onto the ground, and the dust explosion occurs there sees this both brother and sister get there while the guards are severely injured. Looking toward the injured guards Tarim gets scared while Urim angrily looks toward that dust explosion. Because of that explosion Kim, Agent Gu, and the cat shadow appeared as soon as the dust smoke ended and they came out. Sees them Tarim fearfully asks Jibong Kim and Ju Ae Gu and Urim stands beside Tarim says she hasn't heard from her in 10 years so she assumes she is dead but she is glad that she is still alive Ju Ae Gu. However, Gu asks her did she expects her to be grateful for that, and in response, Yurim stares at her and sticks out her tongue. Then she gives an evil smile considering Gu is a snake, then asks did she has already forgotten what she said. Yurim screamed at Gu telling her to never say her name again, and the sound of her scream was so loud they all put their hands on their ears except Kim. Also, due to her loud voice the windows of the warehouse were broken and Kim stood there silently rubbed his little finger in his ear and pressed his lower lip. Moreover, Urim takes out a recall stone and tightly grabs it in her hand, saying her don't falter herself she is only glad to see her alive. Then she lifted her hand and stared at the stone smile, saying that she wanted to be the one to kill her and Siang Rongu. See that recall stone in her hand agent Gu shouts asking a recall stone they have to stop her then she orders her cat to stop her. The magic cat jumps hissing and extending its claws to attack her. But before the cat attacks them their guards get before them to save them from the cat's attack. However, their guards throb and turn themselves into monsters then move toward the angry cat and support it. The cat gets extremely injured and screams seeing this agent Gu gets shocked while Kim silently stands there looking toward those monsters thinking they are the same monsters that they found in the dungeon. Meanwhile, Urim with her spell charm creates the spell circle and laughs telling her to come and stop her all she wants, but she will have to get through those monsters first. After this, the monster jumps to attack Agent Gu, but before the monster attacks her Kim activates his physical enhancement skill and jumps toward Gu to save her. A bright light spreads before her and she puts her hands before her face while Kim splits the monster in his one blow. Sees this, Tarim stands there fearfully looking toward his sister call out her name while Kim flies in the air making his powerful fist move toward Urim. Sees him coming toward them so fast that she smiles and creates the spell barrier before her, Kim's bright light spreads there and he punches that barrier with all his might. Kim's hand crackled only the one layer of that barrier while she extended her hand and stood on the other side of that spell barrier. Kim's hand clanged with her hand and her eyes opened in surprise while Kim standing in the air clenched his teeth, also his eyes turned red. However, a huge light explosion occurs and that spell light goes upward the roof of the warehouse cracks and both Urim and Tarim with that spell fly away. However, Kim's light explosion occurs and the dust and smoke spread there and the ground where both brother and sister stood gets cracked with the spell. Kim looked up toward the roof from where that flew away in that spell, then he looked toward his hand and pressed his thumb and moved his arm thinking that strange it felt like he hit something there. Then he clenched his fist saying they got away and Agent Gu stood behind her answer, she even prepared a recall stone, they must be up to something, and this could be a big problem. Also, that injured cat lying there on the floor was screaming Kim turned and looked toward her answering her, 
but they couldn't have gotten too far with a recall stone. Then he looks ahead saying let's keep pursuing them and then they both move from there. On the other side in Sihyung, Gyeonggi province a bright spell of light fell on the roof of a building, and from that spell, both brother and sister landed on the building's roof. Also, the place where the spell circle created the dust and smoke spread Urim sat there on that spell circle in shock while Tarim stood there silently looking toward his sister. Urim stared at her hand on which Kim punched through that spell barrier and huffed thinking that man managed to break through her defense in that split second. Also, her hand was injured and her fingers were twitched, and she stood there in shock vomiting blood. See this, Tarim worriedly calls his sister's name asking her, if is she alright she wipes her mouth with her hand answering she is fine. Then she turned her head and looked toward his brother's smile saying this was nothing compared to the pain he had to go through Tarim. Tarim worriedly answers her, but she should still get some treatment and in response, she shakes her head and then smiles asking him to go and get some rest he must be exhausted. She will call him again soon Tarim remains silent and looks down with a scared face. Then answered okay sister then he stepped ahead opened the room door and entered but still he was scared. While Urim turns and steps ahead and moves from there to the and stands up on the roof of the building edge she looks down toward the people and then says show himself. Meanwhile a black aura spreads at her backside and from that aura the director of the shield guild James Lee appears saying his greetings guildmaster. She turned her eyes angrily asking why have he shown up so late the director stood beside the wall opened his arms smiled answer, he had been preparing to make things easier for her. The mercenaries have successfully stolen the fire dragon's remains and they are assembling their forces in this city. After this he put the cigarette in his mouth saying none of these things could have been done had he revealed himself. She turns her hand and angrily looks toward the director saying his habit of making excuses hasn't changed. The director adds his point, saying but it seems like she has become much more powerful, madam. However, Urim stood with her back to him asked did he thought she was just fooling around, while she was gone the director answered of course not. Also, he is aware that she would do anything to become a stronger guildmaster, while Urim angrily answers him that's enough of his nonsense, and then asks to tell her what he knows about Kim. Here's Kim's name the director squeezes his eyes and sighs explaining, he suddenly appears nowhere without any sign or indications. Here's this, Urim twitch then the director says they tried to recruit him, but ultimately failed so they recognized him as a threat and tried to eliminate him. But that turned out to be a disaster as she already knew, and he tried to find out more about him, but all they could find was that he had been missing for 10 years and that his family had also gone missing in a dungeon break, except for his mother who is currently in a state of coma. Here's this Urim asks does he has any connections with Seongryong Gu the director holding the cigarette in his mouth answers they have no special connections. Urim adds her point by saying that can't be true everyone in this world is driven by money and power he must have some sort of a connection with Seongryong Gu. That wicked hag must have offered him something that stood there on the edge of the building roof, she created her spell storm saying but none of that matters now. However, with her magic power, she created a huge spell circle over that area in the city people stood there in the street and rode surprisingly looking up toward that bright light. Moreover, as soon as people look up they all become status with her spell, while standing up she laughs saying she will finally show everyone. What happens when the country she served to protect decides to abandon her, then holding the spell circle she says, and it's time to begin. On the other side, Kang with his subordinates was in search of the thieves they all were in the car on the roadside. However, on the way Kang was sniffing while looking out of the car window he pointed ahead saying the scent was leading in that direction. Here's this, the vice captain and other team members remain silent, the guy with orange hair asks would the thieves have gone to the city. The other team member sitting beside him in the back seat asks, if isn't it more likely for them to hide inside the mountain here's, this Kang smirks answering well his nose is never wrong. Also, the military vehicle was following behind their car, and while on the way the wireless phone rang. The vice captain clicks the button to get the call there, the military captain says good grief, he is not exactly a tracking dog. This is nonsensical of them to track them down by smell, they are living in the 21st century for goodness sake. Here's this, the vice captain holding the wireless phone squeezes his eye and asks them he apologize, but could they give them a little more time? The military captain angrily replies this is ridiculous Kang was looking out of the car window and the military vehicle was behind their car. 
While on the way Kang turned his head and shouted to stop the car the vice captain broke the car immediately and the car tire screeched on the road. Kang jumps out of the car window and sees the military captain from his call order the military unit through wireless phone all units move out of the vehicle. Following the special dungeon control team, the military soldiers get out of their vehicle holding the guns spread on the road. Further, the military captain stands behind and asks, why would the fire dragon's remains ever be hidden in a place like this, there are way too many people in this area, this is unbelievable. Meanwhile, the thieves run toward the military captain from his backside, while the captain stands there and says they need to give him a promotion soon. As he was about to complete his sentence meanwhile, he felt someone running toward him from his backside. He turns his head to look, and he gets scared to see two culprit wearing masks on their faces jump to attack him with a knife. But before they attack him Vice Captain creates the barrier shield with his magic and attacks them and thuds them away on the road. However, both of them crash and the Vice Captain stands before the Captain creating magic sees this the Captain is shocked. After this, both the culprits get up and the Vice Captain looking toward them says it looks like they are at the right place. However the dungeon control team and military surround them from all sides and some of the thieves are hiding in the roofs of the houses with their weapons. Kang swiped his hand on his nose and smiled saying he told him his nose always right then looking toward the culprit he activated his power and cracked his fists saying prepare themselves they thieves. However, the vice captain with his subordinates attacked the thieves meanwhile the thieves hiding on the roof set their signs to shoot them. But before they shoot them Kang attacks them with his magic and falls them away. Sees this, the army captain stands on the road surprised, and he surprisingly thinks he didn't think they would be reliable without Captain Kim, but they are much stronger. Then what he has heard about them he asks himself is this the true power of the special dungeon control team. The vice captain and his subordinates injured those thieves some of them injured lying on the road while two of them bent down before the vice captain accepted their defeat. The vice captain stands before them with his subordinates abusing them, then one of the thieves angrily looks toward the vice captain. Further vice captain asks them if are they Korean meanwhile the orange haired guy pointing toward the thieves says wait look at those tattoos on their wrists. They must be the remembers of the shield guild, hears this vice captain angrily looks toward the thieves and says so this is where they are. While the thief laughs saying it makes him sick looking at how proud he is then he asks that he has some self defense lessons and something. Further, he laughs saying they are nothing without Kim hears this vice captain angrily look toward him and remains silent. However, the vice captain angrily asks him if he wants to know what they learned the thief heatedly looks toward the vice captain asking what. Vice captain kicks and squeaks him on the road saying he is almost ashamed to learn that they are from the same country. The military soldiers stood before the thieves pointing their guns toward them. Further vice captain asked how could a citizen of South Korea join hands with these criminals to terrorize their nation. Here's this, Taekwondo laughs asking if he thinks he has won already don't he the vice captain looking toward him clenches his teeth. Taekwondo fumbles and takes out something from the pocket, then holding that thing in his hand he looks toward the vice captain and says don't falter themselves. Because they are not the ones being captured there they are being captured by them. Here's this vice captain and the orange haired guy surprisingly looks toward him. However, Taekwondo and his companion injected that thing in their neck their bodies started to throb and they gained more power and their bodies got way bigger. Sees this, the military soldier and the dungeon control team get surprised then one of the military soldiers sacredly looks toward them asking why their bodies just got way bigger. However, the thieves with their red eyes and large bodies step toward them abuse, then they jump to attack the vice captain saying they will crash them. While the vice captain and the orange haired guy silently stood there looking at them coming toward them. But before they attack them Kang attacks them with his magic kicks them and crashes them away and then he jumps down on the road. Kang turned his head and looked toward the vice captain ask was he interfering with them he was wondering why they were just standing there. Meanwhile, the dungeon control team activates their magic power Kang says, but he guessed they were already prepared. However, the vice captain creates his power by asking the orange hairs guy well, did he think those druggies would intimidate them they have had years of experience with the dungeon. The orange haired guy looking toward those thieves answers those men are punching bags compared to the monster they have fought. But those people have a weird scent mixed in with a regular smell of humans then, Kang stands beside them and makes his point, asking them if they should just annihilate them. 
while the military soldier stands there listening to their conversation thinks he is just talking about murder with such an innocent face. The vice captain answers Kang know they have to capture them alive to find out who is behind this, then he orders his team to arrest them. Then they all run toward them to arrest them. On the other side in Yui's studio, she sitting on a chair was recording the stream. She while recording winked saying her Yumi hours, as they all may know is doing a collaboration stream with the famous Metaber Jinda. Hearing this, the people in the chat room started texting as they all were very excited to see Yui and Jinda's collaboration. Further, she asks the viewers if are they all looking forward to it. Then says Yui's excited too then she waves her hand and looks toward the camera and says alright Yumi hours, that'll be it for today's stream until next time see them again. Everyone as she was about to click the streaming end button when her subscriber didn't want her to end the stream. She clicked the end button side and sat there on the chair. She took tongs then checked her mobile phone and was surprised to see Jinda hadn't answered her calls since yesterday. Then she clicks Jinda's contact name in the list to dial his number thinking they still have so much to talk about the collaboration. This was bad then she dialed his number and in return, the system informed him the number she had called was currently unavailable. Here's this, she taps the phone on the table, and then with a sad face she asks herself really, she is just going to be ghosted like this. Further, she asks herself who even does that after committing to a collaboration, then she asks her cat the right kitty, and in response, her cat sits there on the pillow on the ground and makes a voice. Then she angrily jumps from the chair saying she will have to visit them. On the other side, the dungeon control team beats the thieves and gets them injured and the military soldier handcuffs their hands while the dungeon control team stands beside the military captains watching this. Then the military captain looks toward those thieves thanks to the vice captain for arresting them further, he says these handcuffs are made from a special alloy. It's strong enough to restrain most players so it should be more than enough for these men. After this, the vice captain holds that object that those thieves injected and thinks, but what in the world is this thing? Meanwhile, the military soldier from behind calls the commander, both commander and vice captain turn their head to look, and he informs them that they have found the truck. However, the military captain his soldier and the dungeon control team move toward the place where they hide the truck. The truck was empty and its back door was open see this, the commander says he thought they finally managed to find the remains. Then he asks does they have to beat the information out of those criminals. The vice captain answered requesting the commander to take those terrorists back to the joint headquarters commander their team will continue searching for the stolen remains. Here's this the commander asks him does he has a plan in mind vice captain turns his eyes looks toward the commander and sighs. Then he turns his eyes and looking toward the commander points back toward Kang answering it might be a little crude, but they will go back to employing the method they can trust. Here's this, Kang smiles and rubs his nose and the commander squeezes his eyes and remains silent. However, in the five-star dungeon Killa's Swamp Chin was killing the monsters, a huge monster holding its sword stands there, and Chin twirls his weapon then attacks the monster and splits it. Sees this more monster get there holding their sword, while Chin's head down is twirling his weapon. Thinking no then he runs toward the monsters and slices them with his weapon. Chin while splurting the monster recalls the time when he was in a dungeon with Yui and Kim, and their Kim broke that shield barrier with his arm. Remembering that time Chin pressed his lower lips, thinking this wasn't how it felt. Meanwhile, five-star boss kill a monster with multiple hand, holding swords gets there from behind the tree side roaring. As the monster roared the dust and smoke spread there due to its roaring loud voice. Chin holding his weapon and knives ran toward that monster. While the monster roared and screeched its swords Chin jumped toward the monster twirling his knives and slicing it. However, after slicing the monster Chin with his red eyes jumps down and the monster's boss body parts splatter on the ground. Chin stood there still remembering that time and clenched his teeth thinking no this isn't it the power felt overwhelming back then. Meanwhile, his two subordinates, one with brown hair and one with black hair get there from behind calling his name Chin stands there with his back to them, then one of them with brown hair asks him, he seems even fiercer than the last time they saw him. Is there something in his mind Chin clunk and answer no it's nothing. Then he turns and steps toward them to see him in that angry state both of them get scared. Then Chin grabbed brown hair's guy's neck and clenched it with his arm asking didn't tell him not to bother him as he had forgotten his order already. 
sees this, the guy with black hair shouts in fear, while Nekchin clenching answers no they have just come to report that they have lost contact with some of their guild members recently. Here's this, Chen surprisingly asks what with their guild members, the brown hair guy holding Chen's arm winked answering yes, and what's strange is that they all reside in Sihyun, and they were supposed to go on a raid together, but none of them have replied to them. Here's this, Chen asks him did all of them go missing simultaneously, and he hardly replies yes sir because his neck is being clenched. However, Chen released his neck asking that it was strange how could they lose contact with all of them at once, while that brown hair guy standing behind him was pressing his neck. Further, Chen says he was so preoccupied with conquering the dungeon that he forgot to take care of them, all hears this both of them nod fearfully. After this, Chen orders them alright, let's go together to Sihyun. However, Kim called the lab doctor at the warehouse where he killed the monster the lab doctor was clinking the picture of the monster's corpse. Kim and Agent Gu stand aside watching this all, Gu chews her thumbnail, then she looks toward Kim and says Yuram won't just back down like this. Here's this, Kim surprisingly looks toward her, then he thoughtfully says she is probably also responsible for the stealing of the fire dragon remains. Agent Gu answers him yes, they must have used firearms to hide their identities as players, but she does not doubt that Yuram was involved in all of this. Kim looks toward her asking, but if that was the case shouldn't they have taken the carcass abroad by now? Agent Gu shakes her head and closes her eyes answering it must be impossible to teleport across countries, she thinks that's why Yuram entered Korea through an airport instead of just teleporting there. Besides, even if she found a way to teleport out of the country teleporting the fire dragon's remains would be near impossible because of its immense mana. According to the report of the National Intelligence Service, Here's this, Kim answers her, they must be planning to use the fire dragon's remains somehow. Moreover, Agent Gu surprisingly tells Kim she just received a call from the NIS saying the same thing. However, Ju Ae Gu's explanations left a question in Kim's mind, why did they steal the fire dragon's remains in the first place? Despite its incredible value, they don't have enough time and space to claim anything with the carcass in South Korea. Only one thing was certain about this Kim pondered deeply. The Arabians had turned into a monster-like appearance, as if they were half-human and half-monster the amalgams in the nameless dungeon were closer to a monster than a human. But the Arabians kept more of their human appearance. Moreover, Kim's mobile phone rang he took out it from his pants pocket to check if it was a call from HWI Kang. Kim picked up the call asking yes what is it Kang answered he found it Kim surprisingly asked what he meant and Kang answered he had found out where the bandits were. Also, the dungeon control team was in the car and the vice captain was driving the car very fast and Kang was shouting on the phone with his face out of the car window. Kang put the phone in his ear and raised his voice telling them to look it over there, while on Kim's side, he due to that loud voice pulled the phone away from his ear and put it back scolding Kang he couldn't see where that was. Then Kim asks him to put the vice captain on the line and Kang pouts answering okay, then he gives the phone to the vice captain. The vice captain put the phone to his ear saying yes, captain he is on the phone now Kim asked him the location where they are heading. Vice captain answered they are not exactly sure yet, but it seems to be around Sihyun and Jonggi, and they are currently moving toward the location sir. Kim answered all right he will head over there as well the vice captain answered yes sir then the call ended. Agent Yui stood behind Kim and stared at his phone asking was a call from that child Kim turned his head asking what she knew about Kang Agent Gu. She coughs answering she is not sure how she should put this, but he probably shouldn't trust him too much. And that's all she can't tell him for now, and she thinks they should go to the location he mentioned and try to find any traces of Yurim Kim answers all right. On the other side, the lab doctors were clicking the monster's corpse picture, suddenly the monster started to squirm seeing this, the lab doctor was shocked, and surprisingly put his hand on his mouth. Moreover, the monster gets up and hits the lab doctor, and follows him away this other lab doctor gets scared and shouts. Further, the monster's body starts getting bigger and it roars and moves toward the lab doctor to kill them. But before the monster attacks them Kim activates his physical enhancement skill and attacks the monster and splits it. However, the monster's body splatters on the ground while the lab doctors in surprise look up toward the body parts that were falling and put their hands over their faces. After splattering the monster Kim jumped down and turned his eyes to look toward Agent Gu saying he must have missed a spot since they were in a hurry how bothersome. Then he asked her now should they get going she was surprisingly looking toward him and then nodded. 
On the other side, Urim with her spell charm was controlling that whole area people of that area due to her spell became status. Urim stood up was watched down her folded arms her cloak was fluttering due to the strong wind and the machine beside her began injecting something. Soon after four flashes of light occur behind her in lane and from that flash the former official of Shield Guild land. Four of them call her master she turns and looks toward them saying her faithful servants. Four of them were sitting down behind her one of them with gray hairs was ex-Shield Guild Chief Security Teriok Kim. The other one with black hair was ex Shell Guild Special Forces Captain Minciok Kang Third one was the Lady ex Shield Guild Magic Team 1 Captain Mai Ae Sin. The fourth one was the ex Shield Guild Science and Technology Team Captain Hudiok Park and he was laughing without any reason also the saliva was flowing from his mouth. However, Teriok bending his head squeezes his eyes saying her orders have all been fulfilled master and they await her next command. Hears this, she smiles then turns her head saying excellent job, this couldn't have been done without their hard work, and she expected no less from the terrorizers of their guild. Further, she says she knows that they all didn't mean to abandon her brother and run away. Hearing this they get surprised, and Teriok answers of course not the guild master. They were all biding their time, waiting for her inevitable return hears this, she answered yes of course. After this, she threw four injected items toward them Teriok asked her what these masters she jumped before them ordering her to inject them. Then looking toward those injected items, she says those things will lead with to the new world. Here's this four of them remain silent and sweat. Then head up and grab those items and inject them as soon as they inject their bodies start to get bigger, and they get more powerful and their eyes start to glow. Sees this, Urim laughs her eyes turn red, and she says them now they will be reborn with this incredible power to transcend into a greater being instead of the garbage they were before none of the old human race shall stand against them. Then she opens her arm laugh saying rejoice and cherish these new blessing of their syndicate hype. While the four of them were shouting in pain also their body was getting bigger and more powerful. However, Urim saying this all laughs also her saliva drips from her mouth, and she while laughing says this will be their reckoning. Then looking toward the machine that was injecting behind them, she says they will create a legion with the fire dragon's remains and destroy this country that has forsaken them. They will clean this land of their enemies and build a new world controlled by hype, while her four subordinates' bodies were changed and due to pain they were shouting and Teriok's mouth was releasing saliva. Moreover, Terum was watching this all hiding behind the wall, and he surprisingly asked himself what is this thing hype? On the other side, Yui was in the taxi she was on her way to meet Jinda, and she was continuously dialing his number. But he didn't pick up the phone, and she scrolled the mobile screen herself, she wondered what was going on Jinda had never cut off contact like this before. Then with a sad face, she says she hopes that it's not a big deal the taxi driver hearing this glances at her asking hasn't seen her somewhere. Here's this, Yui slightly moves ahead from the seat and laughs, asking does he knows who is she, also she still has a lot to improve, but she guesses people recognize Yui the Metaber. Here's this, the taxi driver smiles, asking what tuber now as he is not very familiar with those kinds of stuff, he must have mistaken her for someone else. However, Yui laughs answering she sees well, it happens to the best of them while thinking how embarrassing. Further, the taxi driver says her he and his son were saved by this girl six years ago in Tijumbi Park, he just thought she had a striking resemblance to her heard this Yui slightly react then she smiled. After this, she taps on her heart pendant and a flash of light emerges their taxi driver turns his head to look back. Yui takes out her cat from her inventory and smiles showing him the cat saying the one who saved his son back then was this little friend of hers. The cat takes Tong and creates her voice, after they arrive at their destination, the taxi driver screeches the car Yui holding the money extends her hand to pay the fare and thanks him for the ride. Sees this taxi driver's hand start shaking, and he smiles saying it's fine, this is the least he can do for the person who has saved his life. Yui smiled answering she appreciated it, but she only did what she thought was right back then, and he has taken her quite far today. The taxi driver smiled and held her hand saying well, let's just leave it at a handshake then, and feel free to call him whenever she needs another ride, he will give her his business card. However, in response, Yui smiles thinking she is not sure if she should accept this, and then the taxi driver goes back to his taxi. Further, the taxi driver looked through the window saying her taken care of, and that she should reach downtown Sihyung by walking way. 
Yui looks toward him through the taxi window and smiles answering all right thank him he takes care of himself as well. After this, Yui places her cat on her shoulder and moves from there on the way to the street. She says to her cat well, she is glad to know that they are doing well, she too right in response, the cat creates its voice. Then looking ahead with a surprised face she thinks, but she does find it a little strange that the street is empty on a weekend. She was surprised then she looked in the cafe mirror door and thought something was not right she looked around her in the street but there was no one. See this she ran away from there to check the surrounding area while on the way she noticed that ashes were falling from the sky. Yui with a scared face looks up toward the sky thinking something is falling from the sky and when she looks ahead she is shocked to see people there in the street around her turn into monsters. However, in the military base control room, the military soldiers were checking the live camera of all the areas of the city, also the captain stood beside them. As soon as they checked the main area of the city they were shocked to see the situation, and one of them raised his voice saying sir there is an unidentified flying object. It is flying at much speed toward the city see this, the captain in shock raises his voice to verify its identity immediately. However, the military solider starts checking the city, but suddenly the signal disappears the captain panicked steps ahead and extends their head toward the system asking if is there an error. The officer of the control room turned his head answering, he was not very sure sir then the other officer sat beside him before the system informed its back on the radar sir. Hearing this, the captain turned his head toward the system before that officer, the officer tapped something on the keyboard and searched it again saying they would track down and identify the UFO right away. However, the system started the search again, but the signals dropped again. See this, the captain raises his voice asking what are they serious how is that even possible the officer fearfully answers he is sorry sir, but that's what the radar is telling them. Moreover, the captain closed his eyes and held his head asking where was its last identified location. The officer after a minute of searching answered the UFO was last seen in Jonggi around Sihyung Sir. After this, both Kim holding Agent Gu flew over to the city to arrive at the location. On the other side Yui was shocked to see the people around were turning into monsters. Further, those monsters around her start to squirm sees this, she surprisingly thinks what in the world are these things. Meanwhile, the object that was falling from the sky hit her face as soon as it hit that ashes-like object turned into the way light. As that object hit her face she was surprised thinking her automatic shield just activated. However automatic shield it's a defensive spell that automatically protects the user from any sudden attacks, the spell was created to help mages defend themselves against ambushes and is an essential ability for high-ranking mages Yui extends her hand to check those objects ahead like objects fall on her hand. She looks up at those objects and thinks she sees this shining dust that must be turning people into monsters. After this, Yui runs away from there thinking, is it a dungeon break? No, then the government should have known about this. While running away she thinks there must be a source of this magic, somewhere she has to find it. Further, on the way in the street, she finds a little boy running also the monster is running behind him. Yui ran toward the boy to save him from the monsters, shouting little boy come back the boy turned his head to look back. On Kim's side as he was on his way the window appeared before him that one minute until he arrived in Sihyung. Kim holding her flies in the air so fast that she puts her hands over her face, he moves quickly from one place to another in the air and finally, they arrive at their destination. As Kim landed on the ground a stormy light spread there and due to their landing there the dust and smoke spread there. Kim put her down and she hardly stood up on her own Kim looked toward her asks if she was alright she squeezed her eyes answering yes of course. She had never flown across the sky like that before then she got up and smiled brushing her messy hair saying but she was glad they could get there quickly they didn't have a second to waste. After this, both of them stand there Kim gets normal, but his hair is still shiny gray, and he looking ahead presses his lower lips and Agent Gu stares at him. Further, they both move from there while on the way Agent Gu says, it's interesting to know that his hair changes color hears this Kim remains silent. And she stepped ahead with Kim thinking she guessed he was ignoring her. However, a window appears before Kim and the system informs him that an anomaly has been detected in the city. Here's this, Kim surprisingly asks an anomaly while Agent Gu stands behind him looking toward him and asks pardon her Kim turns his head and waves his hand answering no it's nothing. Then stepping ahead he asked the system to go on and in response another window appeared before him and it was written on the window an immense amount of mana was flowing inside the city. 
There is an awareness impairment spell spread throughout the city. There is a charming spell spread throughout the city. Here's this. Kim stops there in the street, saying it seems that Urim Park is there. Agent Gu turns her head, asking him how he knows. After this, Kim says to her they should hurry then Kim steps ahead while she silently stands there and doesn't move. Then after thinking for a while she also runs away after him and the window appears before Kim that they are initiating resistance against status effects. However, that shiny object was falling from the sky Kim silently kept stepping ahead and the window appeared before him that he was now immune from the status effect agent Gu saw that shiny object and was surprised. After this, in the way Agent Gu tightly holds her nose and fills her mouth thinking of intoxication. Then from her coat's inner pocket, she takes out the potion bottle and drinks it. While Kim stood aside and watched her doing this all silently after drinking that potion bottle she threw the bottle down. However, this was the immunity potion upon consumption. The potion provides resistance to magical effects for 24 hours. Moreover, both of them arrive at the rodeo area and stand there they are both shocked to see those humans who were turned into monsters. Sees them, Agent Gu surprisingly asks what on earth are those things Kim looking toward that humans who are turning into monsters and asks the system to analyze them. System answer initiating analysis, the system starts analyzing those monsters and informs Kim they are human beings infected by an unknown magic. They are being transformed into a human-monster hybrid and he can stop the transformation by destroying the source of magic inside the city. Agent Gu stood behind Kim asks him if should they get rid of them he answered no those things are still human right now. They have to handle this without confronting them before the situation gets worse. However, both of them run away between those monsters while running away Kim asks the system to locate the source of magic. The system starts initiating its search and then tells him the awareness impairment spell is too powerful and he must move to a higher location. However, Kim activates his physical enhancement skill and flies from there saying to her he would be right there sees this while running away and surprisingly looks toward him asking what Mr. Kim is. Kim carried himself with his magic and flew from their upside, he quickly crossed the building on his way and then he jumped from one building to another in a second. Moreover, a lot of monsters were in his way, and the monsters looking toward him flew toward them laugh, saying they told them that a rat might show up. Then the other monster sticks out its sticky long tongue, saying he has a lot of guts to come there alone. Kim doesn't listen to them, and keeps flying as Kim flies through them, they all jump and surround him to attack saying something when a person's talking to him. Further, the monster moves toward him and blocks his way one of the monsters strikes its sharp arm to attack him, but before it attacks him. Kim kicks one of them and throws it toward the building the monster crashes into the building and explodes. However, more monsters got there and moved toward Kim to attack him he was surrounded by the monsters kicking the second and third monsters and killing them. Kim attacks them one by one and splits them all and the blood from those monsters bodies scatters in the air. After killing those monsters Kim flies and moves away while on the way he jumps from the building and kills the monster gets in his way he splatters them all. After this he jumps on the building roof and stands up there, he asks the system to locate Urim Park and the source of this magic. The system initiates its search while Urim stands up on the building's roof edge, understanding that Kim has arrived there near her. She gives an evil smile saying that he has finally arrived Jibong Kim. The system was still searching for the nearby mana source. It took enough time while Kim stood there on the roof asking the system what was taking it so long and in response system remained silent. After searching for a while system replies the awareness impairment spell is too powerful and the anomaly of this area is most likely undetectable to those outside of the city. Further system explains to him that neither the police nor the army will come to assist him. While this spell is active hearing this Kim remains silent. While searching when the system informs him multiple mana sources detected this, Kim is surprised. On the other side, the machine behind Yuimur was still injecting and she stood there at the edge of the building roof. The system searched and informed Kim currently, there is currently one main supply unit, and this supply sector was the machine that was injecting behind Urim. Then another window appeared and the system informed four auxiliary supply units in the area, and these supply sectors were set at different locations in the city. Here's this, Kim clenches his fist and asks the system to mark them on the map, he will destroy them immediately. System answer, he is afraid that's impossible the main mana supply unit can only be damaged by destroying the four auxiliary supplies simultaneously. 
However, Kim grits then another window appears before him that if the auxiliaries are attacked by any other means they will automatically be repaired. Here's this Kim thinks how annoying the system tells him he has detected several individuals who are not under the charm's influence, and these individuals are Agent Gu, the dungeon control team, Yui and Chen with his team. Also, they were in that area too and heard this Kim side and pressed his lips saying great timing. After this, he flies and jumps on the building roof, then he flies from there to upward further flying from there, he lands down and crashes in the area where Agent Gu is. As he landed the ground crashed and the flash of bright light spread their agent Gu extended her hand over her face. Also, due to Kim landing there dust and smoke spread and from that smoke, Kim came out to see him she smiled saying he never ceased to surprise her Mr. Kim. Moreover, Kim remains silent and then asks her if there's somewhere they need to go agent Gu surprisingly asks where. He answers he has found a location where they can stop all of this. On Yui's side, she was running behind that little kid the kid went into the store, she slammed the store door calling the little boy. But as she slammed the door people stood there got alert and stepped toward her wearing masks and holding sticks also that little boy went to her mother who sat there. However, that lady hugs her son and angrily asks Yui, who is she Yui hands up fearfully and answers, they don't have to be so worried she is not a bad person to everyone. Then she asks them does anyone recognizes who she is people there stare at her and remain silent. Then she taps her pendant and a flash of light emerges from it from her pendant inventory, she takes out her selfie stick and lifts it smile saying they see she is an internet streamer. One of the men among those people who removed his mask tried to recognize Yui and then a lady standing behind them wearing a mask said she thought she had seen her on Metaber. Further, the man standing beside the lady says he thought he had seen her on TV Yui smiled and thanked them all for recognizing who she also started recording. While recording she says that she wants to ask all of them what exactly happened to this city. The lady with the sad face took her child in her arms and answered they don't know people started turning weird a few days ago and now it's come to this. Yui asked, but how is everyone there still unaffected the lady answered the red powder in the air right now it seemed like the powder was causing everyone to transform. Here's this, Yui thinks as she expected the red powder was what started all this the mutations were probably caused by the red powder entering the people's bodies. But everyone there in the store was wearing a mask that must have protected them from being affected. Also, the man among those people was coughing the people were surprisingly looking at him. After this, who removed his mask to recognize Yui asked her if the rescue team must be on their way right Yui smiled answering of course, there was no need to be so scared. Saying this, she thinks no they couldn't have deployed a rescue team with this awareness impairment spell, then she taps on her recording device and thinks this is a big problem. However, her device stopped recording due to the internet connection failure Yui tapped on her device screen thinking she needed to find a way to inform the people outside. Further, the people in the store get scared and fearfully staring at Yui's backside because the monster gets there and they are trying to break the door and get inside. Yui stood there silently looking toward those people in the store meanwhile, those monsters crackled the door and entered. See this, Yui stands between those people and monsters looking toward those people and raising her voice everyone gets out of there quickly. Then she taps on her inventory pendant and gets out her magic stick her magic stick attacks those monsters with a shock wave and falls away. After throwing those monsters away she with a sad face head down saying she is sorry for everyone she knows that it must hurt. But it shouldn't have caused any fatal injuries. After this, she stood there turned her head looking toward those people she raised her voice everyone grabbed a mask to cover themselves and ran to the other building. Those people move away from there meanwhile, a car crashes there before Yui turns her hand and looks toward the car. From the back of the car, a huge monster roaring gets there and sees that huge monster Yui's mouth opens in surprise, and she surprisingly asks who's this meatloaf. The monster stood before Yui and laughed telling her the little rat, then it clenched its teeth and angrily looked toward her saying to interfere with the master's grand scheme. Yui was surprised, she surprisingly asked the monster if he was able to communicate then looking at that huge monster she asked if he was not a civilian. The monster grabs the iron rod and pulls it from the road twirls it and throws it toward her shouting enough to talk Yui with her wind cutter magic break slice that iron rod also splurt the monster's body. The monster gets injured and it clench its teeth shouting she puny vermin the he grabs another car from the road and throws it toward her saying he will crush her like an egg. 
Yui jumped aside in time, and that car crashed on the road and the dust and smoke spread there. However, Yui jumped up holding her stick and created a firestorm asking her did he expected to be stronger than her because he was bigger. She attacked him with a fire magnum shouting go back to the depth of hell. A huge fire explosion occurred on the monster and she jumped back onto the road and from that fire explosion the sound of crash crake was coming. Yui wipes her sweat and sighs saying finally it's over meanwhile from her backside she feels someone stepping there toward her. Sees this, she quickly turns to look she points her magic sword toward them asking who is Chin with his team stands there saying to her she is still as loud as ever. See him there Yui surprisingly asks Mr. Chen, he asks her what is she doing there, she rubs her eyes asking him if is this a hallucination spell. Chin answered he was not a hallucination, she surprisingly asked him what is he doing there Mr. Chen. Hears this, he angrily asks her he asked her question first why is she there Miss Yui what is this explosion and what thing is cracking this explosion. Further, he asks her does she knows anything about all of this she heads down and with a sad face answers she is not aware of the details, either she touches that red object she says she thinks this red powder is turning people into monsters. As soon as she touches that red object it ends like ash seas, this chin says this doesn't seem like an ordinary problem at all they should contact the authorities outside. As he was about to complete his sentence meanwhile, they noticed a group of people coming toward them he got alert took out his weapon and raised his voice multiple enemies were moving toward them preparing for combat. His subordinates get alert and take out their weapons and the four of them holding their weapons look around and Chin asks them to be careful. Yui holding her magic stick turned her head and Chin informed them a whole group of them were heading this way meanwhile someone from beside the market wall was running toward them. Both Chin and Yui surprisingly turned their head to look. However, this group of people was nobody else but the dungeon control team and military soldier, the vice captain asked Kang rookie can't he just toss that monster arm away now. Kang holds the monster's arm and sniffs around answer, he needs this to track the smell further he says this place is so creepy. As they all take the turn on the road they find their Yui and Chin with his subordinates. Seeing them Vice Captain surprisingly asks Mr. Gies Kang and Kang in response remains silent and the military soldiers clunk their weapons and point them toward Chin and Yui. Kang thuds that monster arm on the road and waves his hand calling Miss Yui sees this Vice Captain squeeze his eyes and turn his head ordering the military soldiers to lower their guns. Military soldiers lowered their guns answering all right Sir Kang excitedly jumping move toward Yui then grabbed the vice captain's cloak and took him toward meet him Yui and Chin. Vice captain looking toward Chin says he is glad to meet Miss Yui and Mr. Chin. However Yui smiles answering it's been a while since they last met the vice captain then Chin asks the vice captain what on earth is going on there. Vice Captain answers, it seems that Urim the master of the Shield Guild is in this city, and she must be the one responsible for all of this. Here's this name Chin clenches his teeth and looks up toward the red shiny powder and Yui is also surprised. And in surprise she says they are going to need more people if they are dealing with Urim right now and they have to connect Siangrong Gu. Chin extends his hand toward her and asks her to wait is that, and the Vice Captain adds his point saying that's right sir. While Kang stood beside the vice captain sniffing that red powder, then he surprisingly looked up toward the bright flash of light that flew in the sky. After this Kim with his flash of light lands on the road holding Agent Gu in his arms and sees him there the dungeon control team says their captain is already there. Yui seeing Kim there surprisingly calls his name while Chin remains silent and Kang excitedly cheers up calling Kim's name. Further, the area where Kim landed crashed due to his landing there. Vice Captain saluted Kim and Kim appreciated his team members while Agent Gu's hair got messy and she was brushing her hair. Yui sees Agent Gu there and surprisingly asks is that Gu and in return, Gu also looks toward Yui and Chen is surprised. Then she shook hands with Yui and smiled saying it's been a very long time in response, Yui also smiled asking where have she been they thought she was dead and something. Agent Gu answered well, they all have their circumstances and Yui smiled and added her point yes that's the kind of world they live in she understands. But it's so nice to see her again saying this she turns her head asking Chin right Mr. Chin isn't it nice in response, Chin presses his lower lip between his teeth and turns his head angrily answering yes she is right. Sees Chin this reaction Agent Gu slightly smiles, then Kang points ahead excitedly and asks Kim what are they going to do now. 
Kim looking ahead answers they are going to crush their enemies and rescue the citizens before things get any worse. Hearing this Kang, Agent Gu, Yui, and Chen look toward him then Kang asks him how. Kim answered to stop all of this they needed to destroy one main mana supplier as well as four auxiliary supply units. Then he orders the vice captain and Kang to take care of the supply unit in sector number one Kang raises his hand answering OK boss. Then looking toward Agent Gu he says he needs her to take care of the unit in sector two and she nods answering understood. Further, looking toward Chen he says he needs him to deal with sector number 3, while Miss Yui takes care of sector number 4 hears this Yui nods. However, the window appears before Kim the supply unit must be destroyed within a 30 second margin of error. Otherwise, all of the mana sources will be regenerated hears this Kim checks his phone to check the time, and then he looks toward them all says they need to destroy the mana source at exactly 2 past 30 and it should be no sooner and later than that. Hears this they all nod while Chin folded arms turns his head and looks aside. After this, Kim wishes everyone good luck and then they all move on their way to destroy the mana sectors. However, Agent Gu stood behind and called Chin's name and heard his name Chin's subordinates turned, but he stood his back to her, then she smiled telling him to be careful out there. Hears this, Chen remains silent turns his head and moves from there while his subordinates are at his side and Agent Gu silently stands behind them. While moving from there on the road one of Chen's subordinates tells him he is so pretty boss and the other one adds his point asking if he knows right he thinks he is still upset about what happened back then. After this Agent Gu stood back and watched them slightly smile and turn thus Operation Team Kim began. Kang was running on the road with his team saying let's hurry up. While running away Vice Captain says them location 1 is the farthest one from their original location, they need to have everything prepared before the captain makes his call. However, Kang pointed up toward the building roof asked he thought that was the thing right, then he jumped up toward the building roof saying he would go and check it out. While his team members stood there on the road call his name. Kang on the way flying noticed a man standing there on the building as Kang flew toward the building that man named Teriok jumped toward Kang and saw this vice captain and the other team members were surprised. Further Teriok attacked Kang thud him away and crashed him on the road the road cracked from there and then Teriok himself also jumped down on the road. Standing on the road he angrily looks toward the vice captain and says stop it right there he won't allow any of them punks to take another step. Looking toward Teriok Vice Captain recognizes him surprisingly and says he is Teriok Kim from the Shield Guild. Kang crumbles from the destructed road and angrily looks toward Teriok says he is startled when he hears this Teriok angrily looks toward Kang. After this, Kang angrily stepped ahead and brushed his hand, then he stood with his team members Teriok stood there looking toward them asking Meathead if the punks must have lost their minds, then he raised his voice saying he would annihilate all of them right there and proved his allegiance to the master. Moreover, Kang holds his nose saying Teriok he breathes smells and the guy with orange hair spits out while the vice captain makes an annoyed face. Hearing this, Teriok flinched and smelled his breath, then Vice Captain looked toward Teriok pointing to Kang and told him he should try to be more careful when he talks because their rookie has a sensitive face. Hears this, Teriok removes his hand from his mouth and starts throbbing and his clothes start to crack. However, Teriok's body starts getting bigger and he clenches his teeth asking them their inferior lowlifes how dare they. He has been endowed with the blessing of hype as a transcendent being then he shouts he will kill them all. Further, he gets his power his body throbs and his shirt tears apart and he angrily jumps toward them to attack Kang holds his breath and makes a fist with his hand. And runs toward Teriok to punch him saying bad hygiene is unforgivable he smelly breath criminal and both of them fist crash with each other. On the other side, Chen skid on the road while his subordinates coughing injured lying on the road. Chen holding his weapon and sword in both his hands angrily looks toward Minxiak Kang who injured his subordinates. Chin strikes his weapon saying he hasn't seen him for a long time and he thought he was put in jail. Here's this, Minciok licks his tongue with his knives and answers he is pretty fast Chin then within a second he arrives behind Chin and strikes his knives to attack him. But before he attacks him Chin quickly moves from there and arrives at his back twirling his swords seeing this Minciok gives an evil smile. However, the knife duel starts between the two Chen tries to attack him with his weapon, but Minciok moves so quickly that even Chen misses his attack. Moreover, Chen while fighting with him thinks has Minciok Kang has always been this fast. 
Chin extends his hand to attack him with his weapon laughs, saying he has become faster than before then asks did he found himself a good potion and something. During the duel, both of their weapons clang each other, and Chin remembering Kim clenched his teeth answering him he found a goal that he wanted to reach. Minciok flying in the air moves toward him asking if it's so it's too bad, he will never be able to reach it then this will be the place he dies. However, in response, Chen angrily looks toward him and jumps toward him saying come and try his best both of them holding their weapon get before each other in the air and clang with each other due to their clanging an explosion occurs. However, at Kim's side, the red powder was falling from the sky and he attacked the monster and splurted. it. After splurting one of the monsters he steps ahead and attacks the other monster then splurts them all too. The monster's body parts splatter on the road and Kim moves ahead and looks toward Tarim who stands before him on the road holding his weapon. Looking toward Tarim he asked did he run this far just to end up fighting him again Tarim squeezed his eyes answering that's right Kim. Then he clenches the handle of his sword and Kim asks him does he thinks he can stop him without the chaos dragon fang sword. Tarim fumbled and put his left hand in his pocket and squeezed his eyes answering no he wouldn't even stand a chance. Tarim took out the object from his pant pocket and clicked its button Kim stared at the object in his hand. Tarim. Tarim moves his hand toward his neck to inject that object into his body, but he changes his mind and clangs that object on the road that object breaks and the blue potion like thing spurts out of it. Tarim strikes his sword and sees this Kim remains silent, then Tarim laughs saying he knows that he might look pathetic there, but that's his sister he is trying to get to. Then he points his sword toward Kim saying that he won't let him have her come at him, Jibong Kim. However, on Yui's side, she stepped on the road holding her magic stick looking all around her, and then stepping ahead finally she arrived near the device her cat looking toward the device hissing. Yui understands that someone from the Shield Guild has hidden behind the device she raises her voice she knows she is there to show herself. A magic circle is created there behind Yui and someone dodges a magic attack on her. Yui hardly saved herself from that magic attack and fell on the road rounding, then she sat up and skidded on the road. However, Mai Ae Sin appears behind the device laughing she stands before Yui holding her weapon. Then looking toward Yui she says she is glad to finally meet her kid, she has always wanted to rip apart. Looking toward her Yui says it's that old lady hears this she grits asking who is old lady, then she abuses Yui and attacks her with her magic weapon eye. Further, she with her weapon creates the charm spell and throw it toward Yui asking how dare she call her that. See that storm of charm spell toward her Yui extends her magic stick and creates the bouncing shield barrier around her Mai Ae Sin spell charm crashes with that shield barrier and the explosion occurs there. After this, Mai Ae Sin laughs saying not bad kid while Yui stands in her shield barrier and her cat looking toward her hiss. However, she throws the black magic aura toward that bouncing shield barrier. On Agent Gu's side, something burst out of the ground and it caused that area of the ground to get cracked and the smoke was emerging from that area. Agent Gu stands there huffing and the monster named Hudiok Park appears there from that cracked area and laughs, saying Agent Gu finally lady they meet. Then Hudiok Park opens its arm to attack her saying looks like he has hit the jackpot. Agent Gu looking toward the monster says first degree criminal Hudiok Park, he has thrown away his humanity. Here's this, Hudiok Park laughs asking if he is a first degree criminal, now what a pleasant surprise he has always wanted to be a villain. In response Agent Gu asks if he wants to be a villain, then she snaps the pinch with her hand saying well, let's see if he likes this a hundred magic birds get there flying a thousand magic rats, cats and dogs get there. Sees this Hudiok laugh saying such adorable creature. Agent Gu pointed toward him says prepare himself Hudiok. While on Kim's side, Tarim struck his weapon to attack Kim, but Kim on time jumped up and blocked his attack. Tarim's sword crashes on the road, and it cracks almost half of the road Kim jumps up and skids away. Tarim runs toward Kim he jumps and strikes his sword to attack Kim, but Kim blocks his attack by grabbing his sword seeing this Tarim angrily looks toward Kim. Moreover, Kim kicked Tarim and threw him away also his sword slipped from his hand and stuck in the ground. Tarim crashed into the building the building crumbled and dust and smoke spread there. Tarim leaned to the cracked wall coughed and blood spurt out of his mouth, he smiled saying that hurt like hell, then he top and clenched the handle of his sword that was stuck near on in the ground. Tarim gets up and starts trembling holding his sword, he lifts his sword looks toward Kim and says there he comes Kim. 
Further, Tarim gives an evil smile then shouts and moves toward Kim to attack him with his sword, but as soon as he moves to attack Kim a second moves from there and gets at him back. Tarim turned and struck his sword to attack Kim, but Kim so quickly that Tarim every attack. Kim punches Tarim and crashes him into the wall his sword slips from his hand, but he quickly grabs the handle of his sword, then he again runs toward Kim to attack him. Kim again punches him in his face and crashes him into the wall. Tarim again gets up to attack him with his sword, but like every time Kim punches him and crashes him away also his sword slips from his hand. Tarim gets up holding his sword and jumps toward Kim to attack him, but Kim again punches him and crumbles him into the wall. Tarim gets severely injured, but he doesn't accept his defeat he lies there on the ground tremble and crawls to get near his sword that was stuck in the ground. He with his shaking hand tries to grab the handle of the sword, saying it's not over yet he is not done with him Kim, hears this Kim stands before him and remains silent. Then he asks Tarim if isn't he going to transform like everyone else it could give him a slightly better chance. Hears this, Tarim trembles sitting there on the ground head down, and laughs then he heads up saying he is not going to give up on his last shred of pride, then he abuses Kim considering him a monster. Hears this, Kim remains silent, then he steps toward Tarim saying pride won't help him protect his loved ones also Tarim's sword was stabbed in the ground. Tarim angrily clenches his teeth and squeezes his eyes answering screw off. What does he know about meanwhile Kim extends his shoes toward Tarim and sees Kim's leg coming toward him he gets scared Kim crashed Tarim's head onto the ground and crackles it. He kept crashing his head on the ground the ground got cracked all around there and Kim moved his foot from his head at the very least he certainly knew more than he did. After this Kim checked the time and the current time was 14.10. On the other side, both Urim and the director stood up on the rooftop near the main unit sector. The director stands behind Urim and says to him there seem to be some problems in the city, she answers yes she knows, and further with an angry facial expression, she says Kim is going to stand in her way to the very end. However, the director smokes the cigarette and closes his eyes to add his point saying she should evacuate the area for a moment master. The main mana supply will be safe so long as the auxiliary supplies don't get destroyed at the same time. Urim sighs and nods then she asks does he thinks she would lose to Kim the director answers Kim is a powerful madam. Here's this she says she is not the weakling she used to be Kim is no match for her the director slightly smiles and presses his brows saying it wouldn't hurt to be extra careful. Urim looking down asks him extra carefully he says Kim is the one who should be careful right now. Then looking down she opened her arm and created the spell charm with her hands and the people of that area were turned into monsters. They all gather on the road while their bodies are turning into the monster sees Urim stand up and smile, then she creates the spell charm with her hands asking will be able to kill these innocent civilians to step on her. Hearing this the director presses the cigarette between his lips and remains silent, then she laughs and looks toward those people on the road she raises her voice saying now let's see how he handles this Kim. However, at Kang's side he was fighting with Teriok, while Chen was busy on his side to defeat Minxiaq Kang and Yui were fighting with that lady with her magic, and in return that lady was throwing magic toward her. Further, Agent Gu was busy on her side defeating that monster with her magic animals and Kim flew in the air across all the buildings in his way and the current time was 1480. However, Kim flying in the air arrived at the road and thousands of people who were turning into monsters stood on the road. Kim looks toward those people presses his lower lip, then gets up and looks up toward the main sector there. Also from that main sector red powder was falling Kim there Urim stood up says so that he had finally arrived at Jibong Kim. Urim looking toward Kim creates her spell charm and the wavy bright light emerges from there. She throws her spell charm toward Kim saying this is for daring to hit him last time. Kim stood on the road and that storm of spell charm quickly moved toward him. The window appears before Kim that the nearby civilians will be caught in the explosion, if he evades this attack blocking it is highly advised. Sees that charm storm coming toward him Kim says a dirty shot, then he with his magic makes a fist and punches the charm spell. Both of the magic crash with each other and Kim blocks her spell charm storm with his magic fist sees this Urim is surprised. After this, Kim throws the storm of his magic toward Urim that storm crashes into the building wall area where she stands, and then this magic sparks in the sky and ends. 
sees this Urim grit then jumps and carrying her spell charm crashes on the road looking down at Kim, she gives an evil smile saying yes it wouldn't be fun if it was too easy. Kim stood in the distance clenching his fists and she laughed saying they finally met Kim. Then she got up from that crack road saying he had caused quite the ruckus while she was gone he arrogant rat. Also when she jumped on the road the road crashed and those people who stood near her got injured due to her charm spell and lying on the road unconscious. Kim angrily looks toward her and calls her name then says he wants to request her. She surprisingly asks a request he answers please don't surrender in the middle of this. Then she laughed asking for surrender. She guessed she had been abroad for far too long how dare he suggest she would surrender to someone. However, Urim's body started to squirm and she turned into a flying witch Kim gritted and stood up in her magic laugh saying he had already lost by facing Kim. Also, a bright aura emerges from her eyes and body, and she commands all of him to kill Kim. Further, those people who were turning into monsters screamed and ran toward Kim to attack him. They extend their hand to attack him while Kim silently stands there before them. On Kang's side, the monster laughs and extends his fist to punch him asking what happened to all of that confidence from before Kang extends his arm to block his attack. The monster punches him, and then the monster strikes his hand to punch him again, but this time Kang bends down top on the monster's leg and creates a flash of his magic shouting eat this. Kang attacked the monster with his magic ball, and then an explosion occurred on the monster as Kang was throwing his magic balls toward him. The monster from that smoke explosion extended his hand and grabbed Kang's leg see this Kang was surprised then the monster clenched his leg says it's playtime, and it's over now saying this he twirled Kang and crashed him away. Kang got injured and he shouted in pain while the vice captain injured lying on the road aside head up and looking toward Kang calling his name also his companions were lying unconscious on the road. Sees this all vice captain turns his head and looks toward his companion thinking how could their entire team be defeated by Terry Oak Park. Further, he asks himself if has he always been this strong, while the monster Teriok punches Kang to kill him, and he punches him so hard that the road crashes and he gets severely injured. See this, the vice captain looking toward the vice captain thinks no at this rate their mission in sector 1 will be a failure. Teriok keeps punching Kang and sees this vice captain sit up and create the magic thinking he can't be lying there like this, then he jumps toward Teriok calls his name. Here's his name stops their punches Kang and turns his eyes to look. However, the vice captain creates his magic fist move toward Teriok, thinking he has to create an opening for the rookie. But before he punches Teriok, he attacks the vice captain hits him and crashes him into the wall the vice captain gets severely injured. Sees Kang's head up and calls the vice captain and vice captain injured leaning against the wall while Teriok stands before him making his fist saying, he miserable insect. Then he extends his leg to kill the vice captain, but before he crashes him Kang attacks him with his magic from behind. Teriok turned his head to look and Kang stood behind him looking toward him says stop it right there he meathead. Teriok angrily turns to ask if they are all just eager to die aren't they further he says wait his turn he will come around to murdering them all. Hears this and Kang answers this is why he didn't want to leave the mountain. Then he creates the magic and the shiny aura starts emerging from his body. His hairs grow long and starts blowing in the air, also his nails grow Teriok gets surprised asking what is this while Kang with his magic turns himself into a witchy monster. Kang stood before Teriok in his powers says let's see if his liver is as hard as his skin. While on Kim's side, the monster people extend their hands to attack him and Kim stands there and says to the system, this will be his first time using it the system asks him if he is doing it. Kim activated his ability and the bright fire like aura started emerging from his body, then that aura sparkled and spread around there. While those monstrous people were running toward him to attack Kim threw that flash of light toward them, and they all plopped on the road away the window appeared before him activating ability his S rank ability Dragon Fear. All those people plop on the road away and it slowly becomes clear that monstrous people see Urim start to sweat. Then she thuds on the road and starts trembling Kim in his magic power steps toward her while she bending before him on the road was trembling. As he gets near her she heads up asking what in the world is this, he answers he will ask her one more time. Then he requests her to not surrender to him. Urim while sweating her head up and looking toward him asked herself if is she trembling right now against a mere human. However, she got up and flew upside down while his clock was fluttering in the air she opened her arms and created the magic charm. 
she creates her magic and the ground starts to crack and crumble and the stones start flying in the air with her charm spell. Then she stood up in the air looked toward Kim saying she would rip him apart Kim looked up toward her saying she was too far gone. She straightened her arm and clenched her fist, then threw the storm of spell stones toward him saying die the insect Kim. Those spell stones quickly move toward him Kim jumps up and crashes all the stones one by one. She crashed all the stones and the dust explosion occurred behind him due to the crashing of stones seize this Urim grit. Then with her index finger, she created a dark aura and threw that dark storm aura toward him that dark aura fell on the ground and crashed, while Kim stood aside looking toward the explosion occurring at his backside and pressed his lips. After this, she throws the spell stones toward Kim, and Kim with her left arm blocks her attack. Then he asks her if is she done with the tricks now here's this, she grits Kim step ahead while she stands up in the air and clenches her fist asking for tricks. Then she created the spell charm with her hand and that dark aura together asking if she risked her entire life to learn this death laser does this also seem like a trick to him. Further, she raises her voice she will reduce him to ashes Kim then throws her dark aura magic toward him. That magic crashed into the ground and Kim took it aside and jumped while she kept throwing her magic bullets storming toward him. Kim jumped and ran away from the side where she threw her magic to attack him he blocked all her attacks. When she sees this grit, she laughs throwing the circle of dark aura storm toward him to kill him. However, her magic dark aura makes him fall to the ground and explosion occurs behind him, and he falls in that explosion. The ground crumbled where the explosion occurred, she laughed saying this is the price of his arrogance squirmed till his last breath insect. That exploded ground that rumbled and the reflection of Kim appeared from that explosion coming outside. See this Uarm get shocked Kim with his magic bright aura jumps up toward her and the window appears before him activating resistance to death blight status effect. Kim while flying toward her made the fist see this Uarm was creating the dark aura with her index fingernail asking herself how then she threw that dark aura toward him. While Kim flying quickly moved toward her and the window appeared before him activating resistance to death blight status effect this window appeared almost five to six times before him. Urim seeing him coming near her says how distasteful Kim extends his fist to punch him while on Urim's side, she rips her arm makes the fist and moves toward Kim abusing him. However, both of their fists collapse with each other and a huge explosion of both of their magics. Kim crashes her fist and throws her away backward and she falls backward and crashes on the road. A huge dust explosion occurs on the cracked road, then she sizzles from that explosion splattering on the cracked ground and blood vomits there. Kim jumps on the road before her he steps toward her while she heads down vomit thinking it impossible how is he still alive after being hit by her death laser. She heads up holding her rip arm calling Kim's name then asking don't he dare look down at her like that then she shouts don't he dare while he silently stands before her. However she gets up and extends her ripped arms to attack him saying give her that look. On Kang's side the explosion occurred he tore and took out Teriok's liver and his blood was dripping on the ground. Kang smiled and Teriok stood there surprisingly asking how he was, then he coughed and blood spurt out of his mouth, then he thud on the ground. Kang stood before him holding Teriok's liver in his hand, then he stuck out his tongue touched his index finger tongue and gave an evil smile saying so he is no different from a regular human after all. He is as fragile as an egg hears this Teriok tremble and asks how is he and how did he Kang smiles answering he doesn't think that's worth explaining to an insect on the brink of death. Hears this, Teriok abuses Kang and says killing him won't change a thing. Kang adds his point but his teammates won't be any different either. Teriok surprisingly asks what and Kang clenches his liver saying die insect Teriok splatters and thud on the road. While on Kim's side he crashes Urim on the cracked ground he keeps crashing him and she heads up screaming. Kim grabbed his head and pressed it in the cracked ground. Then he grabbed her hair and lifted her and dragged her while she was blood wasting vomiting. Then he threw her away and she crashed on the ground. However, the explosion occurs there then lying there on the cracked ground she hiss. Kim with his magic jumps toward her and grabs her neck then clenches it calling her name further. He says he doesn't care why she started all of this. Then he grits remembering the time when the monster pierced its tentacle in his mother's stomach and remembering her mother who was in IQ in a coma. Further, he remembers when he asked Captain Chiol was the B neighborhood shantytown emergency sector also under his guild's responsibility. Remembering all this, he then says to her, 
but she should always keep in mind that her actions have consequences, and this is time for her to own up to them and try her best to endure it to the end. Saying this, Kim clench her neck while she screams in pain calling Kim's name and requesting him to leave her while Kim clenches her neck and says he will give her the most painful death. That's humanly possible. After this, Kim grabbed her and crashed her away on the ground, she lay there on the cracked ground head up thinking this couldn't be happening. Then she asked herself how Yurim Park was tossed around so hopelessly is Jibong Kim really that powerful? However, Kim flying in the air moves toward her punches her and crashes her into the cracked ground. A bright light spreads there and Kim punching on the cracked ground stands there bending his back. And he was surprised to see Yurim wasn't there on the ground, he turned his head to look and she flew in the air and was moving toward the building. Also, she was severely injured but she doesn't accept her death and keeps fighting him back, while moving toward that injecting machine she wonders if she can just absorb that thing. Seeing her moving toward that machine Kim stood there saying he was not letting her go he jumped up fly toward her to stop her, while she arrived there near that machine and stood beside it. Then she punches that machine and splits it first her rip hand clatters with that machine, then it starts squirming there. However, a bright flash of light emerges from the machine and spreads there Kim moves toward that machine surprised. However, that flash of light was so bright Kim extended his hand over his face, and then the smoke spread there and Kim stood in the air watching this all silently. Moreover from that smoke, a reflection of Yurim appears. On Shin's side, the duel continued between him and Minsiok, both of their weapons clanging with each other. Minsiok stood ahead after clanging his sword with Chin's sword and turned smiled saying he would admit that he was pretty fast. Then he asks, but how long does he think he can drag this Anshin moves toward him and strikes his weapon to attack him answering shut his mouth up. Minsiok turned his head to look then he attacked him with his weapon and both of their weapons clang each other. However, they both fight with each other and the duel again starts between the two also two of them clang their weapon with each other. Chin during this duel thinks he doesn't have enough time while Minsiok laughs and quickly moves beside Chin and splurts his backside. Sees this, Chin grits thinking he guesses he has no other choice Minsiok turns his head looking toward Kim he laughs and runs his tongue over the upper lip, asking what is he tired of already. Chin injured stood with his back to him, Minsiok ran toward him holding his weapon saying well then prepare to die. Chin turns looks toward him sighs then glares at him Minsiok stabs his knives into Minsiok's stomach and splits at Chin's blood drips onto the ground. Minsiok holds his weapon stabs it in Chin's stomach and laughs, meanwhile Chin strikes his weapon cuts the skin of his arm and looks toward him angrily abusing him saying he has got him. Then he strikes his weapon thinking he will let him spill his blood in exchange for his head. Thinking this Chin slicks his head Minsiok coughs and blood spurts out of his neck and his weapon falls from his hand. After this, Chin grabbed the knife which was stabbed in his stomach and pulled it back the flow of blood drips from his stomach and then he clangs this weapon away. Meanwhile, Minsiok thud on the ground the blood was flowing from his neck and mouth and he held his neck Chin passed by him saying he should have realized that his life could just as easily be taken away. When he tried to kill someone Minsiok's face down thudded on the ground Chin tapped on the machine with his left hand. He put his right hand on his wound from where the blood was dripping. Then he stepped ahead thinking that hurt like hell. However, sector number Yubin Chin vs Minsiok Jang, and the winner was Yubin Chin. While on Kim's side, the whole sky turned red and Kim stood there silently looking toward Yurim who turned into a monster. Also, the dark aura was on her head between her horns, the explosion where she stood and Kim stood in the air watching this all silently. Yurim flew upward in the air her wings were flattering and due to her magic the sky started to crackle she looked toward Kim says finally she had attained true transcendence. She was flying up in the sky and Kim was up on the building roof, then looking up toward her he asked what has she done she laughed answering thanked him for his complacency Jibon Kim. She has acquired the full power of the fire dragon, no she is even mightier than the fire dragon. Then she opens her arms saying she is in the apocalypse to end this world and when she opens her arms a strong gust of magic blows there and due to that magic wind the window of the building clatters. The window appears before Kim warning a draconian has appeared further, this monster is not listed in the database, he is unable to measure its power. Here's this, Kim surprisingly asks a monster so she is given up on her humanity. Urim created a magic sparkle in her hand 
and in a second that magic sparkle turned into a dark magic ball, she created the huge dark magic ball in her hand, and looking toward Kim she called out his name. Further, she says he better not plan on surrendering hears this Kim sighs saying how amusing Yurim laugh asking if he thinks this is funny. Moreover, she throws those huge dark magic balls toward Kim saying, let's see how long he can keep that smirk on his face. Four dark magic balls move toward Kim and he silently stands up on the rooftop with stares at those balls coming toward him. However all of Kim's team members stood on the road looking up toward the balls in the sky seas those balls Kang rumbled and Chen stood beside the machine also rumbled. Agent Gu attacking that monster with her magic bird stops and looks up and Yui also stop and looks up toward the sky. However, those magic huge balls collapse, and these balls turn into huge magic balls, sees Kim clenches his fist, and a flash of bright light emerges from his fist. He creates a flash of bright light magic with his hand jumps up toward that ball and punches it with all his might. A huge explosion occurred there due to the collapsing of Urim and Kim's magic Kim flew in the air passed through that magic ball and moved toward Urim standing there in the air. A window appeared before Kim, the first dragon slayer activated Kim punched Urim's face, and another window appeared he dealt 50% more damage against draconic monsters. Therefore, the explosion of bright light occurs in the sky when Kim punches Urim. Kim punched Urim and fell her away, while falling away she hit a building got in her way and the building crashed and an explosion occurred there. After punching her Kim stood there in his flash of bright light and asked the system to mark the location where Urim fell. The system answers and the window appears before him searching for signals draconian, then another window appears and the system informs, unable to search due to insufficient signal, re-attempting the search with Urim's vital signs. After searching for a while, the system answered that Urim is currently alive with less than 1% HP. Further another window appears and the system informs they are displaying the target location, then the system scans the whole city to find her. Kim set himself and was about to fly saying he would end her properly this time meanwhile the window of warning appeared before him. Kim stopped there and stared at the window, then another window appeared on which the current time was mentioned which was 1429. Kim stopped their masking fist, then he turned and looked back toward the main sector of that mana and the window appeared it was strongly advised that the mana supply be destroyed first. Kim answered the system he guessed he should destroy that thing before he went. On the other side, Yui sat there on the ground leaning against the mana machine also her magic wand was lying beside her and the black lady's corpse was lying ahead of her. Yui sat there injured thinking she had done it, then she extended her hand to pick up the stick she grabbed the stick and checked the time it was 1429. She got up holding her magic wand she extended her magic wand toward the machine to destroy it. On Agent Gu's side, she sat there on the ground also the monster's corpse was lying there. Furthermore, Gu's magic animals were killed in that battle, and their corpses were also lying before her, she with a sad face held the cat in her arms and created magic with her hand. Then with a sad face and teary eyes, she apologizes to those animals who were killed in that battle further with her teary eyes, she apologizes to the cat that she holds in her arm. In response, the injured makes a voice, and then other cats there with sad faces and teary eyes make a sound and look toward her. Agent Gu with teary eyes says she will never forget the sacrifices they all have made for her, then she stands up. However, Kim stood before the main mana sector asks the system how is everyone else doing the system answered he was able to search for the others based on their biometric data. However, it may take a long time to complete because of the awareness impairment spell. Here's this, Kim adds his point he guesses he will just have to trust them on this, and the window appears before him the time is up. Kim tapped the mana unit and released the magic from his hand, the mana unit started to crumble and crash, and an explosion occurred there. While on Yui's side, she pointed her magic stick toward the mana sector trembling a bright flash of light emerged from her stick, and she attacked the mana unit with her shock wave magic and crashed it. On the other side, Chen putting his hand on his wound struck his sword and cut the mana unit machine, the machine crumbled and thud on the ground. Moreover, on Agent Gu's side, she with the help of her magic cat destroys the mana unit, and then on Kang's side, he stands before the mana unit. Thinking his wishes have been granted, then he turns and attacks the mana unit with his magic, and the mana unit explodes while Kang stands his back to that explosion. After this, he jumps down on the road, and a bright light of sparkle emerges behind him, and also a flash of light emerges from his body. 
However, Kang after completing his mission reverted to his original appearance and top on the road. Vice Captain leaning injured with the wall while trembling, seeing Kang there ask Rookie did he finish the mission. Kang turns his head answering yes they do he hears this Vice Captain sigh and thanks him then he plops there. After this Kang turned his head and looked up also, the current time was 1430. Team Jibong Kim managed to successfully destroy the four auxiliary mana supplies as well as the main supplies within the promised time frame. However, the window appears before him to inform him of Team Jibong Kim's mission success. After completing their mission, the sky returned to its normal state. On the other side, Yurim transformed into her human form, and she leaned with the cracked wall was blood siming meanwhile the director held the cigarette in his mouth and dragged Terum to get there. Then grabbing Terum's arm he laughed saying what a miserable sight Yurim saw the director there see him, she says James Lee hurry up, and as she was about to complete her sentence. The director smirks saying master he is afraid she will have to take full responsibility for this defeat. Yurim is surprised, then she surprisingly asks him what the director thud Terum aside answering he even brought her brother along to see if she could succeed, but it was all pointless. Terum lying there injured called his sister's name, and she sat there injured with teary eyes calling her brother's name. After this, the director sits before her and says sorry to interrupt, but they are short on time so save the heartfelt reunions for the afterlife. Moreover, the director grabs the object from Urim's chest saying that as for this he will make sure to put it to good use. Urim with teary eyes looks toward the director while the director sits there before her laugh saying she sees as far as he is concerned. Then looking toward Terum he laughs saying he needs to take at least one thing out of all this. However, the director cracks that object and rips it from her chest, she screams in pain. Sees Terum lying there injured on the ground and shouts calling his sister as he tries hard to get up, but he gets thud on the ground. As the director rips that object Urim with teary eyes shouts asking director James Lee who exactly is he the director gets up answering how pathetic does she still not understand. Then with an evil smile on his face, he says hype is much greater and runs far deeper than she realizes. She shouts calling out the director then the eyeball from her eyes disappears and her eyes completely turn white and her hand plops on the ground. However, she screamed and her body started to sizzle Terum lying there with teary eyes extending his hand and shouting calling his sister. Urim sizzle and the director take out the recall stone from his coat inner pocket, saying this has become quite troublesome. As he was about to clench the stone to disappear meanwhile Kim got there from behind the director and stood there understanding there Kim had to get there with his backside. The director starts shuddering and his cigarette falls from his mouth. He fearfully thinks about how he arrived this fast, then he turns his eyes to look. He turns with a scared face asking Kim and Kim angrily looks toward his clenched teeth asking what is he doing there. However, the director using his power disappears from there and the black aura remains there which moves upward like smoke. Kim silently stood there watching that black aura meanwhile, the director appeared at Kim's back and stood at his backside he smiled saying so they met again. Kim turns his head and looks toward him the director grabs the red object that he got from Urim's chest and opens his arms. Kim stares at that red object and extends his hand asking the director to hand it over to him, the director asking don't he think he is being a little aggressive. Further, he asks when they have finally managed to find each other again, Kim angrily looks toward him answering, he doesn't think they both should be exchanging friendly greetings. Then the director closed his eyes answering he guessed he was right, meanwhile Kim extended his leg hit him on his head and crashed him into the ground. The explosion occurred and dust and smoke spread Kim stood there looking toward his foot with which he crashed the director. As the dust smoke ends he is surprised to see the director is not there. Meanwhile, the director appears at Kim's back in the form of a dark aura saying he is so reckless. Then he asked how are they supposed to have a proper conversation like this Kim turned his head answering he didn't plan on having a conversation either. The director laughs and putting the cigarette in his mouth calls Kim's name, then he opens his arms saying he is very strong, and he will give him that. It's hard to believe that he is merely a human Kim looks toward him and clenches his teeth answering he has had enough of this nonsense. The director holding the cigarette laughs saying that he is still only a big fish in a small pond, there is much more to this world than he realizes. Kim asks if is he talking about that organization hype, the director waving his arm answer he guessed he had heard about them well, if he would be willing he could have him accepted as a member he does have the authority. 
However, Kim asks what on earth is Hype supposed to be the director answers. It's the new humankind Kim surprisingly asks a new humankind. The director smiles answering the future of humanity, then asks so what does he say joining them would be completely different from being a part of a measly country and a guild. Because they are the new world order. Here's this Kim adds his point he guessed it wouldn't be too bad the director gets surprised, then he laughs saying yes that's right. He knew he wouldn't reject this offer Kim answered no he misunderstood. Then he looking toward the director says he was talking about how it wouldn't be too bad to rip him apart. Kim jumps from there and grabs the director's neck, then he clenches it while the director looks toward him and thinks why can't he use his phasing ability Kim clenching the director's neck lifts him. The director's skin and eye color start turning red, and he laughs asking if he would reject his generous offer and face the consequences nothing in this world is capable of restraining him. The director laughs and the black aura starts emerging from his body while Kim lifts him angrily and looks toward him. However, the military helicopter arrived there and the military doctor carried the injured on stretchers, the ambulances also arrived in that area. However, the bright light of spell charm appears on the road, and from that light Prime Minister Gu with her subordinate sizzle there. Prime Minister Gu looked toward the injured people whom the doctors were carrying on the stretcher to the ambulance side and asked what in the world happened there. One of the Gu's subordinates answers they have confirmed that the city's awareness impairment spell has been removed, madam. Hears this, Gu turns her head and looks toward her subordinate ordering them to find out what happened there and rescue the victim immediately. The rest of their units will look for Urim both of her subordinates stand her either side node answering understood madam. After this, both of them move on their way and Prime Minister Gu steps ahead, thinking the impairment spell couldn't have gone away on its own, an experienced mage like Urim Park would never make such an error. After this, she ran away thinking about what is she planning to do, she stopped there on the road, and looked all around she was surprised to see Yui sitting injured on the road. She stood in the distance her surprisingly asked Yui, and she sighed head up looked aside said Siongrong Gu. Moreover, the Prime Minister gets close to her and then sits near her asking what is there and what on earth happened in this city. As Yui was severely injured and with a sad face she answered it was a bit long as she was about to complete her sentence she coughed and blood spurt out of her mouth. Prime Minister Gu wipes her blood with her napkin, then she surprisingly looks aside saying that's my A.E. Sin of the Shield Guild. Then she turned her head and looked toward Yui surprisingly asking if did she this you sighed and slightly laughed nodding Gu brushed her hair and patted her head smile saying she had grown so much. Yui laughs answering she is really glad to hear that from her then Prime Minister Gu gets up and picks up Yui's selfie stick. Yui surprisingly looks toward her and Gu smiles saying but she will still have to borrow her phone to inspect this video Yui surprisingly says her phone. Then looking she says that's so mean she just told her that she had grown up suddenly in the distance, something starts rumbling both of them surprisingly looked back to see. A flash of light emerges from the back side of the hospital building and Prime Minister Gu looking toward that light surprisingly asks what is that. On the other side, Chin tied both his fainted subordinates with the clothes and dragged them on the road with rope. Also, he was injured, and the blood drops were falling from his wound, as he was on the road his eyes fell on Agent Gu stood there. Chin sees her there stops and angrily looks toward her asking did these two only ate and bum around all day while he was gone. Further, he clenched his teeth asking why are they so heavy, she silently looked toward him and remained silent, and he dragged them on the road past her. After this, she turns and raises her voice, asking him to let her help him with that, he angrily turns his head answering he doesn't need his help. Then she droops and apologizes to him further, she says forgive her. But she has no choice back, then hears Chin flinch, and she heads up saying that was just the age that they lived in. He turns his head saying he never asked her to explain herself, hears this, she surprisingly says but... Meanwhile, the military doctor teams got there and pointed toward Chin they raised their voice look there are more injured over there. Chin stops there and the doctor separates both Chin's companions and frees them from the rope. After this, one of the doctors looking toward Chin says they should take them into the ambulance they are bleeding very badly Chin answers alright. Suddenly a flash of bright light appears in the sky in the form of an explosion they all surprisingly look up toward that light. After this, the light ends and they all head down and start doing their work Agent Gu silently looks toward Chin and in return, he also looks at her but both of them remain silent. 
On the other side, a man was sitting there in his office in the dark, sitting there he was checking some papers meanwhile a bright light appeared before him. He surprisingly looked toward that light as the light ended Kim stood there lifting the injured director, the man looking toward the director surprisingly said, James Lee. Also, Kim held that recall stone in his hand, and the bright wavy light was coming out of it as the man sat there on the chair in the dark. Looking toward the director Kim's hand in which he holds the stone says it's interesting. He was wondering who opened up the emergency communication portal. So it's him, Jibong Kim. After this, Kim plops the director on the floor, and looking toward that man he is shocked that someone from the new humankind would recognize him. The man laughed saying he had an attitude young man, also the dark light was spread near him. Kim answers frankly he doesn't care, but listens up he could try to hide if he wants, but from now on he is going to find and annihilate every member of his group. Hears this, the man remains silent, and then laughs saying Kim his ego is completely inflated from defeating a few underlings. Kim silently looked toward that man, then he got up and got close to the window and pulled back the curtain asking if he thought they would hide from him. The man pulls the curtain back from the window and fastens it to the handle and the bright light from outside pours into the room. After this, he looks toward Kim and says come at them anytime he wants then pointed toward the city through a glass window, he says they will be waiting for him right there.